Tantor Audio, a division of Recorded Books presents Crash by Evelyn Sola, narrated by Mari and Troy Duran. Prologue Vivi Your cousin and aunt think they are so special because Sandra is marrying that rich man. Now they are going to act even more superior. I only listen to my father with half an ear as I look through the curtains waiting for my ride, eager to get out of this hell for the next four days. Yes, my favorite cousin is marrying into a rich family. No, she does not think she's superior. Yes, my father's an asshole. I don't know why we have to go, or why they want you at this wedding. What do they need you for? It's bad luck. Your aunt won't be so arrogant when this white man dumps her daughter. I give it two years and I'll be there to rub it in since she's always sticking her nose in my business. I don't have the money for this. Not with you here taking up space and food, wasting money on college. Other than the gas he'll have to spend to drive to Martha's Vineyard, everything else is paid for, from his meals to the very nice hotel accommodations. I agree with my father on one thing. I wish neither he nor my mother was going. If they want you there so badly, they can support you. There wasn't any doubt that they would. I turned to gaze at him, standing there, barely five and a half feet tall, both hands on his hips. His lips are snarling, and as usual, his face is angry. Always angry, with sharp words on his tongue aimed to destroy my self-esteem. If I'm not the target, it's my mother, who committed the sin of birthing a daughter and was then informed she would never be able to bear more children. Relief floods my body when I see the silver Toyota Sienna pull into the driveway. I grab my suitcase, ready to make my escape. But my father takes it out of my hands. Not to carry it for me, but to make a point. I did not tell you to go anywhere, girl. He tosses the bag back on the floor. I lean down, pick it up, and throw the strap over my shoulder. We've already had this discussion— he knew I would be leaving today and that my cousin Tosh and her husband Chris would be picking me up. My father and mother would arrive tomorrow, giving me a brief reprieve from them. Thankfully, there is a loud knock on the door. Uncaring about my father's antics at this point, I walk to the door and let Chris inside. He offers my father his hand and he takes it. You ready to go, Vivi? Tosh and the kids are in the car. I'll see you tomorrow, Ixon, he says to my father. Is your mother here? I want to say hello. She's in the bedroom, laying down. I tell Chris. Of course, she's home, but leaving me to deal with my father on my own. Typical. Your wife is too good to come greet her uncle? All women are the same. You need to teach her respect, my father says to Chris. My wife is an adult who doesn't need me to teach her a thing. Let's go, Vivi. Chris doesn't give my father any more time to talk. He takes the suitcase from me, and we both get the hell out of the house. Oh, my God! Tosh and Chris both laugh at me. You've said that about 100 times since we got here, Chris says. What's the name of this town? I ask. Vineyard Haven, Tosh says. We've already checked in at a hotel in Edgartown, a beautiful inn right on the beach. The rooms are ours until Sunday. But tomorrow night, all the women are staying at this house, and the men are going to the inn. Tosh, Chris, and the kids have a suite, while I have a beautiful room with a huge canopy bed with gorgeous and intricate white drapery above it. More like rich people, Haven. Holy cow! And this is their summer home? Are you kidding me? I'm in awe as I look out the window as Chris drives his van on the circular drive. I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't a huge brick mansion right on the beach in Martha's freaking vineyard. I thought vacation homes were supposed to be smaller than your regular home, but I guess not in this case. Do you think we're dressed okay? I ask nervously. I look down at my white two-piece outfit. The skirt is short and form-fitting. The top is cropped and exposes a sliver of my torso, which has a thin gold belt around it. Normally, I don't care about the latest fashion trends and how I look, but for tonight, for some unknown reason, I want to be sexy and confident. 
You look beautiful, sweetie. I'm surprised Sandy agreed to a white party and not a pink party. Tosh says, referencing Sandy's obsession with the color pink. Let's take bets and see how long it will take before my kids get dirt on their clothes. Chris opens the van door and I step out, the sound of the gravel making a crunching noise beneath my high white wedge shoes. My knees nearly buckle at the thought of walking inside the most beautiful vacation home I've ever seen. Tosh and Chris each take the hand of one of their kids, and I'm left to walk alone. But I link my arm through Tosh's. We both audibly gasp when a maid opens the door for us, directing us through the house to the backyard. We each grab champagne flutes along the way, and I'm grateful my father is not here to stop me from drinking. I finish my glass before we reach the French doors leading us outside. The first floor is huge with high ceilings. The furniture is high-end, but looks inviting. There are pictures of the Clark family all along the walls on the first floor, from formal pictures to random shots taken at various stages of their lives. There's a recent picture of the entire family, including Sandy, taken last Christmas. Everyone is color-coordinated and wearing wide smiles. I quickly check out the happy family, making sure to overlook the only Clark I find distasteful. Luke Clark, the youngest brother and the biggest asshole in the family. My mind flashes back to the day we met. It was before I knew of the connection between our families. The meeting was a random event in a parking lot with a stranger. I've imagined it a thousand different ways, and I've concluded that the youngest Clark is still an asshole. When I found out he was the brother of my cousin's fiancé, he tortured me by making a giant dog chase me around his father's yard. That was after he caused me to fall, which he never apologized for. I've seen him several times since, only to be subjected to his dirty looks and taunts. The last time I saw him was at the bridal shower, and even though I can't prove it, I'm convinced he was the one who put prosciutto in my purse, which caused the dogs to follow me around the entire day. Zeus, Jake's giant bull mastiff, jumped on me and started to chew on my purse. The dog knocked me completely on my back, and all Luke Clark did was stand there and laugh, offering me no help. It was when I started to scream that Jake came and grabbed Zeus and put him out of the house. I had a torn purse and smelled of dog drool. The smug look Luke gave me as I walked past him did not go unnoticed by me. As much as I enjoyed parts of the shower, he made certain aspects of it unbearable. First, he was never far away from me. I don't know if he did it to unnerve me, but every time I looked in his direction, his eyes were on me. He was either sitting close by or standing close enough to hear any conversation I might have had. Daddy's not letting you go to the bachelorette party? I thought an independent woman such as yourself wouldn't let a man dictate what you do. All talk, little girl. He had taunted when he overheard Tosh complaining about my father not letting me go to New York for the weekend for Sandy's bachelorette party. Why don't you mind your own damn business? I hissed. I could feel the color in my face. I looked over at Tosh, who was still complaining about my father, and wished she'd just be quiet for now. Is that all you have, suffragette? Or should I say, wannabe suffragette? All talk and no action. The bastard then swiped a meatball from my plate and walked away before I could think of a scathing reply. I spent the rest of the shower angry and ashamed because part of what he said was true. I had no recourse. Not yet. I shake my head, deciding to put that weekend and Lucas Clark out of my mind. This is my cousin's wedding, and I'm going to enjoy every minute of this fabulous weekend. Oh, my God, I say, when we finally step into the backyard, or should I say garden, the most beautiful garden filled with every shade of pink rose on earth. The roses are everywhere, in every type of vase imaginable. The yard is filled with round tables covered in crisp white tablecloths. Beyond the tables is an infinity pool that looks as if it is blowing directly into the Atlantic Ocean. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, 
Tosh whispers to me. I realize my mouth is open, and I quickly shut it as I grab another glass of champagne from a passing server. Check out our bride, Tosh says, pointing at Sandy. Sandy is standing between Jake and her mom, absolutely glowing, in a white strapless retro 1950s-style swing dress, reminiscent of one worn by Audrey Hepburn. She has a wreath of miniature pink roses around her head and a string of pearls around her throat. She completes her outfit with a pair of light pink stilettos. When she sees us, she comes over to hug us, visibly relieved that some more of her family has started to arrive. We're introduced to members of the Clark family, some business associates, and their neighbors from the area. While Sandy and Jake work their room, I stick close to Chris and Tosh. Mrs. Clark, in her infinite wisdom, has a separate party for the children, complete with their own menu, child care, and entertainment, leaving the adults free to mingle. As I look around the room, my eyes land on the only hateful member of Jake's family. As if sensing my eyes on him, he turns around, eyeing me up and down before meeting my gaze. He takes a sip of his champagne, never breaking our gaze. His pink tongue pokes out as he licks his bottom lip, and I reluctantly admit that the bastard is handsome. He's tall and muscular with beautiful green eyes. Like everyone else, he's in a white linen outfit. The top two buttons of his shirt are undone, and even from across the room, I can see his smooth, tanned skin. His Adam's apple bobs as he looks me over. Because this is my cousin's wedding, and because I'm determined to have an incredible few days, I decide to be an adult and smile at him. But before I can do that, he sticks out his middle finger and pretends to rub the side of his nose. God, I hate that bastard. I make an L with my thumb and index finger and put it on my forehead. He snorts and turns his back to me. I see that his antics. When my cousin Steve arrives with other members of our family, I quickly attach myself to him, and we spend the next hour laughing, eating, and people watching. We sneak drinks whenever the adults in our family turn their backs. But when a group of young women arrives, Steve leaves my side and approaches them. Hey, beautiful. I hear someone with a slight Caribbean accent a few minutes later. I turn around to find a very handsome guy wearing a chef's uniform. I'm Byron. He offers me his hand, and when I shake it, he kisses the top of mine, causing me to blush. I'm Vivian, cousin of the bride. Ah, the bride better be careful. Her cousin is even more beautiful than she is. Unsure of how to take the compliment, I simply smile. Are you the chef? I ask. My father is, he says, pointing at an older man. I'm the sous chef for tonight. We own a restaurant in the back bay. He pulls out a card from his pocket and hands it to me. We are going to give you the best Caribbean food the Boston area has to offer. Do you like it hot, beautiful? He winks at me when he asks that question. Very, I say back, looking at him in the eye. Behind me, I hear a cough. When I turn around to see who it is, I notice it's Luke. Unconcerned about him choking, I turn my back on him and focus on Byron. Come and check me out sometime. Just ask for Byron. He smiles, showing off perfect white teeth as he walks away. I slide the card in my little white purse and decide right then and there that I'll be calling him sometime next week. When I look up, Luke has gotten closer to me, and just like every other time we're in the same space, his intense gaze meets mine, but only for a second. He looks from me to past where I am, and when I look behind me, I notice he's looking at Byron, giving him the hateful look he usually reserves for me. Eager to get away from him, I flip him the bird and walk away. Dinner is a decadent variety of seafood, complete with grilled and boiled lobster. For non-seafood eaters, they also serve chicken and steak. I find the table with my close family, but while I'm walking in that direction, I find Luke talking with Byron. When I get closer to them, 
Luke points at me, leans down, and whispers something in Byron's ear. Based on the widening of Byron's eyes, I know whatever Luke told him was not good. His smile is victorious as he walks over and plants his big body at the table right behind mine, putting our chairs back to back. I deliberately do not interact with anyone at his table, but I know he deliberately kept pushing his chair into mine. Having had enough of his shit, I ask Steve to switch chairs with me, and miraculously, the idiot didn't bump into the chair any more after that. While dessert is being set up, and Byron and his father break down their station, I approach. You and your father served a mean red snapper, I say to him. Instead of the friendly smile he gave me earlier, he grabs a table and walks right by me, not saying a word. Embarrassed by the display, I turn around, only to find Lucas Clark smirking at me while he holds an ice cream cone to his mouth. What did you say to him? I hiss. The truth? That they only let you out of the institution for the weekend? I told him, you have a history of stalking men. Just doing the poor guy a favor. He laughs and licks the ice cream cone. You wasted your time, Bigfoot. I have his card. I can just call him and explain. You think he'll believe a stalker who lives in a mental institution? You want to know what I told him you were in for? For trying to stab a man who dumped you. And you're only out for the weekend because my family pulled some strings. And do you really have his card, Vivian? Do you really? His words are infuriating as they are challenging. I open my purse only to find the card gone. Unable to take his smirking expression for another second, I reach up and shove the ice cream cone in his face as hard as I can. Damn it! I hear him yell as I walk away. With nothing left for me to do but put on my dress, I enjoy a glass of champagne and nibble on the fruit platter the staff has put out. Thankful to have been the first to finish with my hair and makeup, I can enjoy some peace before we dress and leave. I don't even pretend to be surprised when the front door opens and slams. I knew he'd be here, and I smile in victory. The oldest Clark sibling, Troy, is right behind him, looking frazzled. First thing this morning, I grabbed Tasha's keys and snuck out to a local shop that sells gag gifts. I only felt a little guilty for using the spending money Tasha had given me on this, but Luke Clark deserves it. He reached a new low last night, when I saw him talking with the wedding planner. It's not like I wanted to be paired up with him for the wedding, either. But the way he went about it hurt. You, he says, pointing at me. He starts to approach, but when he sees me, his steps falter, and he comes to a stop. He eyes me in my short silk robe, and for the first time, I'm aware that I have nothing on under this robe his Adam's apple bobs. To appear unaffected by his intense gaze, I pop a grape in my mouth and refuse to flinch as he approaches. He looks a mess. His hair is all over his head and his face has gone completely red. I pinch my nose closed when he's close enough to smell. You smell like shit, I say with a snicker. Not only do you sneak into my room and put a stink bomb in there, you spray some disgusting-smelling cologne on all my clothes. And you stole my tux. Give it to me, or I swear I'll pick you up and throw you in the pool. He reaches for me, but I scream and run behind Troy, using him as a shield. Luke, just go to your room and look for your shit so we can get out of here. You better hope you can wash that smell off. He growls and reaches for me again, but I push his mammoth paw away from me. I don't want your stench on me, rich boy. Get your paw off me. And how the hell did I get into your room, idiot? I stole his room key right after breakfast. That's how. He was dumb enough to leave it on his table, inside the little card with the room number written on it. The big oaf gave me the perfect opportunity when he took the kids, stripped out of his shirt, revealing his perfect body, and jumped in the pool. I swiped his key. 
and was in and out of his room in under five minutes with no one the wiser. You little thief. If I can't find my tux, you're dead. He storms off and runs up the stairs. I laugh loud and deep when I hear his mother chastise him for his smell. Troy just looks at me and shakes his head, but I don't say a word. I've won this round, and that is good enough for me. Is Jake nervous? I ask Troy, as I eat more grapes. He's anxious, not nervous. He's pacing his suite like a caged lion. I had to take his phone so he wouldn't FaceTime her. Oh, that's so sweet, I say. I don't understand how Luke can be related to the two of you. Are you sure he wasn't adopted? Or maybe his real mother took one look at his ugly face and left him on your doorstep or something. Your parents are nice people and took him in. We're sure he's ours, biologically, Troy says with a loud laugh. Really? I ask, feigning surprise. I think you should check and make sure. You and Jake are fairly intelligent human beings, but Luke has the IQ of a slug, the looks of the elephant man, and the manners of a baby monkey. How do you know what the IQ of a slug is? He asks as he reaches for the grapes. While I think of a smart response, the oaf comes stomping down the stairs with his garment bag thrown over his shoulder. Let's go, he says to Troy. We need to stop off at a store so I can buy some clothes and new underwear. This criminal ruined all my shit. You certainly smell like it, I say back. And have you always been such a whiny baby? Maybe Troy should check your diaper before you leave. He growls and shoves his tux into Troy's arms before reaching for me. I let out a loud scream and hide behind Troy, holding on to him as my shield. Go away, elephant man! I'm going to wring your skinny little neck for what you did in my room. He grabs my forearm with one giant paw, and I scream again. I try to move Troy to block me, and with both of us sandwiching him in the middle, he nearly loses his balance. Will you two stop acting like a couple of toddlers? He yells. He manages to shove Luke away, but I don't let him go. You think I went into your room? Prove it, I taunt. He turns towards me, and instead of continuing to use Troy as a shield, I walk around him and look him right in the eye. He points his index finger in my face, and I push it away. You don't stick your finger in my face ever unless you want to lose it. You're just a ray of sunshine, aren't you, you little thief? My finger in your face is the least of your problems. I'm going to prove it all right. I'll ask the hotel to look at their cameras. And when I see you go in my room, I'm pressing charges. I hadn't thought of that when I decided to break into his room. I swallow nervously, and he gives me an evil grin, baring his teeth like the wild animal that he is. Let's go, Luke. You have no proof. All Vivi has to say is that you gave her the key, and she brought your tux here for you at your request. You admitted there was nothing else missing. You have no evidence she actually put a stink bomb in your room or ruined your clothes. Luke stares at his brother, irritation marring his stupid face. Thanks, Troy. Thanks a lot for telling her all of that. You're aiding and abetting a criminal. Let's get the hell out of here. And you, he says, turning his green eyes back on me. Stay away from me. That won't be a problem, I shoot back. You're a human female repellent, and you're ugly. So staying away from you is not exactly a hardship. But you're not a female, so I'm a little worried about it. Medusa. She was a female, you idiot. I yell at his retreating back. With the exception of my parents, everything has been perfect. The ceremony was beautiful and personal, leaving not a dry eye in the church. Everyone always looks at the bride when she enters the church. I disagree. The look on the groom's face when he first sees his bride is where the story is. Sandy wasn't even a quarter of the way down the aisle when the groom started to cry. I don't think he blinked once as she walked to him. And when he spoke his vows, 
my own tears fell. For a brief moment, I not only believed in love, but wanted it. As I stand to the side at the reception, I steal a peek at my parents, and my hopes are dashed. My father is sitting at the table, scowling, and my mother looks like she's only present physically. I shake my head and refuse to focus on them as I hide in this dark corner with the most perfect piece of wedding cake. I look straight at the bar, and just like every other time, Lucas Clark is looking at me. He's with two long-legged blondes, holding on to his arms and listening to his every word. I know they must be airheads because there is nothing Luke Clark has to say that's remotely interesting. His eyes lock with mine, and I refuse to break contact first. The idiot looked so handsome in the church in his tux, and even now, with his tie off and the top two buttons undone, he's still the sexiest man here. There are a few couples still on the dance floor. A slow song plays, and when Selena starts to sing, I could fall in love with you. I feel a pang in my chest at the words, knowing I'll never experience a love like what she's singing about. Even though I'm in the middle of a staring contest with Luke Clark, I know if I look at the newly married couple, I'll find them in their own world, their eyes only for each other, as they sway to this beautiful song. Even from where I am, I can see his green eyes. While we hold each other's stare, his gaze softens, and I can see his body relax. I don't know how I know this, but he's listening to the lyrics. When Selena says, I could only wonder how touching you would make me feel, his eyes finally leave mine. But his eyes never leave my body. He looks me up and down, and slowly licks his bottom lip. From where I'm standing, I can see his eyes darken. His eyes are the least of my problems right now, because I've lost complete control of my body. I don't know when it happened, but I've stopped breathing as my heart practically beats out of my chest. I feel light, as if I'm floating outside of myself. And just like I know he is listening to the lyrics of the song... I know he's feeling the exact same way. I take an involuntary step forward, toward him. I see the exact moment when he holds his breath as he waits for my next move. But the moment is lost. Blonde number one pulls on his sleeve, and as quickly as it appeared, the moment is gone. His eyes leave mine as he turns to the woman next to him. I regain my breath and my heart rate returns to normal. When he looks at me again, the animosity is back. He bends down and whispers something in the blonde's ear, and she looks up at him as she bats her eyelashes. Pretending to be chivalrous, he pulls out chairs for them. He kisses both of their hands, and I feel my stomach fall at the gesture. He looks at me again, the smugness returning tenfold as he turns walking in my direction. Like the predator he is, his giant paw lands on my cake. He swipes the entire piece, and he shoves the whole thing in his mouth without even missing a step. You're the worst, I yell after him. He doesn't even turn around to acknowledge my words. Instead, I stop to the dessert table and grab another piece, relieved not to have to see this jerk again after today. 1.5 Years Later Chapter 1 Luke Jesus, creator, I say to my dad. The mail room. Really, dad? I run both hands across my face, exasperated and deflated by my dad's decree. Yes, you'll start at the bottom and work your way up. He doesn't bother to look at me when he says those words. He continues to type something on his computer, and I'm left stunned. It's not just the mailroom you'd be responsible for. The receptionist will also be reporting to you. All lower-level staff you'll be responsible for, Lucas. He finally finishes typing and looks at me. His sharp brown eyes take in my appearance, and even without him uttering a single word about how I'm dressed, I know he's displeased. 
I don't know why he would be. Fridays are casual days at the office, and my blue jeans and long sleeve tee are acceptable. So what if my jeans are so distressed he can see the hairs on my legs? And the pocket on my shirt might also be torn. And maybe it's been so long since my face was acquainted with a razor that I might not remember how to use one. Unlike my brother Jake and his perfectly trimmed facial hair, mine grows in tufts. And despite my dirty blonde hair, my facial hair is red. Go figure. Jake and Troy didn't have to start in the mailroom, I remind my dad. If I thought those words were going to shame him into giving me a more prestigious position, I was sadly mistaken. He pulls off his reading glasses, throws them on his desk, and fixes his eyes on me. Troy is in-house counsel. He came here with a law degree from Columbia and a license to practice law in this state. Jacob has a bachelor's and a master's degree in economics, Lucas. They've worked here since they were teenagers. You know, they used to come to work with me when they were nine and ten. You barely graduated from college and haven't worked a day in your life. I open my mouth to refute his rebuke, but he holds his hands up, indicating he's not done speaking. Now, part of that is on your mother and me. We spoiled you. Your brothers spoiled you. You've been out of college for a year and a half, and all you've done is go from my house to Jake's house and Troy's house. It's time you took responsibility for yourself, son. Despite the now softer tone, I'm cut down to size at my father's words. I have no defense because everything he said is true. I'm a spoiled rich boy, and I know it. I just didn't think that everybody else knew it, too. My mother spoils me, and despite being 23 years old, she calls me her baby. The creator pretends to be tough, but he pays off my credit card every month, no questions asked. The BMW I drive was bought and paid for by him. In fact, it was a gift for graduating from college, and it replaced the last BMW he bought me. My older brothers spoil me, too, and whenever they decide they are sick of me, their wives jump in to save the day. Sandy, Jake's wife, says I'm the little brother she always wanted, and Tracy, Troy's wife, loves me simply for the fact that I was the one Clark who accepted her for the first five years of her marriage to Troy. Whatever Lucas Clark wants, Lucas Clark gets. But apparently a year and a half of couch surfing, sleeping in until noon, and watching daytime talk shows has run its course. Maybe if I appeal to my mother, the creator will give me more time. And don't even think about going behind my back and talking to your mother. She agrees it's high time you get off your lazy ass and do something with your life. Damn, he's good. But I school my features so he won't know how his words affected me. Fine, I mutter, but I'm not defeated yet. I play my ace card, the one I know will get his attention. At least with this new job, I'll be able to move out. That does the trick. He doesn't know this, but I hate being alone, and the thought of moving into my own place does not appeal to me in the least. I also know my mother hates the idea of an empty nest, and if she has her way, I'll live there until I'm 25, the age where I get access to my trust fund. The same age my brothers were when they were gifted a house by our grandparents. Be grateful that no one else wanted the job. Otherwise, your first job out of college would not be a management position. I need you here Monday at 8, and for fuck's sake, put on some damn clothes that aren't ripped. You look like you got attacked by a pack of wild dogs. And as for you moving out, here's what you'll be giving up if you decide to move out now. I ask him to repeat himself twice when he tells me what's at stake. He knows he has me when he gives me a satisfied smirk. He soon wipes the smile off his face puts his glasses back on, and turns back to his computer screen, effectively dismissing me. The only sound in his large office is the sound of his keyboard. I get up, stretch my legs, and look around his office. It's filled with pictures of our family. There's one of the entire family taken at Jake and Sandy's wedding. My parents are on one side of the married couple, and Troy, Tracy, and I are on the other. I pick it up, remembering that day and how happy everyone was. Next to it is a picture of my niece and nephews, all three belonging to Troy and Tracy. There's also a picture of me and my parents taken at my graduation from Boston College. I'm smiling at the picture. That day was nothing if not stressful. It was a relief to be done with that part of my life. The friends I thought I had turned out not to be my friends. 
In the end, I realized all I had was family. And when it came to family, I hit the jackpot. So it was all good. I'll see you later, creator. The least you can do is take your favorite son to lunch. I'm talking about myself, by the way. I walk around to his side of the desk and playfully punch his shoulder. He takes off his glasses again and looks up at me. He sighs and rubs his face, and for the first time since I walked into his office, he smiles at me. Sorry, son. I have a meeting soon, and I'm working late. Don't forget your mom and I are taking off for the weekend. I'll see you when I get back. We'll have lunch next week. I nod at him, and he nods back. Maybe I'll stay with Jake and Dee this weekend. Hopefully Jake won't tell me to get the fuck out, but if he does, Sandy will tell him to let me stay. And she'll cook for me. Defeated, I grab my coat and walk out of his office. It's a cold November afternoon, and I resent having to come here only to be dismissed by my father. He could have told me this shit at home. Now I'm hungry, and he didn't even have the decency to take me to lunch. I could grab some lunch on my way home, or eat there but the thought of being alone in that big house depresses me. I decide to go one floor down and make my way to Jake's office. When I turn the corner to his office, I see Troy walking ahead of me. I know we're headed to the same place. I walk faster, trying to catch up, so damn relieved that my older brothers are in a place where they can occupy the same space without coming to insults or physical blows. Just as Troy opens the door to Jake's office, I run up to him and his back with my chest causing him to lose his balance and almost fall. Luke the nuke, bitch, I say, calling myself by the name they gave me when I was a kid obsessed with wrestling. When you have brothers that are ten and twelve years older than you, you have to watch what they like. And in their case, it was wrestling. Jesus, Luke, stop with that shit, Troy says as we both stumble into the office. Jake looks up and shakes his head at us. He opens his mouth to speak, but his phone vibrates. By the look on his face, the caller can only be one person. Both of you shut the hell up, he says before he picks up the phone. Hey, gorgeous, he says, smiling into the phone. He sits back in his chair, putting both feet up on his desk. I start to shove Troy again, but he's quick. He turns and puts me in a headlock, rendering me immobile. Just Luke and Troy in here acting like a couple of idiots, Jake says to his wife. Yeah? A pasta maker, huh? No, I had no idea. I try to move away from Troy, but he tightens his hold on me. I try to punch him in the stomach, but he shifts his body and I end up punching into the air. That sounds good, princess. Jake uses one of his many pet names he has for his wife. Everything you make is delicious. Do you need me to get any special wine? He listens to whatever she says. Okay, surprise me. I won't be too late tonight. He gives us the finger as he holds the phone to his ear. Sounds perfect. I love and miss you, too. He has no shame and blows his wife a kiss before ending the call. What are you two clowns doing in my office? He asks, but he's not pissed. He's actually smiling at us. I wanted to see which one of you wants to take their favorite little brother to lunch. I finally managed to get out of Troy's headlock and playfully shove him away. That's why I'm here, too. You have time? Troy asks. Jake gets up and grabs his coat. I have a meeting in about an hour or so. Let's go somewhere where I can get something quick and light. Sandy's making pasta for dinner tonight. Apparently, someone gives a pasta maker as a wedding gift. We start to walk out of the office. Troy stops us. Homemade pasta. Tonight. Yeah, Jake says. I'm free tonight, Troy says, fishing for an invitation. He's a rookie. I already know I'm going to show up at Jake's tonight. He'll be annoyed, but Sandy will welcome me with open arms especially when I tell her how hungry I am. You should make some plans then, Troy, Jake says as he opens the door to his office. Come on, let us come over. Jake lets out a loud laugh. Why would I do that? You think I would give up having my wife and I feed each other while she sits on my lap so I can entertain you and your family? Do I look crazy to you? I hold in my laugh since I'm about to ruin Jake's plans with his wife tonight. He should let Troy come too. But if there's one thing Jake hates, it's having his alone time with Sandy interrupted. Cause I'm your brother and neither I nor my wife can cook? I laugh so hard I snort. <laughs> yeah, we all remember that vegan pizza you served at the last brunch, I remind him. Since both brothers are married and have resolved their issues for the most part, they take turns hosting a brunch once a month. 
It's between Jake and Sandy, Troy and Tracy, and Sandy's sister, Tosh, and her husband, Chris. And I thought the vegan cheese was the most offensive thing I ever tasted, until I tried the vegan pepperoni, Jake says. I chuckle and tap my shoulder with his. You think I like that shit? Tracy's off her vegan phase, though, and you two complained so much I ended up ordering regular pizza, Troy says. I make vomit sounds, and he slaps me upside the head. Aunt Sandy won't mind. Luke, call her and ask her, Troy says to me. As much progress as my brothers have made, Troy would not go so far as to call Sandy himself. I give Jake the middle finger and pull out my phone. He tries to grab it from me, but Troy blocks him. I dial Sandy, and she picks up on the second ring. I put her on speaker and stick my tongue out at Jake. Hey, sis-in-law, you think Troy and I can come by for pasta tonight? Tell them no, baby. They want to ambush our night. Troy never has anything worth eating at his house, and I'm just greedy, I say to her. You know, you guys are always welcome. I'm going to make a bunch of different stuff, so eat a light lunch. Troy and I high-five each other, and Jake just looks pissed. Gotta run to the store. Jake, Sandy says. I'm right here. I'm going to make you a little something spicy. You're my little something spicy, Jake says. I put my finger in my mouth and pretend to puke. This won't be as spicy as me, but you'll love it. Jake groans and I pull the phone away from him, disgusted. No phone sex on my phone, please. We'll see you later, Sandy. Okay. I love you, Jacob, she yells, but I hang up the phone before Jake can reply. Did you just hang up on my wife? He attempts to slap me upside the head, but I dodge him. I crash into Troy instead, pushing him against the wall. Will you grow the fuck up, Luke? Troy growls as he fixes his coat. I try to crash into him again, but he sidesteps, and I end up colliding with Jake, who has had enough of my shit. He puts and keeps me in another headlock until we reach his truck. Just open the damn door. I'm starving. Jake scowls at me as he punches in the code to his front door. As soon as I hear the locks open, I rush past him and step inside. Just as I expected, the house smells incredible. I'm not sure what the hell Sandy cooked, but I know it's going to be amazing. Between her, her mother, and her sister, I never miss one of their family meals. Jake pushes me to the side and walks up the stairs to go find his wife, and I decide to give them some privacy as I take my time taking off my coat. After lunch, I didn't want to go back to my parents' empty house, so I spent the afternoon hanging out in Jake's and Troy's offices. Neither of them minded. Well, if they did, they didn't say anything. Troy never would. Out of my two brothers, he's the most patient and never has a bad thing to say about anybody. Jake has less of a filter, but I'm ten years younger than he is, and like everyone else in the family, he puts up with more than he should when it comes to me. The past two years with my brothers have been great, but the five years before that were fraught with anger, bitterness, and downright hostility. Jake wanted nothing to do with Troy, but Troy always loved our middle brother and did everything he could to have him back in his life. Being less than two years older than Jake, Troy and Jake had always been extremely close, until Tracy. It wasn't until Jake met his now wife that the animosity between my brothers burned itself out. Even that took months, and at first, it was awkward. The fighting, insults, and jabs were done, but the closeness they once had didn't return as I had hoped it would until Troy took matters into his own hands and started a monthly siblings lunch. Even now, despite all the progress, they are nowhere near as close as they once were. For five years, Troy and Jake could never be in the same room without things devolving into some sort of physical or verbal altercation. I took sides during their feud. No one asked me to, but I sided with Troy. I didn't condone what he did, but I believed Jake was the one who kept the feud going. Troy was married to Tracy. She had chosen him. And all Jake had to do was forgive our brother, who was in agony over the situation. Taking after both of my parents, I wasn't shy about where I stood. No one in the family was, but I was the only one who fully supported Troy. We got closer over the years, and Jake got further away from us. I missed him, but I was so mad at him for his actions, until I was hit with the bullet of betrayal. After going through the most horrible experience of my life about two years ago, the only person I could confide in was Jake. Instead of telling me to fuck off like I deserved, he listened, offered no judgment, and kept my secret. 
In minutes, he was back to the brother I always had. The afternoon of the first brunch, Tracy was nearly white as a sheet when she walked into the restaurant. I strategically sat next to Jake, ready to tackle him if he decided to go after Troy. But there was no need. Jake had just gotten engaged to Sandy, and I don't know what conversation they had, but the brunch was nothing but pleasant. Tracy was quiet at first, but Tosh, Sandy's older sister, started talking to her about pregnancy and motherhood, and that broke the ice. We sat in a private room at a restaurant for three hours, exchanging stories about our childhood. I don't know what miracle Sandy worked, but when Troy addressed Jake, we all held our breath. Jake replied, made a joke about Troy, and I had my brothers back. They aren't as close as they were when I was a kid, but it's better than what it was for those five years. The sound of Sandy's squeal pulls me out of my reverie. I hop up the stairs onto the main floor. Just as expected, Jake has Sandy pinned into the kitchen island, nibbling on the side of her neck. She squeals again, but he finally leaves her neck and kisses her on the mouth. I'm here, I announce. Stop being disgusting. Jake pulls away and scowls at me. Sandy smiles, and I go over and kiss her on the cheek. Stay away from my wife. Get your own girl, Jake says. He playfully punches me in the arm. You know I'm off women. I'm done. They look at each other and roll their eyes. Sandy even has the audacity to laugh at me. Uh-huh. Just get the plates, Jake says. Lord knows you're here often enough. You should know the drill. He goes back to nibbling on his wife's ear, and I make a beeline for the cabinets. I set plates, utensils, and glasses on the island. I help Sandy put the food in serving dishes, and my stomach growls loudly at the different types of pasta, meatballs, chicken alfredo, chicken parmesan, and one with shrimp and lobster. I look around and steal a shrimp when no one is looking. When the doorbell rings, I let Sandy's sister Tosh, Chris, and their twins inside. They bring dessert from Sandy's mother's bakery, and Tosh, our amateur bartender, starts mixing cocktails. I bypass the mixed drink, and since Jake is distracted, I grab a bottle of his precious rum given to him by his mother-in-law. He has several bottles, but this is a high-end bottle, and he throws a fit whenever anyone else touches it, claiming it's only for him, and the rest of us can drink the lower-end stuff. Yeah, like that's about to happen. I put a finger to my lips, telling Tosh to be quiet as I pour myself a shot. Her eyes light up, and she gives me a small nod. I grab a second glass and pour her one. As quietly as possible, we clink our glasses and drink. Tosh giggles as she quickly puts the shot glasses in the dishwasher. Soon, Troy, Tracy, and their three kids arrive. I lean against the sink counter and watch as Tracy and Sandy hug. It's gotten less awkward over time, but I can't imagine having my sister-in-law also be your husband's ex-girlfriend. Travis, my two-and-a-half-year-old nephew, waddles to me, breaking me out of my thoughts. Tristan, his older brother, goes directly to Jake. Emma grabs Sandy's hand, pulling her towards the bedroom, probably to get a headband. Hey, buddy, I say to Travis, tickling his belly. You hungry? He laughs and shakes his head. He's as smart as a whip, but a late talker. Tracy, I have some sparkling water for you, Tosh says, handing her a glass. Tracy thanks her, and Troy takes a glass of wine. But before he sips it, he spots the bottle of rum. Oh, we drinking this, he asks, reaching for the bottle. Jake tries to swipe it from his hand, but Troy dodges him. There are three other bottles. Why you two go for the one that's just for me is beyond me. Tristan pulls him away before Jake can snatch the bottle out of Troy's hand. Jake scowls at us both, but he lets Tristan lead him away. Pour me one, I say to Troy. He hands me a shot and we down it at the same time. Tracy walks over to us, and Troy puts his arm around her shoulder. You finally ready to come to work on Monday? I have no choice, I guess. It's been a good ride. I shrug my shoulders, uncaring about the turn of events. I thought my father would have put his foot down and forced me to work last year, but he never did. Who's ready to eat? Jake shouts, walking back to the kitchen. The sooner we eat, the sooner you can get the hell out so I can be alone with my wife. Oh, chillax, Jacob, I say. You act like you don't like it when we come over here. I'm not acting, he deadpans. Here, he shoves a plate in my hand. Sandy, Emma, and Tasha's kids come back, all the girls wearing matching headbands. So much for hospitality, 
Chris, Tasha's husband, says. Jake's response is to shove a plate in his hand, too. I wanted a quiet night at home, but you people managed to invite yourselves over here. Again, he exaggerates the word again, and we all laugh at him. We come here for Sandy, not you. Oh, and for the food. I put my empty plate down and help all the kids find seats. I grab Travis's high chair and strap him in. Since he's my godson, I fix him a plate of spaghetti and meatballs and pray his parents brought him a change of clothes. We all sit down to dinner, the room loud with talk and laughter. Jake's at the head of the table, and Sandy is sitting to his right. Every few seconds, they either feed each other or he kisses the back of her hand. I don't even think he realizes he kisses her so often. It's just natural. Troy and Tracy are not as affectionate in public. Maybe it's all the years of drama that happened when they first got together and married. But they are much more conservative when it comes to public displays of affection. You know what we all need? Chris asks. Another boy's trip? The women roll their eyes and groan. Hell yes, I say. Let's plan something for after the holidays. You go ahead. We're going to Hawaii, Jake announces, kissing the back of Sandy's hand again. Hawaii works for me? I say, dumbass, you won't even have enough vacation yet, and you people are not crashing our vacation. It's bad enough we're stuck with you for the holidays. Jake tries to sound grumpy, but he's smiling. Luke, I'm sure I can convince Dad to let you have some vacation, Troy says. That's why you're my favorite brother, Troy. Hey, if Chris is going to Hawaii, I'm going to, Tosh says. Maybe we can all go, Troy says. Are you serious? It's like I can't get rid of you people. I don't want to take a family vacation. I want to be with my wife, alone. Sandy smiles at him. No, oh, I'm talking about a boy's trip like we did for Jake's bachelor party. I need another one of those. Everyone talks at once as they think of places we can go for a weekend. I got it, Troy yells over the loud chatter. We can all go to New Orleans in March. He gestures between him and Jake. We have to travel there for work. The rest of you can fly down there Friday. Chris yells a loud yes and reaches across the table to fist bump Troy. Jake says nothing, but he leans in and whispers something in Sandy's ear. She bites her bottom lip and nods at him. I get Troy's attention and point my head towards Jake. Troy rolls his eyes and throws his hands up in frustration. We both know Sandy will end up in New Orleans, which means so will Tosh and most likely Tracy. Eventually, Troy shrugs and puts his arm around his wife and gives her a kiss. Girls can do some girl shit while we be men, I whisper to Troy. Hey, everyone, can you please convince Sandy to let us buy the house we saw on Maple? Jake asks. I love this house, Sandy says. But it won't always only be the two of us. We'll need space. Tosh, talk to your sister. First of all, Tosh and I grew up in a house much smaller than this, and we turned out fine, Sandy says. I don't know about Tosh, baby, but you turned up perfect, Jake says. The men groan, and I throw my napkin at Jake. Oh, thank you, baby, Sandy says. She tries to kiss his cheek, but he turns his head and kisses her on the lips. We all grumble at the display. Tosh is okay, Chris says, shrugging his shoulders. Tosh pretends to be offended, but Chris pulls her to him and kisses her on the forehead. Well... I grew up in a house much bigger than this, and I turned out okay, too, Jake counters. That's debatable, Troy says, and everyone laughs. Troy and I went to New Orleans a few years back, Tracy says, her voice still tentative. I know a great spa we can go to while the guys do whatever. The women all turn to Tracy as they discuss the spa. I want to go since I missed out on New Orleans when you went, Dee, Tosh says. She immediately gets my brother's attention. When did my wife go to New Orleans? He asks Tosh, but it's Sandy who answers. Before she became your wife, I did have a life, you know. I went to Mardi Gras with Ebony and Diana about a year before we met, Sandy says. Jake grumbles something and Tosh quickly pulls out her phone to show pictures from the trip. Sandy throws a roll at her sister. Seriously? Jake says, scrolling through the pictures. Who let you wear these tiny little dresses? Nice legs, Dee, I say, without even looking at the pictures. My words work and my brother reaches over and tries to slap the back of my head. You know, baby, I'm going to have to talk with your mother about this. I don't like that you had a life before me. She should have sent you to a convent until we met, not leave you to go out looking like this, 
he says as he looks at more pictures. Can you text these to me, Tosh? He hands the phone back, and a few seconds later, Jake's phone starts to vibrate with the incoming texts. Oh, really, caveman, Sandy says. You should go talk to her about that, then, if you dare. And when should I have come out of the convent? A month before we met? Six months? A year? Are you nuts? Six months to a year? Hell no. Same day. You leave the convent about lunchtime, and then we'd meet up six hours later and get married the next day. Tell me, Sandy says, looking from me to Troy. Has he ever been committed? You can tell me. His psychiatrist wanted to, but our parents would never do it, Troy says. It's up to you now, Sandy. Don't make me call the men in the white coats, Jacob, Sandy warns my brother as she eyes him up and down. As I stuff my face with meatballs, I look around the room and smile at my family. Despite having to go to work, my family life can't be any better than this. My brothers are back to being friends, and their wives get along. My life is without complications. My family members are my best friends. I have no place in my life for a romantic relationship with a woman or even a male friend. I had all of that, and it all went to shit. Never again. This life right here is perfection. Women bring nothing but heartache and complications into my life. Luke, make yourself useful and go get more wine, Jake orders. Since I come over here so much, it's the least I can do. As soon as I get up, the doorbell rings. Whoever it is must be leaning on the bell because it just rings repeatedly. What the fuck, Jake says, looking at the door. At the same time, I hear a cell phone ringing. I'll get it, I say, since I'm already up. The dogs start to bark at the persistent doorbell. I grab a meatball from the stovetop and shove it in my mouth before running down the stairs to the front door. Hold your horses, I yell as I open the door. My blood pressure instantly rises when I see Vivienne Chateau standing in front of me. What the fuck is your prop? She doesn't give me time to finish. Her body slides through the door, brushing her perfect tits against my chest. She's fast for a little thing because she's up the stairs before I can even close the front door. By the time I make it upstairs, she's in the middle of a group hug with Tosh and Sandy while the man and Tracy look on. Zeus sees her and runs in her direction. Vivienne lets out a loud shriek, but Jake gets up and grabs Zeus's collar before he can get to her. Come on, sweetie, Sandy says as she guides Vivienne into her bedroom. Tosh has her arm around Vivienne the entire time. What the hell just happened? I asked, to no one in particular. I think we're going to need some hard liquor instead of wine to deal with the presence of the Antichrist. I grab a bottle of rum and put it on the table. She was so upset. Poor thing, Tracy says. I hope she's okay. She'll be fine. Evil ones always turn out fine, I say. Jake gives me a warning look. She's not evil, man. Vivi's a sweetheart. She's going through a rough time. Chris gets up from the table and starts to pace. Sweetheart my ass. But I know better than to say that. Jake walks Zeus and Lady to the sliding glass door and lets them out into the yard. Vivienne Chateau is a viper. She's rude, abrasive, and a bitch. Whatever she's going through, she probably deserves it. Chris is married to her cousin, so he has to feel sorry for her. I know what she's really like. She's nothing but a loudmouthed shrew who goes out of her way to disagree with everything I say. Just like a man, she said to me once. You think you know every damn thing. I don't even remember what the hell I was talking about at that time. I know when to mind my own damn business, I whispered to her. I whispered it because her aunt was nearby, and I soon realized that Sandy's mom sees no wrong when it comes to her niece. I'll start cleaning up, Tracy says, standing up. I'll help you, Trey, Troy says. Come on, Luke, stop staring down the hall. I snap out of my trance not having realized I was staring down the hall. Why don't you go see what's going on, Jake? I suggest. Not that I care, but Jake does if it affects his wife, and a hysterical lunatic showing up at his door definitely affects his wife. I'm going to give them some privacy, he says. He rinses the dishes and loads them into the dishwasher. It's her father, Chris says to no one in particular. He's a real asshole. He's very hard on her. I knew it was only a matter of time before the shit hit the fan. Vivienne is like her aunt, and her father can't handle it. Like her aunt? She's nothing like Sandy's mom. Sandy's mom is no-nonsense, 
but she's a sweet woman who happens to love me. Vivienne Chateau is a surly imp with a bad attitude. She's nothing like her aunt, but I won't tell Chris that. Maybe he wouldn't be so hard on her if she wasn't such a witch, I say to myself. Jake turns his sharp glare on me. Stop with that shit, Luke. You both act like toddlers when you're around each other. She's already upset, so don't make it worse. I ignore Jake and resume cleaning up. I add more dishes to the dishwasher as Tracy and Troy finish clearing the table. You know, Luke, you and Vivi sound like the beginning of a love story. Enemies turned lovers, Tracy says wistfully. I laugh so hard I snort. Me and that viper? She'll probably die alone. And I'm not dating, ever, I remind her. I feel a sharp slap at the back of my head. I told you to shut up about that, Jake says. I rub the back of my head, only to get a nasty look from Chris. Why is everyone so protective of her? She's mean. Whatever it is, I'm siding with her dad. The man put up with her all these years. Can you imagine what his life has been like living with someone so... The bedroom door opens, and Jake warns me to keep my mouth shut. I continue to wipe the now clean counter as the three women walk back into the dining room. Vivienne is in the middle, and Tosh and Sandy both have an arm around her. I try to resist the eye roll, but I'm not successful. She sees it, and her sadness immediately morphs into anger. Her nostrils flare, and her eyes form into angry slits. We stare at each other, both of us daring the other to speak first. You want something to eat, Vivi? Tosh asks. I'll fix her a plate, Tosh. Sit down, sweetie. She finally breaks our glaring contest and takes a seat at the table. She sits at the head of the table, giving me her back. I'd bet my trust fund she did that on purpose. Fine by me. She's a mess from what I saw. Her hair is a mess, as usual. The dark brown hair is wavy, but it's untamed. Someone should introduce her to a brush. A few freckles on the bridge of her nose were visible. She usually does a better job of covering them with makeup. Her dark brown eyes are red and puffy from crying, as are her cheeks. Her black sweats are wrinkled and much too big for her lithe body. She's normally more put together than this, but it's not my problem. I do take some comfort in knowing she probably hates that I'm seeing her like this. I should leave and let her have some peace, but I won't. Instead, I pour myself a glass of water and take the seat opposite her. Her brown eyes land on mine immediately. Her plush lips automatically purse as if she's tasted something sour. She cuts her eyes at me and looks away. You can come home with me and Chris, Vivi, Tosh says as she gently strokes the she-devil's hair. I could swear I saw horns. We have a wedding to go to tomorrow, though. That's okay. I can just hang out there. Sandy puts a plate of food in front of her and slowly picks up the fork. Sweetie, you should be around people. You stay with me and Jake, okay? She-devil looks at Jake, who smiles at her and nods. No surprise there. He does whatever makes Sandy happy. I don't want to intrude. You two are practically newlyweds, she says, her voice small. I practically live here and no one cares. Why is she acting like them being newlyweds is a big deal? Since when does she have manners? It's no bother, Vivi. You stay as long as you like, Jake says. Thank you. I'd rather not be alone. I can't help it. I can't hold in my snort. Rather not be alone? She's going to die alone. Didn't she get the memo? She turns her devil eyes on me again. Tosh and Sandy fuss over her while Chris, Troy, and Tracy gather their kids. Soon everyone is left, but I still haven't made any move to leave. I watch, fascinated as she eats the entire plate of pasta and meatballs. It was piled high. Too high for someone so tiny but she doesn't leave a bite. You headed home, Luke? Jake asks. The creator and mom are out of town. You know how much I hate being alone in that big house? I shrug at my big brother. This is the part where he tells me to get lost, and I ignore him and crash in the guest room that I've claimed for myself. Before he opens his mouth, the little minx snorts. I turn to face her and she smirks at me before giving me a dirty look. Well, go home or go stay with Troy, Jake says. Food's better over here. I stand up and do an exaggerated stretch. My shirt rides up, exposing a good part of my lower abs. 
I don't miss Vivienne's gaze on my body. I also don't miss the eye roll. I'll take care of the dogs for you two in the morning so you can sleep in. That's always my ticket to spending the night. The idea of sleeping in always works on Jake. I'll take my usual room. I don't wait for him to speak as I start my way down the long hallway to the guest room. Let Vivi sleep in that room. You take the other one, Jake yells behind me. I stop in my tracks and turn around. But my stuff is already in that room, and the other bed is too small for me. I'm the same height as Jake, six feet three inches. I need a king-sized bed to sleep comfortably. Tinkerbell can sleep on an ottoman and be fine. Well, too bad, Jake says. It's fine. I can sleep in the other room. Can I borrow something to sleep in, Sandy? Sure, sweetie. Come on. I'll have Tosh leave some clothes for you at the bakery tomorrow. You can borrow my old car for as long as you need. Tiny Dancer stands up and Sandy puts her arm around her waist as they walk towards me down the hall. Sandy stops at the door to the master bedroom. I'll bring you some things in your room, she says. Tiny nods and continues walking towards me down the hall, ignoring me completely. Good night, I say just to piss her off. No wonder there was such a stench in that room the last time I was here. You still smell like shit. She puts her index finger underneath her nose as she dishes out that insult. She steps around me, walks a few more feet down the hall, and goes into the other guest bedroom. The one that's right next door to mine. I don't remember how it happened, but it's been hate since the moment we laid eyes on each other. Two years before. I let out a loud yawn inside my BMW 750. I'm so fucking exhausted, but when I promise my nephew I'll show up at his last soccer game for the season, I keep my word. It was a waste of time going to California to confront Tori. After a week of calls and texts, she still refused to see me. Having enough of her avoiding me, I finally knocked on the door to her house. I didn't know what to expect, but when her father opened the door, the expression on his face told me all I needed to know. We'd met before. He was on campus last fall for Parents Weekend, and we got along well. But the affable man I met months ago was nowhere in sight. He told me his daughter didn't want to see me and ordered me off his property. I called Jake and cried like a little bitch, and he told me to get on a flight home immediately and to put this shit behind me. I'll help you sort through this, he had said. It's hard to believe that was just a little over 24 hours ago because I feel aged and hollow. I grab my coffee and finish it, needing all the caffeine to keep me awake before I can go home and crash in my bed and forget about the last week. I need to forget about the last ten months and the disaster that was. All I wanted were some answers. I wasn't ready to be a parent either, but I was willing to step up and take responsibility. She decided she didn't want to continue the pregnancy, and I didn't get a vote. Hell, she didn't even tell me until three days after, via text message. After all the declarations of love and a future together, she could not face me after ending the pregnancy. Just a few months ago, I was willing to move to California to be with her once we graduated. She was going to attend law school on the West Coast, and I was to follow her. But now I'm left blindsided. Fucking coward, I mutter to myself. The character trait I despise the most is cowardice. I slam my door a little too forcefully and start to cut across the parking lot. My phone vibrates, and I pull it out of my back pocket. As I'm scrolling through my texts, I collide with something. Oh, shit! I look down and see a girl sitting on her ass in the middle of the parking lot. She's looking down on the ground and reaches for her phone. The first thing I notice is that her dark hair is a long, poofy mess. It's a thick mane of wavy tresses, which, in my opinion, can use a bit of moisture. She finally gets her hand on the phone and looks up. Our eyes clash. The background noises fade away as I hold her gaze. Her eyes are like dark chocolate. Her skin is light, but she's a black woman. She even has about four or five freckles across the bridge of her little nose. But what I notice immediately are her lips full and lush, with red lipstick, making her skin appear even lighter than it is. I offer her my hand to help her up, and she takes it. 
She doesn't move right away. Instead, she holds onto my hand while she continues to look into my eyes. My large hand swallows her much smaller one, and when I squeeze, I feel goosebumps. I pull her to her feet, and she barely reaches my chin when she stands. Are you okay? I ask, my voice foreign to my own ears. I wait for her to offer me an apology for bumping into me and to thank me for helping her up, but she yanks her hand out of my grasp and readjusts her clothes. In the future, please watch where you're going. The parking lot is a public space. Her voice is husky but sexy. It's much deeper than I expected. She slides her phone in her pocket and looks me up and down. Just like a man to think he owns everything. She waves me off and walks away, effectively dismissing me. Excuse me? You were walking and texting, weren't you? Oh, and you're welcome, by the way. Even though she's walking away, she stops when she hears my words. To my shock, she walks back towards me. Despite being more than a foot shorter than I am, she comes and stands directly in front of me. And what exactly would I need to thank you for? She sneers, hands on her hips as she looks up at me. For helping you up, Thumbelina? Thumbelina? Not very original, are you? Well, I'd rather be a Thumbelina than a giant oaf of a man, she says, pointing a dainty finger at me. I laugh at her words. You're just another crazy female. Be on your way. I mimic her gesture and wave her off. Another crazy female? That's just what I would expect to come out of the mouth of someone like you. Someone like me? You don't even know me, tiny dancer. I don't need to know you to know you're an ass. You're out here acting like a barbarian, knocking women over and insulting them. Is that what the definition of barbarian is? You know what? Why am I wasting my time talking to a shrew like you? You're not worth my time. Go away. Instead of going away, she comes even closer. Call me another name, and I'll knock you on your big barbarian butt. This time, I throw my head back and let out a loud belly laugh. Okay, Smurfette. I'm so scared. I turn my back on her, leaving her standing in the parking lot while I walk towards the field, unsure of what the hell just happened. Chapter 2 Vivi Thanks for letting me stay, Sandy. Tell Jake thank you for me. I reach over and hug my favorite cousin. When she takes me in her arms and squeezes me tight, tears well in my eyes. Unable to hold back, I begin to sob in her arms. It's okay, sweetie. Let it out. You know me, Mama, and Tosh won't let anything bad happen to you. Mama will take care of your father, and we'll take care of the rest, okay? You know we love you. I cry harder at her words. My aunts and cousins are my world. In our family, I got the short end of the stick in the parent department, whereas Tosh and Sandy hit the jackpot. My father, my aunt's older brother, is a controlling tyrant, and I've had enough. He controls the house, the money, my schooling, my friends, where I go, who I talk to on the phone, and everything else I do. At 21 years of age, I've only ever been allowed to work at my aunt's bakery during school breaks. The only happy memories I have are the summers when he would let me stay with Aunt Gabrielle. Sandy is eight years older, and she would be with me all summer. Tosh would take us to the mall and movies on the weekends, and my aunt would dote on me like I wish my own mother would. I learned everything about being a woman from my aunts and cousins. Vivi. You cannot be independent until you are able to take care of yourself, Aunt Gabrielle always said. I didn't understand when I was younger, but I do now. No one can control you when you can pay your own way. Well, I still can't pay my own way. I'm not independent. I have nothing. I'm 21 years old, Sandy. I feel like I've been a prisoner for most of my life. The only time I've ever been free is when I've been with you guys. I say against her neck, You're free now. You don't ever have to go back. He said he would only pay for me to become a nurse. I don't want to do that. I know, sweetie. That was the final straw between me and my father. Well, it was a perfect storm today. 
He found out I changed my major from nursing to accounting and lost his mind. When he ordered me to change it back, I stood my ground and refused. When he threatened to put me out and stop covering whatever financial aid didn't cover, I got in his face and told him to do his worst. Something inside me snapped, and after 21 years of either being ignored or told what to do, I had reached my limit. Who treats their daughter that way? I say against her neck. He's always been like that. We all knew it was only a matter of time until you'd have had enough. I wish Aunt Gabrielle was my mother and you and Tosh were my sisters. My own mother has never said a word in my defense. He controls her too, Vivi. Don't worry about that right now. You can stay here. We'll figure everything else out in time. And like the big cousin she is, she plants a soft kiss on my forehead. Get some rest. When Sandy leaves, I put on the sleep set she gave me and slide under the covers. I exhale and sink into the plush mattress and relax for the first time today. Getting thrown out and disowned by your father should be a horrible experience, but as Sandy said, I feel free. I might not have a job or money, but I have something priceless. I have my freedom. I have autonomy. And for the first time in a long time, I have hope. Despite the day, I smile, relieved and happy. Even the asshole next door won't dampen my good mood. I remember the first time I ever laid eyes on him. He was right. I wasn't paying attention to where I was going. I was looking at my phone when we collided, and it was like walking into a brick wall. I remember his touch, my hand in his giant paw. I remember the jolt of electricity that coursed through my body at his touch. But most importantly, I remember his eyes, green with flecks of brown around his irises. I remember that feeling in the pit of my stomach as we continued to stare at each other. That was not something I needed or wanted in my life. I was upset that day because my father refused to let me live with my aunt for the upcoming school year. He was only willing to cover the tuition if I lived at home. I wasn't allowed to have a car, so I had to take the train to UMass Boston each day. When you graduate, you can live here for as long as you want. If I had the money, I would pay the tuition for you. My aunt had told me, as she held me that morning. I already had one man in my life controlling me. I didn't need another who would control my body, too, so I went on the defensive. By the time I found out his brother was marrying my favorite cousin, the hate was mutual. As I closed my eyes and started to drift into a peaceful sleep, his eyes are the last thing I think about. Chapter 3. Vivi After taking much too long in that luxurious shower in the guest bedroom, I put on the pair of leggings and sweater Sandy gave me the night before. They're too big, but they will have to do until I get my own clothes, or until Tosh brings me some of hers. I tiptoe down the hall towards the kitchen, thinking about the breakfast I plan to make for Sandy and Jake as a thank you, but I find I'm too late. Sandy is at the sink and Jake is kissing her as if they didn't just wake up in the same bed. I think I love you, Mrs. Clark, he says between kisses. I lean against the wall and watch them, a small smile on my lips. My mind flashes back to when I first met Jake. Sandy told me she was going to bring her boyfriend to the bakery, and when I saw them walk in holding hands, I almost dropped the cake I was carrying. She smirked when she saw my expression, knowing full well she left out one important detail when she had described her boyfriend to me the night before. "'You think you love me?' she asks playfully, and he nods. "'Well, I know for a fact I love you. You know why? "'It's because I was up on a Saturday before seven so I could walk your dogs. "'Mr. Clark, I picked up dog poop this morning, and Zeus does not exactly drop pebbles. "'So, yeah.' I love you. 
They're your dogs too, gorgeous. Where's Luke? He was supposed to walk them. I bristle at the mention of Luke's name. I haven't seen him, and the dogs were antsy. I didn't want to risk them having an accident in the house. Fucking Luke, he says. Good morning, I say, making myself known. I was going to make you two breakfast as a thank you. I got it, but you can get the coffee, Sandy says. The aroma of coffee, bacon, and pancakes fill the room, causing my stomach to growl. Sandy giggles at something Jake whispered to her as I walk over to the coffee maker. I pour three mugs of coffee and pull out the cream from the fridge. Just as I take my first sip, I hear loud footsteps. How are you all up before me? He starts whistling like a lunatic. Zeus, lady, let's go. Big oaf. He's in sweats today. Navy blue ones. It should be illegal for him to wear that color. He was wearing blue the day we collided in the parking lot, too. They've already been out, Jake says, but his whistling brings the dogs to the kitchen. Zeus sees me and approaches. On instinct, I jump out of my seat and run behind Sandy. He's not going to hurt you. He likes you, Jake says. He grabs the dog's collar and brings it to me. He sniffs my hand before he licks it. I jump at the sudden assault and run back to my seat. For someone with such a big mouth, you sure are a wimp, Luke mutters as he pours himself some coffee. Thankfully, the dogs soon get bored and leave the kitchen, and I decide to ignore the jerk and focus on my coffee. Sandy, I say, I can't believe you're making pancakes. You don't even like them. But her husband loves them, so she makes them all the time. He squeezes her hips when he says that, and she lets out a squeal. You two seem so happy. You and Tosh are the only happily married people I know. I don't know if I could ever be with a white man, though. Luke glares at me, and Jake snorts as he takes a seat at the head of the table. Funny. That's the same thing your cousin said to me. And look at her now. Vivi, Sandy says. And that's water under the bridge, Jacob. She places all the prepared food on the island, next to a stack of clean plates. You're rude. Who says that? And on behalf of white men everywhere, we thank you. We fully support that message. Luke says, glaring at me. I'm going to take a collective breath of relief for us all. He inhales and dramatically exhales. What? What I mean is, I will never get married. I don't think you need to worry about that, Luke says, laughing into his cup. What is that supposed to mean? And I wasn't talking to you. His mug makes a loud thud on the table as he sets it down. Well, I'm talking to you, he says, pointing at me. What I mean is, you don't have to worry about getting married. What man would want to deal with your bad attitude? He'd have to be either crazy or desperate. Luke, shut up, Jake warns. And yet, here you are, sticking your giant nose in my business. Sandy snickers, and Jake smirks at my comeback. Just pretend I'm not here. That's what I do whenever you're in the room. It's hard when you have such a big mouth, he says back as he loads his plate with pancakes and bacon. I get out of my chair and he stops piling food on his plate as I approach him. I put my finger at his chest and poke him with it. He doesn't so much as flinch. Instead, he leans back in the chair and puts both hands behind his head, almost daring me to touch him again. Well, you better get used to that big mouth, Lucas. I've had enough of men like you trying to shut me up. You are not man enough to silence me. Got it? I poke him one more time and grab a plate. Do you mind if I make some eggs, Sandy? Chapter 4 Luke Jake is telling me to shut the fuck up with his eyes, and Sandy's looking from me to Vivienne, her brow creased. I watch as Vivi cuts up some stuff on a cutting board. Soon the kitchen is filled with a delicious aroma of sautéed vegetables and onions. 
A few minutes later, she has a huge plate of scrambled eggs on the table. I made enough for the three of us, she says, not even looking in my direction. I snatch the plate and fill my plate with eggs. Best eggs I've ever had, but I would die before I'd tell her that. So, what are your plans, Vivi? Jake asks a few minutes later. Well, I'm going to start looking for a job right away. I'll probably have to take a semester off school, but hopefully I can get some extra financial aid and a loan and start again next fall. So, I'll graduate in December of next year, instead of next May. Maybe Auntie will give me more hours at the bakery until I can find something. But I want to thank you two so much for letting me stay here. I will cook and clean since I can't pay anything yet. She takes a small bite of her eggs, a blush on her cheeks. You are not going to live here so you can be our maid, sweetie. We already have someone who does the cleaning. Your family. Sandy looks at Jake, and they share a moment. We've talked about it, and we'll cover your tuition next semester. You're not going to be behind. Vivi opens her mouth to argue, but then closes it. I watch as her eyes pool with tears. They fall, and she starts to weep at the table. I stop mid-chew and stare at my brother. He shrugs at me. Vivian jumps from her chair and runs to her room, and Sandy follows behind her. I should feel bad for her. I don't know what happened, but I can't imagine having to drop out of school to work to save for tuition. What just happened? It's just tuition for fuck's sakes, I mumble, mouthful. She's had a rough time. Stop being such a dick. I hold my hands up in surrender and continue eating. I grab the last of the eggs before Jake can eat them. A few minutes later, they come back, Vivi much more composed than before. Thank you two so much. I will pay you back, I promise. No, you won't. It's a gift. We don't want you to worry about it, Sandy says. She nods, but she doesn't speak. I watch her as she eats. Is it okay if I go to the movies with Blake later? Who the fuck is Blake? Vivi, you're 21. You don't have to ask us for permission to go out. Just be careful and be safe, Sandy says. Who the hell is Blake? I ask. Jake looks at me, brows arched. He gives me a smug grin as if he's in on some secret. Not that it's any of your business, but he's a friend. She turns her attention back to Sandy. He wants to be more, Sandy, but I don't want to be tied down to one guy. I plan on exploring my sexuality. I start to choke on my coffee at her last statement. I choke so hard Jake slaps me on my back a couple of times. Well, just be careful, sweetie, Sandy tells her. I get up from the table and grab a bottle of cold water. I press it against my forehead as I listen to her whisper to Sandy. Explore her sexuality? With a man? I slam the door of the fridge and practically collide with my brother when I turn around. I'm leaving, I say to him. I slam the bottle of water on the counter and start to walk away, but he grabs my elbow. Why are you acting like such an asshole? He whispers. I'm not. I yank my elbow from him and look over at the table. She's showing Sandy something on her phone. And she's fucking smiling. The first time she smiled since she got here last night. Oh, he's cute, Sandy says. This gets Jake's interest. He turns towards his wife, a scowl on his face. Who's cute? Your husband? My husband is way beyond cute. But Vivi's boyfriend here is pretty handsome. Jake stalks over to the table and grabs the phone. I follow and look over his shoulder. Some guy with a bald head and a muscle shirt, grinning like an idiot at the camera. Jake snorts and hands the phone back. He looks gay if you ask me, I say. I get a chuckle out of my brother and a scowl from Sandy. He's probably using you as his beard. No one asked you, and he's not gay, Vivi says, studying the picture. He's not gay, right, Sandy? He's not my boyfriend, though. I'm not looking for that. Yeah, Vivi is the hit-it-and-quit-it type. I try to say it as a joke, but the words are bitter on my tongue. She finally puts the phone down and turns her eyes back on me. About fucking time, too. Only people I like call me Vivi. You can call me Vivienne. Or better yet, don't call me at all. Don't speak to me. She stands up out of her chair and points her finger at my chest again. And if I want to hit it and quit it, she put the term in air quotes, I will. You don't get a vote. 
and you sure as hell don't control me or my body. Got it? I take a step closer to her, thinking she would step back, but she doesn't. She stands her ground and looks me in the eye. What body? You look like a fifth grader. It's not true. Her frame is small, but her body is curvy, and her breasts are round. And right now, with the angry glint in her eyes, her breath is coming fast, causing her chest to rise and fall. Just one more little step, and her nipples would be pressed against me. And you don't control my speech. I will call you whatever I want. Her eyes darken at the same time her cheeks pinken. Something in my belly stirs. I swear to God, she hisses. If you say one more word to me, you're going to regret it. Whatever's going on in my belly has traveled down to my cock, which has suddenly sprung to life. Because I refused to back down, I lean closer to her ear. One more word. I watch, fascinated as her entire face turns red. She slams her hand down on the table, but before she can speak, Jake interjects. Okay, that's enough. Luke, I'm telling you to shut the fuck up. And Vivi, ignore him. Yes, Luke. Leave her alone. Sandy has her arms around that viper again. She's looking at me, and for the first time in a long time, she's pissed at me. This is another reason to avoid marriage. The in-laws, she says. She walks away from me, not even looking in my direction when she makes that statement. Jake laughs at that. I'll clean up here, and then I have to get to the bakery. She grabs two plates and walks over to the sink. Luke will clean up. Why don't you go get ready? Sandy says. You can drive my Toyota for the time being. D, that car hasn't been driven in months. Let me do some work on it first. Luke can drive Vivi this morning. What? We both say at once. I nearly drop the plate I'm rinsing in the sink. They want her inside my car, filling it with her musky scent. No way. He'll leave me on the side of the road. Not a bad idea, Smurfette. Let's go. I rub my hands together as I give her my most evil grin. She starts to walk towards me again, but Sandy comes between us. I'll drive you, Vivi. Give me ten minutes. Sandy puts her arm across her shoulders as they walk down the hallway. Even in the big sweater she's wearing, I can still see the shape of her ass. You're like a little boy at the playground. You might as well just pull her hair and get it over with. Once she's inside the bedroom and I can no longer see her ass, I turn to face my brother. What did you say? You catch more flies with honey, he says. You sound like the creator. I load the dishwasher and start to wipe down the counter. Stop talking like an old person. He doesn't respond. He leans against the wall and watches me. I'm not interested in her. She's a bitch. He walks over and slaps me upside the head. Don't call her that asshole. If anyone here's been a bitch, it's you. Why are you still here if she bothers you so much? What? I can't be here? You're my brother. She's only a cousin. The reason sounds stupid even in my own ears, but I don't take back my words. I don't know what kind of sick foreplay you two are having, and I don't care. You're both adults. But if you upset my wife in any way, I'm going to kick your ass. That's the only warning you're getting. Why would I upset Dee? She loves me. Jake sighs as he looks at me. <sighs> She's protective of her cousin. If you upset Viv, you upset D. If you upset my wife, you and I are going to have problems. I don't say another word. I should leave. I should walk out of this house and go home. But I hate being in the house alone. I could go to Troy's and hang out there for the day. But I don't make a move. Instead, I focus on cleaning the already immaculate countertop while Jake drinks another cup of coffee. His eyes are practically burning a hole in my back but I don't bother to look at him. I finally turn around when Sandy and Vivienne return. She goes into the closet and grabs an ugly black coat, covering her body. I'll be back a little later, Sandy says to Jake. I'm going to a body conditioning class after I drop off Vivi. He grabs her and squeezes her ass. I don't know how this can get any more perfect. She giggles at his words and they kiss. I catch Vivienne watching them, a wistful smile on her lips. Be careful driving. Call me when you're on your way. I'll have a bath ready for you. Only if you promise to join me. When have I not? He slaps her on the ass again. You love me, she says to him. More than anything. Chapter 5 Vivian 
Is this his car? I ask, eyeing the sleek BMW as I slide inside Sandy's Escalade, a Christmas gift given to her by Jake on their first Christmas as man and wife. It's silver with pink rims. Typical entitled rich boy car. Why is he here all the time? Shouldn't he be at his mansion? I don't know how you tolerate him, Sandy. I'll tell you one thing. If that jerk says one more thing to me, he's going to get a slap across that ugly face of his. I've already had one father who tried to control everything. I'll be damned if I'm going to let some stranger talk shit to me. I finally snap the seatbelt in place and take a deep breath. Luke's not a jerk. He's just lonely. Just like I thought. No one outside his own family can stand to be around his insufferable ass. Doesn't he have any friends? I'm not sure what happened, but he's been through something in the past couple of years. He spends all his time with family, but he's a sweetheart. He's like a big, lovable baby. I let out a loud snort. Whatever happened, he deserved it. When Sandy opens her mouth to defend him, I cut her off. You know what? I'm not going to spend any more time talking about him. I've never met a ruder person in my life. We don't speak any more about Luke during the drive to the bakery. Instead, we talk about my plans for the semester and graduate schools, whether I should work for a couple of years or enroll in the MBA program right away. You should definitely apply. Your grades are good, so I think you have a good chance. You can always defer if you want to work first. Sandy says to me as she pulls into the back of the bakery. We walk in through the back door, the smell of cinnamon and sugar causing my stomach to growl. Aunt Gab is in the kitchen, frosting a huge cake. But the minute she sees us, she rushes over and takes me into a hug. We're the same height, and I look more like her than I do my own mother. We could easily pass for mother and daughter, and I've spent most of my life wishing she was my mom. She reacted just as I expected when I showed up at her house yesterday evening, unlike my own mother, who stood by in silence as my father put me out of the only place I've ever called home. Your father is jerk. You are adult now, so you can stay with me. She talks fast, telling me she will clear out a bedroom for me and how she will get Chris in trouble to go to my parents' house and get my things. Who's trouble? I ask, confused. That's what Mama calls Jake. She thought he was trouble when he first started coming around. Do you still think he's trouble, Auntie? I ask. He is good boy. Did he take that box? All the stuff trouble likes. You can have some too. Sandy kisses her mom, and she grabs a huge box. So nice of you to think of me. I have to go, but Vivi, call me when you're ready to come home. When Sandy leaves... I change into a pair of pants Tosh left for me and a long-sleeved tee with the bakery logo on it. And for the next six hours, I fill orders and help with cake tastings. Chapter 6. Luke Seven days. That's how long I've managed to stay away. When I left my brother's house last Saturday, it was with the intention of staying away. With this new fucking job, I see both brothers every day. I even crashed his weekly lunch date with Sandy. But neither one mentioned their permanent house guest or her date with Blake, the closet gay. No mention was made of Vivienne Chateau at all. No hints. No clues. Nothing. That was three days ago. Today I find out what the fuck is going on, and there's only one way for me to do that. She won't tell me anything. I know that. In fact, I'm pretty sure she will either insult or ignore me, but at the very least, I will get a clue. I just need to know what to look for. Thankfully, I have one thing going for me. Come on, buddy, I say as I reach and pull him out of the car seat. I grab the diaper bag Tracy was all too happy to pack and sling it over my shoulder. Travis kicks his legs as we make the short walk inside the bakery. Uncle Luke's going to get you some cookies, any kind you like. He claps his little hands as we approach, only to find Steve behind the counter. Hey, Steve. He turns around and we fist bump. We're the same age and have hung out before, but his idea of fun is being with a different woman every week. <laughs> Luke the nuke, he laughs, 
referencing my childhood nickname. What brings you to this side of the tracks? I promised my nephew cookies. What kind? Steve asks. Trust me, it doesn't matter. Cookie! Travis yells, point to get a sugar cookie in the case. Steve reaches in and hands it to him. Hi, Steve. The husky voice reaches my ears all the way from across the bakery. I don't turn around yet, eager to hear what she's going to say next. You want to hang out later? Come to Auntie's so we can watch those old movies from the 80s. Please. She whines the please a little bit, exaggerating the word. I picture her doing a fake pout to get her cousin to agree. Yeah, that sounds cool. I need a break from the ladies after last night. He gives me a sly grin and goes to fist bump me again. I pretend to laugh at his joke, but unfortunately for me there was only one woman on my mind. What the hell are you doing here? I guess she finally noticed me. I don't miss the shocked expression on Steve's face at the Venom and Viv's voice. But then he smiles, leans against the wall, and crosses his arms across his chest as if he's waiting for a show. I turn to face her, Travis still in my arms. All the fire goes out of her eyes when she sees Travis, who has now made a mess with the sugar cookie. He even wipes a messy hand on my clean blue shirt. Oh, my God. Come here, Travis. She walks over to me and, without so much of a look, holds her hands out to Travis. I laugh when he ignores her and hides his face in the crook of my neck, cookie crumbs from his mouth falling on my shirt. Kids can sense evil, I say to her. She looks from him to me. He finally removes his face from my neck and continues to devour the cookie. Undeterred, Viv goes behind the counter and grabs another cookie. This time a black and white. She comes back and extends her hand to him. When the little traitor sees the cookie, he practically jumps out of my arms and into hers. With a smug look of victory, she steals my nephew and walks to the back of the bakery. This seems very familiar, Steve says. What? I ask. Never mind, ma'am. The door opens and a group of older women walk in. Steve busies himself with them, leaving me standing in the middle of the bakery. With the diaper bag still slung over my shoulder, I walk to the back of the bakery to find my nephew. I'm led to him by loud squeals of laughter. I walk into one of the cake-tasting rooms to find Vivienne, Travis, and her aunt. Travis is on his feet while Gabrielle claps and sings a song in her native tongue. Travis claps along while he dances and squeals. When the song ends, he runs and hugs Vivi's legs, and she picks him up. Little trouble, Gabrielle says, noticing me for the first time. You here for cake? I brought Travis for cookies, but I wouldn't mind some cake. She looks from me to Vivi and nods her head. I don't think that's why you're here, but I get you and Travis real food. You eat cake after, she says, her Haitian accent thicker than normal. She scoops Travis from Vivi, orders me to sit down, and orders Vivi to follow her. I sit at one of the tables in the small room. It's sparsely decorated with cream-colored walls. There are photos of various cakes along the wall and a small floral arrangement on the table. Despite the smell of sugar and baked goods, I can smell her musky fragrance in the room. She comes back a few minutes later, her lips pursed and brows furrowed, clearly irritated. She's carrying a huge tray, and I automatically stand up to take it out of her hands, laying it on the table. I was perfectly capable of doing that. I carried it all the way down the hall. I don't need a big barbarian oaf to help me. The words are clipped, and her tone cold enough to chill this room. My apologies for having manners. I take my seat. My aunt asked me to bring you this food. She leans closer and whispers in my ear. Choke on it. The words don't bother me, but I will my body to calm down at her closeness. I ignore her words at the sight and smell before me. Vivi's aunt is the best cook I've ever met, and I've had this before. I take every opportunity to tag along with Jake and Sandy whenever they go to her house for any reason. I forget my manners as I grab the fork and fill my mouth with red beans, rice, and stewed chicken. She pulls something out of her apron and slams it down on the table next to me. I groan in delight when I see the cola champagne on the table. I open it and take a large gulp, already telling myself I have to work out extra hard in the morning to make up for this decadent meal. She leans against the door and watches me eat, her arms crossed, hiding her breasts from my eyes. Why are you here? she asks, her voice just as hostile as it was when I first got here. I brought Travis here for cookies. He loves them. I shove more food in my mouth, my manners out the window. 
and somebody actually let you take him. Offended by her question, I look up at her, and her eyes shoot fire. What is that supposed to mean? I watch him and his siblings all the time. I'm his godfather, I say proudly. They finally baptized Tristan the same day they baptized Travis, both Jake and I serving as godfather. Your aunt was there. She even made a cake for the occasion. I finished the last of my meal, washing it down with the rest of my soda. Where is Travis, by the way? I ask as I look around. She has the nerve to scoff at me. <laughs> Such a good babysitter, aren't you? My aunt is feeding him. I still don't believe he's your nephew. He's too cute and sweet to be related to you. You're an ogre. Whatever. He looks like his dad, who happens to look like me. I lean back in my seat and rub my full belly, happy I made the trip despite her bad attitude. She mutters something that sounds like, don't you wish, and waves her hand at me. And you're gross. You eat like a barbarian after a day of pillaging and killing. I think you're thinking about the Vikings. By the way, I say, rising from my seat. How was your date with the gay guy the other week? Something flashes in her eyes, but it's gone before I can read it. None of your business, she says, her tone flat. Must not have been that good since I heard you ask your cousin to hang out tonight. I take a step closer to her. There's nowhere for her to go because her dainty little back is already against the wall. He's not gay. I can guarantee you that. And I happen to be liked by my cousin. I guess you wouldn't know what it's like to have family like you. A smirk follows that smart-ass comment. By the way, you can take your dirty dishes to the kitchen. I'm not one of the many servants who work in your mansion, rich boy. Don't say that to me. I warn her as I turn my back and walk back to the table. She's not the first person to judge me because of my family. But it's not those words that have angered me. It's the bullshit she says about Blake that fuels my anger. She knows Blake is not gay. How? I shake my head and cringe, unwilling to entertain how she would know. I don't even want to consider why that's so upsetting to me. I look at her, and she's not my type. She looks like a deranged gypsy with her hair all over her head, her eyes shooting fire at me for no reason. I've never had a problem getting a woman to warm up to me, but this one is like a damn glacier. Because I feel like a cornered animal, I strike. My family likes me. Didn't your dad kick you out? I regret the words the minute I see the hurt look in her eyes. In an instant, her eyes fill with tears, and I can already count the many ways Jake will kick my ass when Vivi runs to Sandy to complain about me. I approach her again, but she walks away and stands on the other side of the wall. She wipes at her eyes, but she refuses to look at me. I'm sorry. I had no business saying that. She finally turns to face me, and I can see more tears have pooled in the rims of her eyes, but they refuse to spill. You don't. You don't know anything about me, and you never will. The fire is back, and I'm slightly relieved. Get your dirty dishes and get out. Just as I'm about to offer another apology, her aunt walks back inside with a happy Travis walking next to her, a cookie in each hand. He has a big appetite. He ate food and still has room for sweets. She looks around the room and sees my empty plate. He's big eater like little trouble. Vivi, take the plate away. Vivi's nostrils flare at her aunt's orders, but her angry glare is only directed at me. Yes, auntie, she says, smiling at her aunt. But before she does, she approaches Travis, gets on her knees, hugs him and kisses the top of his head three times. When she gets up, Travis runs to me. Look, yucky yuk, cookies, he screams as he takes a bite from each. I catch Vivi's smile as she takes the tray with the dirty dishes and walks out without a word. I watch until the door closes behind her and turn back to find Mrs. E looking at me. She shakes her head. What is it with the men in your family? I shrug, pretending I don't know what she's talking about. You like the food? She asks, thankfully changing the subject. It was delicious. Can I have the recipe? I'd like to make it. I don't have recipe. I cook from here. She taps her temple and then her heart. Can you show me? I like to cook. She looks at me, gauging to see if I'm serious. Tomorrow. The bakery will close early. Come to my house at four o'clock. After hugging her goodbye, she hugs and kisses Travis and tells me to stop by the counter, that Steve will give me a box of goodies to take home. On the way to the lobby, I stop in the bathroom to change Travis, 
and a few minutes later I'm carrying a clean and giggling toddler. I tickle him under his ribs, and he throws his head back and laughs. All of a sudden, he hugs me and puts his head in the crook of my neck. Tired, buddy? Uncle Luke's going to take you home, okay? Two out of three, I hear Steve yell at Vivi, who's jumping up and down, clapping her hands. Nope. We're watching Terminator 2. We watched Die Hard last time and you're cooking. And I changed my mind. I want fettuccine alfredo with shrimp. She sticks her tongue out at him, and he gives her the middle finger. This is for you, ma'am, Steve says as I approach, pointing to a large box. Carry it to his car for him, Vivi. I'm going to change up and we can go, Steve says. I expect her to argue or tell me to go fuck myself, but she comes close and ruffles Travis's hair. Instead of taking the box, she grabs Travis's hand and kisses it. She tries to reach for him, but he holds on tighter to me. She crinkles her nose and pouts at the rejection. He's sleepy. He gets clingy when he's tired, I say, trying to lessen the sting. But instead of smiling at me as she did to Travis, she just grabs the box and orders me to follow her. As I admire her ass, I realize she's not wearing a jacket. And when I unlock my car door, I catch a glimpse of her T-shirt. Down with the patriarchy is written in pink letters across her chest. I ignore her as I secure Travis into his car seat. Once that's done, I take the box from her and put it in the front seat. Instead of walking away, she opens the back door and sticks her head in the car, her tight ass sticking out and close enough to touch. Travis laughs at whatever she's doing, but all I can do is stare at her ass. Her t-shirt rides up, revealing the flawless skin of her lower back. She has a black beauty mark, and I almost reach over to stroke it. But I remember myself and stuff both hands in my pockets. She finally finishes with Travis and steps away from the car. I take off my hoodie and offer it to her. You look cold. I point to the goosebumps along her arm. I'm fine. I don't want your stench on me, rich boy. Okay, suffragette, I say, pointing at her shirt. Patriarchy thanks you for serving lunch and bringing this box to my car. She opens her mouth to speak, but shuts it. Her cheeks turn pink, and she spins on her heels and walks back towards the bakery. As she walks, she sticks up her hand and gives me the middle finger. As if I'd ever fuck you, I shout at her retreating back. I don't put my dick in hostile environments. I claim victory for this round when she doesn't respond. Chapter 7 Vivi I've only seen him twice in the two weeks since he showed up at the bakery. I avoid him as much as possible. He's everywhere. When he's here, I hide in my room as much as I can. But his smell lingers in the hallway or the bathroom we share. That's the worst part. He wakes up earlier than I do, and I end up smelling him for the entire day. Even now, I hear him grunting. Both guys are grunting, but he's the loudest as they use the home gym. With Sandy at her hot yoga class, I'm left here alone with them, but not for long. I throw on a sweater and jeans and search the closet for a pair of sneakers. Despite not being needed at the bakery for another few hours, I'm going now. The last time I was here when they were working out, he walked upstairs with nothing on but a pair of gym shorts. Sweat was glistening off his body, and I could do nothing but stare as he drank from his water bottle. From the fit of his clothes, I knew he was in good shape, but I didn't expect the wide chest, chiseled abs, and muscular arms. I'm cursing myself because I haven't been able to get that scene out of my head since that day. I see it all the time. Hell, I saw it the night I went out with Blake, and when he kissed me, all I could see was Lucas Clark. My mind played so many tricks on me that night, I could have sworn I smelled him, too. Since then, I've stayed away. It was bad enough when he showed up at the bakery with a baby in his arms. I tried to put him down, but I could tell that Travis adored him, and that the feeling was mutual but I refuse to believe he's not the spoiled, self-centered, rich jerk I met a couple of years ago. The jerk who nearly ran me over in the parking lot and who tortured me with Zeus. The same jerk who laughed at me at Jake and Sandy's wedding. We were supposed to be paired together to walk down the aisle. While at the church for the rehearsal, I was on my way once again to try and extend an olive branch, 
and to apologize for the parking lot incident. As I approached him, he walked away and whispered something to Jake. Luke then went and talked to the wedding planner, and I was told I was being paired with Steve. I never told anyone, but the rejection hurt, and I've never forgotten about it. Another person rejecting me, this one without even taking the opportunity to get to know me first. I shake the memory out of my head. It doesn't matter. I'm surrounded by people who love me. My extended family adore me. It doesn't matter if Lucas Clark hates me. I tie my sneakers and put on my coat. I stuff some books and my laptop in my backpack so I can study for finals before I start work. I'm walking down the hall towards the door when my nemesis comes walking up the hallway. Just like last time, he's shirtless, drinking from his bottle of water. He has his AirPods in his ears and doesn't notice me. I try to go around him, but he bumps into me, forcing me into the wall. Oh, shit. He finally notices me. Oh, it's just you. He continues to walk away, not bothering to offer an apology. Jackass! I yell at his retreating back. I find a sharpie in my jacket pocket and throw it at him. It hits him in the middle of his back. He turns his angry green eyes on me and is standing in front of me in three long strides. What's your problem? He fumes. You! You're my problem. Watch where you're going, oaf. Oh, what? He asks, getting in my face. What are you going to do, pipsqueak? Get out of my face. I poke my finger in his chest, but he doesn't move. So I place both palms on his damp flesh and push as hard as I can, all to no avail. You're all talk. Why are you always here? You live in a mansion. Go home. This is my brother's house, so you go home. Oh, that's right. You can't. You don't have a home. You better play nice before I get him to kick you out. I can feel the threat of tears, but I blink hard, not allowing them to pool in my eyes. It's Sandy's house, too, and she would never put me out. He just shrugs at me. Is it? My grandparents gave Jake this house years before he met Sandy. The house is his. The patriarchy is alive and well here. Not believing a word he's saying, I decide to call his bluff. I'll be sure to tell Sandy and Jake how you feel. I see the uncertainty in his eyes when he hears my words. He takes a step closer, causing me to step back, and I falter. He grabs me by the shoulders before I could fall. You're bitchier than normal. His voice is low, and there's a bit of mischief in his eyes. What's the matter? Do you have your period? He asks. I gasp at his audacity. I try to push him away again, but it's like trying to push a mountain with my bare hands. Excuse me? Your period. You know what that is, don't you? When a girl becomes a woman, her body... I pinch his taut skin to get his attention. His only reaction is the hardening of his nipples. Are you trying to mansplain a period to me? Since you're just standing there with your mouth hanging open, I figured you needed some edification. You do know what edification means, don't you? Just because I didn't go to some rich boy prep school or a private university, you think I'm stupid? I ask, getting angrier with each word. Not just because of that. I have plenty of other reasons to question your intelligence. Do you want to hear them? He smirks and shrugs. Get out of my face or you'll never be able to father children. In fact, I think I'll be doing the world a favor. I bend my knee, prepared to hit him as hard as I can in his balls. When he grabs me from behind my kneecap, I falter, but he holds me up pushing my back all the way to the wall, rendering me completely immobile. He presses his body against mine, and his smell completely takes over my senses. What are you going to do, Smurfette? Looks like a man's got you completely at his mercy. The patriarchy has you, ready to bend you to its will. He presses his entire body into mine, his naked chest against my sweater. 
The fact that he's holding my leg up makes it look like we're about to ravish each other against the wall. My breathing increases, and I can feel the color in my cheeks. He adjusts his hips, and I, for a brief second, I feel his hard dick press against my hip. He moves away from me so fast, I think I might have hallucinated it. Almost. Let me go, I say, my voice measured. He abruptly drops my leg and moves away from me. It takes me a minute to get my breathing under control, zip my coat, and jog down the stairs. I hate you, I shout as I slam the door behind me. Chapter 8 Luke I knock on my dad's office door and poke my head inside. He's on the phone, but he gestures for me to come inside. Jake walks in right behind me, nodding his head in acknowledgement as he stands against the wall across from me. To what do I owe this honor, creator? I ask when he finally hangs up the phone. Did you call me up here to tell me you're giving me Jake's job? I can finally put my finance degree to good use. Oh, I bet I know. You're going to give me access to my trust fund now instead of making me wait until I'm 25. We're going to make our deal public knowledge? I ask, winking at him. Dad clears his throat and straightens his tie before standing up. He walks to the front of his desk and leans on it, his long legs splayed out in front of him. Nothing like that, son. Listen, you know how we need a new receptionist. Yeah, I have a couple of interviews lined up for next week. I have it under control, creator. Chillax. I walk over to him and playfully tap him on the shoulder before going back to my seat. Well, he says, good news. We've hired someone. You can spend your time doing other things. I look to my brother, who's looking me straight in the eye. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There's only one reason why he would be here while Dad delivers this news. Who did you hire? I ask my dad, but my eyes are on Jake. Just say it. Vivienne, he tells me. I stand from my chair so fast it almost tips over. She starts the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. That's in less than two weeks. Unbelievable. I see how things work around here. If that's all, I'll go back to the basement. I straighten my chair and turn my back on my brother and father. Jesus, Luke, you're not in the damn basement. There is no basement, Jake yells. Son, wait. Hold on, Luke. Jake says, running across the room and grabbing me by the elbow. I look at him as I yank my arm from his grasp, not even bothering to hide my anger. She hasn't been able to find a job, and she needs one. I'm only trying to help my wife's cousin. Fine. So why isn't she reporting to you? She's not qualified to do anything in my department. Great. When did you two have this discussion behind my back? You know what? I don't even want to know. Thanks for going behind my back and filling a position in my department with someone who hates me without so much of a word to me. Come on, Luke, she doesn't hate you. She's in a bind, Jake runs a hand through his hair, clearly frustrated by this discussion. She told me she hates me, and even if she doesn't, I hate her. My son doesn't have it in him to hate anybody, Dad says. Thanks for telling me how I feel, Creator. Listen, it's your company, you two are the bosses, but you always told us how your three boys were going to run the company together after you retire. And I can see that's true for Jake and Troy, but you stick me in the basement. I have a degree in finance, I remind him. And you would never do this to your golden boys. You'd never go behind their backs like this. But I get no respect around here. And Jake, I have no problem with you helping your wife's family, but leave me out of it. Imagine if I did that to you. You'd shit a brick. But no matter how old I am, I'm still the baby brother who gets told what's going to happen by everyone. You hired her. Fine. Without another word, I walk out, slamming the door behind me. Motherfucker! I yell as I step into my office and slam the door behind me, not giving a fuck if I startle the three people who work in the basement. It might not technically be a basement, but it's in an isolated part of the building. If I had any liquor, I'd be pouring a glass despite the fact that it's only ten on a Tuesday morning. I knew the rest of this week was going to be shit the minute I opened my eyes this morning. I did what I set out to do after that day I had her pinned against the wall. I've stayed away. In fact, that was the last time I was in Jake's house. It's too much. She's too much. She's too close. 
Her smell is everywhere in that house. After feeling her body against mine, I went right for the guest bathroom to rub one out. I dropped my shorts the minute I walked in the door, but instead of lying on the bed to take care of business, I went into the adjoining bathroom. Like a sick pervert, I took one of her dirty t-shirts and put it on my face while I jerked off. Her smell took over my senses, and I came with her name on my lips in minutes. After that, I left. I didn't even shower. I went straight home and haven't returned since. I've also stayed away from the bakery, but I've been to Gabrielle's house twice for cooking lessons. Thankfully, it was only the two of us. How the hell am I supposed to have her here every day? Not just in the building, but here with me, talking to me and asking me questions. Who am I kidding? She won't even talk to me. She hates me. Those were the last words she said to me when she stormed out of the house that day. Fucking shrew. She can hate me all she wants, but she's going to know who her boss is the minute she steps foot in here in two weeks. I have about twelve days until I see her. I grab my iPhone and scroll through some names. I might not want to date, but who says I can't hook up? I send a text to some girl, Zoe. She lives in the neighborhood, and I ran into her when I was at the grocery store last week. Maybe drinks can lead to something else. While I wait for her to respond, I do two things. I look at job listings where I can put my finance degree to use, and I complete my graduate school application. My phone buzzes two hours later with a reply to my invitation to drinks. I lean back in my leather chair. The two hours I spent working on my grad school application has done nothing to tame my anger towards my father and brother. As I'm scrolling through more job postings, I hear a soft knock on my door and Troy pokes his head in before I can tell him to come in. It's Testosterone Talk Tuesday. Testosterone Talk Tuesday, or Tea Talk, is something I started when I started working here. The four of us have lunch together every Tuesday. No women allowed. You ready? We can go to that Chinese place you like. I almost roll my eyes at him. They never want to go to that place. I'm going to pass today. You three go ahead. I've lost my appetite. Hoping he would take the hint and leave, I pick up my phone and text Zoe a time and place to meet later. But instead of leaving, Troy walks in and closes the door behind him. Dad and Jake told me what happened. He crosses his arms over his chest, waiting for me to speak. Of course they did. Look, I don't want to talk about it. It's done and I can't change it. Maybe we can talk about it over lunch. I drop my head on the desk, making a loud thud. Just said I don't want to talk about it. I say softly as if I'm speaking to Travis. For the record, I agree with you. I think they should have at least talked to you about it first. But Dad didn't stick you here to punish you. Jake and I have worked here since we were kids. At his words, I stand up and grab my jacket. Yeah, I get it. I'm the lazy third child. Look, I gotta go. I'm meeting a friend for lunch. Without giving him time to respond, I walk out of my office, leaving him standing there. Just as expected. Dad and Jake are waiting in the lobby while Troy does their bidding. I walk out the front door without a word to either of them. Chapter 9 Luke What you got in there, Lukey? My mother asks as she tries to look inside my pan. She lifts the lids and inhales. It smells good. Just some stewed chicken to go with our Thanksgiving feast. I'm also making rice, so no counting carbs today, Mom. Well, the part about making the rice is a lie, but they don't need to know that. As many times as Sandy's mom has shown me, my rice always comes out soggy. She told me I need more lessons, so she made some for me today, which I picked up at her house first thing this morning. Want one, Mom? Sandy? I ask as I mix myself rum and coke. Mom nods, but Sandy tells me no. Mom already made turkey. Why did you make chicken of all things? Jake asks. Feel free not to eat it. I shoot back. Jake only smirks, but my rebuke apparently gets Sandy's attention. What's going on with you two? You've been sniping at each other all day. Sandy looks from me to my brother. Neither of us is willing to tell her the reason for our rift, so we both stay quiet. So, D, what's for dessert? I ask, attempting to change the subject. Luckily, it works. A little bit of everything. After dinner, I'm going to set up the dessert table. I've been baking for days. 
We clink our glasses together, hers filled with water and mine filled with enough rum to tame my annoyance. And don't forget, you're invited to my mother's for dessert, too. Well, she says it's for dessert, but she'll try to feed you a full meal. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I take a large sip and loudly crunch on the ice in my drink. I'm meeting a friend later for a movie. I don't think I'll be able to make it. I finish my drink and turn my back on her, busying myself with stirring my chicken. Okay, Sandy says, sounding disappointed. You can always bring your friend. Yeah, maybe, I say. The only friend I'll be spending the night with is Netflix. I'll take one of those drinks, Luke, Jake says to me. I ignore him and focus on the food I have on the stove. Instead of taking the hint and going to watch football with Dad, he walks over and fixes his own drink with my special rum, given to me by his mother-in-law. I bite my tongue to refrain from pointing out his hypocrisy. You know you're acting like a child, he says, standing shoulder to shoulder with me. And you're being selfish. Our parents raised you to have empathy. If you think that's what I'm mad about, you're delusional. You went behind my back. You'd shit a brick if I did that to you, and you know it. Our father walks into the kitchen before Jake has a chance to respond to my accusation. Why am I out here watching football by myself? He pours himself a drink with my rum. Anyone heard from Troy? They're late, and so are J.D. and Alex. Dad walks over and puts his arm across Sandy's shoulder. Where are those girly drinks you usually make? I wouldn't mind one. He picks up Sandy's clear drink and smells it. What the hell is this? Water? Dad sets it down with more force than necessary. Listen, Clarks, we are not about to have some lame-ass Thanksgiving. We've come too far as a family. Sandy, make the drinks. Jake and Luke, get your asses out here and watch football with me. That's an order. Yes, sir, Sandy says, jumping off her stool. I've been going back and forth with Tosh. She's trying to convince me to go shopping with her tonight. But you're right, father-in-law. I haven't been doing my part. That comment from Sandy gets Jake away from me. His brows furrow as he walks over to her. He reaches over her head and grabs the bottle of tequila she was reaching for. Tonight? He plants a kiss on the side of her neck. Are you sure that's a good idea, baby? You know Tosh is going to be drinking. Can't you two shop online? I roll my eyes so hard I end up snorting into my rum and coke. He gives me an angry look and I fight the urge to give him the finger. It's not the same as going to the store together. It's about the experience. Don't you know anything, Jacob? I think it's a great idea, Sandy, I say, only to piss off my brother. If I had a good woman, I wouldn't want her going shopping tonight with all the lunatics looking for a good deal. See? Luke gets it, Sandy says while she smiles at me. I give my brother my best smug smile while he shoots daggers at me with his eyes. He starts to approach me, probably to punch me in the arm, but I'm saved when Troy and his family walk through the door. About time, son, the creator says. Tristan runs right to Jake, not caring that he was talking privately with Sandy. Emma is crying and runs right to my mother. I grab Travis from Tracy and notice that Troy is carrying an infant car seat with an actual infant in it. What the hell? Sandy, add extra tequila and make one for Troy, Dad says, rubbing his hands on his face. Come on, Lil, Emma says, tears streaming down her face. Can I stay here until he leaves? He says he can take me back, but I don't want to go. She wraps her arms around my mother's waist and buries her face in my mom's stomach. Mom looks up at Troy and Tracy, concern written all over her face. Tracy takes a seat and puts both hands over her face. Who says, sweetheart? Mom says, and she's not getting answers from the adults. My real dad? What did we say about that? Troy is your real dad, Emma. You know you can stay here for as long as you want. No one is going to take you away, Mom says gently, stroking Emma's red locks. My biological dad, she sniffs. Will someone tell us what the hell is going on, Jake finally says. The baby in the car seat starts to cry, and Troy takes out a tiny little human wearing a pink coat. Kids, go to the TV room and put on some cartoons. Tristan, leave Uncle Jake alone for a minute and take your little brother. Take Emma too, okay? Troy says. Tristan reluctantly leaves Jake's side. Mom takes the kids out of the room and comes back minutes later. Explain why my granddaughter is so upset. Mom crosses her arms and looks directly at Troy, waiting for an answer. Hey, Clarks! Before we can get any explanation, 
Jake's best friend and honorary Clark brother J.D. walks through the door, carrying his almost one-year-old daughter, Addison, while holding on to his wife's hand. When Addison sees us, she reaches over for her mother, who takes her from J.D. J.D. kisses my mom and hands her a bouquet of flowers. Next, he kisses Tracy and attempts to kiss Sandy, but my brother playfully blocks him. Why is he so somber in here? Normally the old man is putting a drink in my hand the minute I cross the threshold. Grab yourself a beer, J.D., the creator says to J.D. He looks over at J.D.'s wife, who is now taking the coat off the baby. Alex, help yourself to whatever you want. You two are right on time because we're still waiting on an explanation from my son and Tracy. You two, Dad says, pointing at Troy and Tracy. Start talking. My brother happened, Tracy begins. He showed up at our house two hours ago with a new baby. Even though he and Beth couldn't or wouldn't take care of Emma, they weren't responsible enough to prevent another pregnancy. I had no idea I had another niece. He shows up drunk, and the baby wasn't even in a car seat. We've been running around trying to find a store that's open today. Troy had to install the car seat at a Target parking lot. And my brother scared the shit out of Emma, told her he was taking her back if she didn't hug him. Tracy slams her hand on the counter. I hate him. She puts her face in both hands and starts to sob. That son of a bitch, my mother says. The baby starts to cry and Troy rocks her. He walks over to where Tracy is sitting and rubs her back. We'll deal with it, Trey. Sit here and I'll go get her freshened up. Sandy, Alex, can you stay with her? Sandy nods at Troy. J.D., come with me. I need your help with something. The two leave the room, leaving the rest of us to endure the awkward silence after Tracy's speech. I look around the room and catch Jake's eye. He shrugs as he mouths, What the fuck? at me. Jake walks over to Alex, gives her a kiss, and holds out his hands to Addison, who happily goes to my brother. She loves her Uncle Jake he says, kissing her temple. How can he do this again? Tracy asks no one in particular. All the shit he made us go through before he signed over his rights to Emma. Do you know we had to pay him off? At least Beth did the right thing and relinquished her rights. But my brother is an opportunist. Our family was complete, I thought. It's so hard, Sandy, Tracy says, grabbing Sandy's hand. Emma is smart, but she's behind. And I think it's because Beth drank and did who knows what else when she was pregnant with her. Travis is great, but his speech is delayed. We were going to start potty training him, and I was thinking of going back to school, at least part-time. But now I have a one-month-old again. I'm so selfish because I don't want to do this, but I can't let her live with my brother and Beth. They think they have a free pass to keep having children, and they have no intention of raising. She removes her hand from Sandy's and rubs her face. For the first time in my life, I feel like I need a drink. She looks around the room, her eyes landing on my rum. Um, let me get you some water instead, I say as I run to the fridge. Tracy, that doesn't make you selfish. It makes you human. You're still in shock, but it will be okay, Sandy says. You're allowed to have your feelings, Tracy, Alex says. There is no wrong or right way to feel. This was dropped on your lap today. Give yourself a break. The girls are right, Tracy. We're here to help you. You should get full-time help. You run yourself ragged trying to do everything, and part-time nanny just won't cut it now. Hire someone full-time. I'm here to help, and so is the rest of the family, my mother says. But you're right about one thing. You can't let that beautiful little baby go live with that man. You'll never forgive yourself. I know. I'll help you search for a full-time nanny, my mother offers. You don't have to. I know you just tolerate me around here, Lil. Or should I say Mrs. Clark? Tracy says, bitterness lacing her words, reminding the entire room that my mother has only recently been civil to Tracy. My mother throws her hands up in frustration. Jake looks around the room. I think I'll go see what Troy and J.D. are talking about. You want to come, old man? Dad whispers something in my mom's ear before following Jake out of the kitchen. Sandy finally speaks up. That's unfair, Tracy. She's offering to help, and whatever happened in the past, she loves Emma like her own. I'm sorry. I'm just so angry at James. What's the baby's name? I finally ask. Rosalind Grace, but she goes by Rosie, Tracy says. She's named after my mother. 
She smiles slightly. The doorbell rings and I jog to the front of the house, relieved to be away from that heavy conversation. When I open the door, the last person I expect to see is Vivienne, as she holds a huge box with the bakery logo. When she sees me, the change in her posture tells me she wasn't expecting me to open the door. She holds out the box to me, but I don't take it. I take her in instead. I haven't seen her in weeks. She looks the same, but her cheeks are pink, probably from the chilly fall air. Her hair is still a wild mess of wavy locks, desperately in need of moisture and a brush. She's wearing that same ugly black coat she put on the last time I saw her. The last time I had her pressed against the wall. The time my dick got hard and brushed against her thigh. The time I felt her breasts on my bare chest. Happy Thanksgiving, she says, her voice filled with fake cheer. She's still holding the box, but I merely step aside to let her in. She walks in and looks around the entryway. Welcome to my mansion, I say. A flash of anger darkens her eyes, making them almost black, but she reins it in. I hear I'm going to be your boss. Do you still want to topple the patriarchy now that I got you a job? Are you done? She hisses. Maybe having her work for me will have its perks. You feel powerful, little man? I'm about to tell her I know for a fact she knows I'm not little. But the sounds of running stop me. Yee-yee, Travis yells, clearly remembering her from the bakery. Yunky yook He comes over and I swing him into my arms. What's in the box? Tristan asks, looking at Vivi. Hey, Vivi, Sandy says, walking into the foyer. I didn't know you were coming over. She takes her cousin into a hug. I'm just delivering cookies Auntie made for the kids. I'm going back to her place now to help prepare for dinner. No way. We prepped everything last night. I know Vivienne wants to protest, but Sandy grabs her hand and pulls her into the kitchen. Once my mother sees her, she'll be lucky to get out of here in two hours. Chapter 10 Vivi The last thing I wanted to do was come here. I tried to talk my aunt out of it by telling her Sandy's in charge of desserts. I tried to bribe Steve to make the delivery for me, but he wasn't interested. I prayed their housekeeper would answer the door, and all I'd have to do was hand her the box and flee. But instead, I got the worst-case scenario. He opened the door, wearing a blue New England Patriots fitted long-sleeved tee. Why couldn't he wear a jersey instead? And it should be illegal for him to wear blue. The fact that his shirt was covered by an apron with two turkeys saying gobble gobble didn't detract from how good he looked. But then he opened his sexy as sin mouth and spewed out nothing but ugliness. Sandy, I tell her as she unbuttons my coat. I try to hold the lapels together, but Sandy's always been strong. She pulls them away, and I'm coatless. This is a family thing. I won't intrude. I try to grab my coat from her hand, but she's quick. Within seconds, she's hung it in the coat closet. Your family. She puts her arm around me and steers me to the massive kitchen. Mrs. Clark is leaning over Tracy, speaking close to her ear. When she sees me, her eyes light up, and she walks over and hugs me. I tell her I'm on my way out, but she shakes her head and tells Sandy to hand me a drink. Before I know it, I'm sitting in the kitchen drinking margaritas with Mrs. Clark. You're just adorable. I'm going to ask J.D. if there are any new residents at the hospital he can fix you up with. J.D. is here? I ask. He sure is. I close my eyes at the sound of Luke's voice. With his wife and daughter. Are you going to embarrass yourself again? It should be fun to watch. I close my eyes and slowly exhale. He never forgets anything. Two years ago, I was interested in J.D., he made it clear he wasn't, and I let it go. He's since gotten married and had a child. No one else but that asshole even remembers. I'm seeing someone, Mrs. Clark. I lie. Sandy looks at me and gives me a knowing look. I turn back to Luke, hating the smirk on his face. Obviously, I'm too much woman for J.D. I wanted a fling, not marriage and children. I visibly shudder at the thought. 
He snorts as his eyes narrow at me. That's a nice thing to say to your married cousin and my mother, and you're not too much of anything for anybody, Thumbelina. He whispers the last part. No offense taken. I didn't want to get married at that age either. Even when I met your father, I wasn't interested in him. But he was persistent. You know what I mean, Sandy. Mom winks at Sandy. Like I said, I'm seeing someone, but it's not serious. I narrow my eyes on Luke and discreetly give him the middle finger. Oh, Blake? He asks. He still needs a beard? I ignore him and sip my drink. Sandy, Tracy, help me set the table. Lukey, honey, bring the food out and put it on the table and set the kids' table. Vivi, you sit down and relax. If you need anything, my baby will get it for you. She walks over and kisses Luke on the cheek, and he rubs the back of his head. If I didn't know any better, I'd think he was embarrassed by the display. If he's embarrassed, then he's a bigger fool than I thought. He doesn't know how good he has it to have a mother who adores him like that. I need some water, Lukey, I taunt him. His cheeks turn red, and I can't help but take pleasure in his discomfort. I'm sure there's water at your aunt's house. Go drink some there. He turns his back to me as he lifts a pot off the stove and puts the contents in a serving dish. The muscles in his shoulders flex as he works, and his ass looks incredible in his jeans. Listen, I don't want to be here either, I say to him. And yet, here you are, in my house, with my family on Thanksgiving. I'll have to deal with you soon enough. Did you have to ruin today, too? His back is still to me, so I can't see his face as he spews that particular load of hate. I stand up from my chair, irritated at myself for letting his words get to me. You think you're the first person who didn't want me around? You're not. And I didn't ask anyone in your family for a job. Your brother came to me about it. And I realize he probably only did it to make Sandy happy, but I need a job. I don't have rich parents or a trust fund or parents who care, for that matter. I'll go up and make an excuse to your mom and Sandy. Enjoy your holiday. I put my half-empty glass on the counter and walk out of the kitchen. I walk around the first floor until I hear Sandy's voice. I follow it into a dining room, beautiful enough to be on the cover of Architectural Digest. The table is long and covered with fall floral arrangements. I count 16 chairs as Tracy starts to set the table. Alex walks into the room, looking beautiful with her daughter in her arms. She smiles at me, and I smile back as I stand at the door to watch the scene before me. Lillian Clark and her daughters-in-law, preparing for Thanksgiving. Across the space is a TV room where kids are laughing and playing. This is a happy family home. Apart from the summers I spent with my aunt, Tosh, and Sandy, I've never experienced anything close to a happy family. I have a mother who has always been detached and uninterested, and a father whose only interest in me was controlling my every move. Luke Clark is right. I don't belong here. I clear my throat to get their attention. Thanks for the drink, Mrs. Clark, but I'm going to go. I'll see you all later tonight at Aunt Gabrielle's house. I don't give them time to respond. I turn and leave the room, in search of the coat closet, but I nearly trip over Travis. Yee yee! He screams. Dance! He grabs my hand and takes me to the TV room, where the kids are watching trolls. The older kids are dancing to Can't Stop the Feeling. Travis starts to jump and stomp and orders me to dance again. Chapter 11 Luke Fuck! I say to myself. I grab a bottle of water and stick it in my pocket. I pick up my serving dish with a stewed chicken and walk towards the dining room. I drop it on the table and walk back out, looking for Vivienne. It doesn't take me long to find her. She's in the room with the kids, barely taller than Emma, in the middle, dancing to some song. Travis tries to copy her moves and I can't help but laugh as he tries to shake his little butt. 
Yuke! Travis yells when he sees me. He runs over and grabs my hand, pulling me into the room. Dance! Yeah, dance, Uncle Luke, Tristan says, and he starts gyrating. Let me show you how it's done, I say, stepping into the room and doing my best Justin Timberlake moves. As I start to dance, I slap the water bottle in Vivi's hand and her face is stunned. The kids all follow me around the room, copying my moves. I notice she's just standing against the wall, watching me as she drinks her water. When the song ends, I take a dramatic bow, and the kids all clap. Dance, Travis says, pointing at the TV when another song starts to play. Sorry, Munchkins, but Uncle Luke has got to help serve dinner. Lukey, there you are, my mom says as she walks into the TV room. We can eat soon, but I need help with the kids' table. And Vivi, eat with us, and then you can go help your aunt. J.D.'s here, and we're going to see if there are any handsome single doctors he can introduce you to. That's a good idea, Mom, I say with a laugh. Maybe J.D. knows a good shrink. Do they still do lobotomies? As if my mom didn't hear my insult, she links her arm through Vivi's and grabs my hand, leading us back to the dining room. No more talk of you leaving, Vivi. You two get to work. Like she did before, she kisses my cheek and leaves the room, leaving me alone with Vivienne Chateau. She happens to be looking right at me, the usual fight seemingly gone out of her. She doesn't say a word. She grabs the tablecloth covered with turkeys and spreads it on the table. I grab the plates and place them on the table. You know, she says, I assumed your staff would be doing this. We let them have today off. We just leave everything a mess for them to clean tomorrow, you know? We want to make sure we get our money's worth after giving them the day off. I say it as directly as possible. She purses her lips as she looks at me, probably trying to determine if I'm telling the truth. If that's what she wants to believe about our family, fine. But the truth is, my mom does all the cooking for most of the holidays. In fact, my parents have employed the same people my entire life. Most of my brother's lives, too. They've paid the college education of the housekeeper's daughter, but I refuse to tell this judgmental shrew any of that. She'll probably find a way to twist it and turn it into something ugly. I ignore her as I finish setting the big table. Finally, I say as I take off my apron. Is the meeting of the minds over? I ask of my brothers, J.D. and Dad, as they come back to the kitchen. Just in time to eat while the rest of us did all the work. J.D. spots Alex and Addison and goes right to them, taking them both in his arms. He kisses Alex's lips tenderly, but when he reaches for Addison... She pushes his hands away and hugs Alex. Mama, Addison screams, much to Alex's delight. I'm always outnumbered at home, J.D. says, reaching over and tickling Addison. It's the best. Sorry, Luke, Troy says, smiling at the scene. It's been a messed up day. The baby he's holding starts to cry. He hands her to me, then starts to make a bottle. Hey, guys, Sandy says as she walks back into the kitchen. Tracy, Alex, and Vivi behind her. We're about ready to eat. Everything okay? She says, looking at Troy. Everything's great, Sandy, Tracy says. We're only trying to find a urologist to take my brother so he can get a vasectomy before he slithers out of town. Just your typical Thanksgiving for my family. Her eyes fill with tears, which she angrily wipes away. You all don't know how lucky you are. Sandy, you have a mother and sister who adore you. Every time you get irritated because you or Jake have to work at the bakery, I think about what I'd do to even have a mother to annoy me. The Clarks were so perfect until I came along and messed everything up. And now my brother is fucking everything up. Troy puts a hand on her shoulder, which she angrily pushes away. Your mother was right about me, Troy. What the hell do I know about family other than how to mess it all up? She pushes Troy out of the way and runs out of the room while everybody stands, stunned. I'll go talk to her. Troy says as he hands Vivi the bottle of formula. Um, why don't we all have drinks and appetizers until Troy and Tracy come back, my father suggests. He leads the way and everyone follows. Vivi walks towards me, the bottle in her hand. She doesn't say a word, but she takes the baby from me and follows the family to the buffet table. I keep my eyes on her as I inhale the appetizers Mom made. For a shrew who doesn't want a family... She's good with the baby. Alex takes a seat right next to Vivi, and Addison reaches over to examine the baby. Baby, Addison says right before she starts babbling. 
Alex bounces Addison on her knees while Vivian feeds Rosie. Once Rosie is sound asleep on her shoulder, our eyes catch. Her clear brown eyes on my green ones. For once, there's no animosity there, just uncertainty. She breaks the gaze before I have time to analyze it further. She looks over my shoulder and I turn around to see Troy holding hands with Tracy. Her cheeks are red and she refuses to look at anyone. Excuse me, she says, her voice small and her head hanging. I want to apologize for the scene I made earlier. She sniffs and rubs her nose with the tissue. No need to apologize, my father says, throwing an arm across her shoulders. We're a family. We will help you. And Tracy, what your brother does is not a reflection on you. He's an adult who makes his own choices. Let's have dinner. Chapter 12 Vivi My stomach growls at the sight of the food spread out on the table, having missed most of the appetizers since I was feeding the baby. Despite the fancy table setting, the Clark's Thanksgiving is very informal. Everyone serves themselves at the buffet and takes a seat at the table. The scene with Tracy is forgotten, as everyone laughs and talks at once. Luke and his mom help the kids, and I grab a plate. Just as I begin to examine the buffet spread out before me, the doorbell rings. I'll get it, Mr. Clark says. Maybe it's John, and he got away from Terry's brother and his family. As long as he left them at home, Jake says. Sandy giggles at him, but he's not smiling at her. You giggle, but if one of her nephews even looks at you... They're going to meet my fist. He didn't know I was engaged to you, she says. I tune out the conversation and focus on the feast in front of me. My stomach growls again, and I'm thankful for the loud chatter drowning out the sounds of my hunger. I hit the jackpot when I find my favorite part of the turkey, the wing. I put it on my plate, along with a few pieces of turkey breast and sides. By the time I fill my plate and walk back to my chair, Mr. Clark comes back with a long-legged blonde woman following behind him. There he is, my dear, he says, gesturing for her to step inside the dining room. I know immediately who she is here for. She looks just like the girls he surrounded himself with at Jake and Sandy's wedding. I see Luke's eyes bug out of his head when he notices he has a guest, but he quickly wipes his mouth and stands from his chair. Zoe, he says, I wasn't expecting you. When she runs over and hugs herself to him, he seems taken aback by the gesture, and his arms hang awkwardly at his side. I just thought I'd surprise you. She pats the tip of his nose with her index finger before planting a chaste kiss, leaving her red lipstick on his lips. Oh, well, uh he stammers. His eyes find mine, and I don't miss the color on his cheeks. Everyone, this is Zoe. I'm Luke's girlfriend, she announces, before seating herself. I drop my wing back on my plate, completely losing my appetite. Oh, really? Jake says, amused. Well, we're not labeling anything, Luke says, while looking directly at me. I break the stare and look down at my plate. He sits down, and Zoe grabs his arm. Feel free to join us for dinner, dear, Mrs. Clark says. Luke's face turns even redder at his mother's invitation. Zoe doesn't need to be asked twice, because she's out of her chair and at the buffet in seconds. Make sure you try some of the chicken and the rice, Zoe, Troy yells, his playful eyes looking at his brother. That's Luke's specialty. Luke mouths something to Troy, and both brothers laugh at him, causing him to turn even angrier. Wipe the lipstick from your lips, lover boy, Troy whispers. He practically scrubs his lips raw with his napkin. Even the tips of his ears have turned red now. Satisfied at his reaction, I get my appetite back and resume eating. Zully returns, claiming her seat next to Luke. This smells so good, Luke. I had no idea you could cook, she says. 
Maybe you should cook for her one day, Luke, I find myself saying. His head snaps in my direction. I was expecting to find anger, and I'm surprised when I don't. His green eyes are soft, but I'm unwilling to think about it further and look away. So, how did you and my brother meet? Troy asks. Luke gives him the death glare, and I snort into my stuffing. We ran into each other a while back, and he called me out of the blue about two weeks ago. You two make a really cute couple, I say. I know, Zoe says. She takes a huge bite of the chicken and rice and moans too loudly and inappropriately for a family dinner. This is delicious, Lukey. She leans over and kisses him on the cheek, leaving more lipstick on him. Everyone at the table chuckles, but I roll my eyes. Sorry, she says, wiping the lipstick with her thumb. This red lipstick gets on everything. I don't know why you asked me to wear it. He tells you what lipstick to wear? Are you kidding me? I ask, as I take a bite of the food Luke made. The chicken is good, though not as good as Aunt Gabrielle's. I taste his rice, and I know immediately that he did not cook it, but I decide not to call him out at the table. I can't help but notice the way his eyes stay on my mouth as I chew. Well, he asked nicely. Remember how nicely you asked, Lukey? She says, wiggling her eyebrows. I drop my fork back on my plate, the clinking sound filling the room. I'm throwing away all my red lipstick the minute I get home. I thought I said it under my breath, but half the table snickers, and Luke's gaze turns icy. He raises his hand and plants his mammoth paw on top of Zoe's hand, all while holding my gaze. I lose my appetite all over again. Well, Vivi, Luke says, not everyone can pull off red lipstick. Chapter 13 Luke I lean against the wall and take in the scene in front of me. This is not customary. At least I don't think it is, since I've only worked here a month and this is the first new hire. I haven't seen her since that uncomfortable Thanksgiving. She didn't even finish the mountain of food on her plate. I watched as she picked at it, glancing at me and Zoe every few seconds before making an excuse and fleeing the house. As soon as she left, my hand left Zoe's. After we ate, I told Zoe two lies. The first was that we had to go visit a sick relative in the hospital, and how I'd love for her to come, but would hate to get her sick. The second was that I'd call her later. When the rest of the family started to leave, I lied to Jake and Sandy and told them I would meet them at Mrs. Yetian's house. Half an hour later, I texted Jake and told him I wasn't feeling well. As planned, I spent the rest of Thanksgiving in my room, watching Netflix while eating the damn good cheesecake that Sandy made. As much physical distance as I put between us, Vivienne never left my thoughts for a second. Now she's walked in with Sandy, Tosh, and Gabrielle behind her as if she's royalty and they are her ladies-in-waiting. Even though she must go through human resources for the first two hours of the day, she goes behind the receptionist's desk and talks with Colleen, the person who will train her. Why someone needs to be trained to answer the phones and transfer calls is beyond me. But whatever. I don't make the rules. I was ordered to be here, so here I am. Jake walks over and stands beside me, both hands in his pockets as he looks on. I ignore him and focus on the group of women who are hugging and kissing each other. It's raining outside today. She's wearing a red coat that makes her look like Little Red Riding Hood, with a giant hood covering her head. Colleen points to a small closet, and she proceeds to take it off. My breath leaves my body. I'm used to seeing her in those T-shirts. Hell, I can handle seeing her in her tight Wonder Woman T-shirts, which barely contain her perky boobs. But I'm not prepared for this. She's in a white button-down and a blue blazer with matching pants. She seems taller, too. Her hair is still wild, but... Only the back is in loose, wavy tresses. The top is in an intricate braid, 
making it almost look like a crown on top of her head. But it's her lips that draw my eye. They are a deep red against her pale skin, like ripe cherries begging to be bitten. I shake the thought out of my head when I hear loud giggles. The four of them form a group hug as her aunt kisses her face over and over again. Then she breaks out of the group hug, bends down to put her purse in a drawer, her blazer lifting and showing off her plump little ass. I know I need to look away, but I can't. And I don't. When she stands up, she turns around and our eyes lock. Everything and everyone else fades away, and it's just us. Neither one of us smiles at the other. I can see her freckles from here, just a smattering across the bridge of her nose. Her brown eyes look nervous, tentative, but I can see the excitement in them, too. She breaks our eye contact and focuses on something Tosh is saying. I clear my throat, and, needing something else to focus on, I turn to my brother, who is smirking at me like he's just discovered a big secret. God, have you ever seen such a spoiled, coddled person in your life? I point towards them as they do another group hug. Yeah, I'm looking at him, Jake says. Whatever. This is why I'm not speaking to your ass, I remind him. You just made my point. Look, Luke, I admit we should have talked to you about it first, but she's in a tough spot. You and I will never understand because our parents support us no matter what. She doesn't have that. I scoff at him and point at the three women fussing over her. That's different. They love her, but they aren't her parents. They can try to make up for it, but it'll never be the same. Be kind. That's all I ask. It's hard to be kind to someone who hates you, I say back. She does not hate you. She does. She told me so, I say, sounding like a child to my own ears. You two are so blind. She hates you about as much as you hate her. I don't absorb Jake's words. I choose to ignore him and focus on the scene still unfolding. When my dad walks through the front door, she immediately runs to him, and he wraps her in a hug. I always knew she was small, but seeing her against my dad's large frame reveals how tiny she really is. Dad greets the Etiennes, and Mrs. Etienne points to a large box on the desk. Vivi picks it up and, like a new kid on their first day at a new school, offers it to my dad. He reaches in and pulls out a pastry. He nods at me and Jake as he walks to the elevator. Colleen runs to the mail room, which is situated behind the reception desk, and the four employees come out to greet Vivienne and take a pastry. Sandy finally sees the two of us standing against the wall. She grabs a cinnamon roll for Jake. He takes it from her but not before he kisses her right in the middle of the hallway at work. I've missed you. I haven't seen you in about a half an hour, he says. She hooks her arm through his, but she speaks to me. You haven't been by much, Luke. We've missed you. Come for dinner tonight. I nod, but I know I'll think of an excuse not to show up, despite loving her cooking. Are you going to keep me company at work today, gorgeous? Jake says. On my day off? No way. She takes her arm from around his and sticks both hands in his pockets. Oh, wife, all you had to do was ask, he jokes. She playfully punches him in the arm. I'm looking for your car keys. Tosh picked us up and now she has to drop Mama off before she goes to work. I guess we didn't think that one through. I'll come back and pick you and Vivi up later. I don't think so. You're stuck here. Stay and the four of us will go for a celebratory lunch and I'll take you home afterward. She pretends to be put upon, but she gives in when he wraps her in his arms. I shake my head at them, but for a moment I wonder what it would be like to have a relationship like they have. Nothing but unconditional love and acceptance. I'm surrounded by it. Between my parents, brothers, and their wives, I see it every day. The one time I thought I found it, she went behind my back and did the unforgivable. I'm so lost in thought I don't see Vivi approaching me until it's too late for me to flee. She gives me an uncertain smile and nods towards the box, offering me something. The smell of sugar hits my nostrils and my stomach growls, but I resist. No thanks, I ate breakfast. I see the disappointment in her eyes, and I hear Jake's words about kindness, 
but I ignore them both. All too soon, my rejection is forgotten. Tosh and Gabrielle hug her again before they say goodbye and walk out the door. Vivi, you can put those in the kitchen, Jake says, pointing at the box. Luke will show you around and take you to HR. Sandy and I will take you to lunch to celebrate. You in, Luke? He looks at me, waiting for my answer, probably wanting me to say yes. I'd love to, I say, but I'm meeting Zoe for lunch. Vivi looks up as if surprised by my words. Jake sighs in exasperation, and Sandy frowns. Just bring her, Sandy says. The eye roll Vivienne unleashes doesn't go unnoticed by me. I'd love to, but she invited me to her place for lunch. So we just can't get enough. I choose to ignore Vivienne's snort and Sandy's shocked face. Vivienne, I'll show you around before you head up to HR. Chapter 14 Vivi. As great as lunch with Sandy and Jake was, the downside was that I could not drink. Right now, I'd really like some liquid courage as I approach Luke's door. I stand up straight, square my shoulders, and knock with a confidence I do not feel. Without waiting for him to tell me to come in, I push the door open. He's sitting behind his desk. I'm relieved he's not wearing blue today but he looks as good in gray as he does in blue. He was texting, and as soon as he sees me, he sets the phone down. I approach his desk, my heart in my throat. He's not making this easy on me. He doesn't say a word. Instead, his eyes bore into me. I glance around his small office. Unlike Jake's office, Luke's office is void of any personal items. Listen, Luke... I begin, after clearing my throat. Mr. Clark, he says. What? Call me Mr. Clark. I'm your boss. As if I needed to be reminded. Everyone here calls you Luke. I haven't heard anyone call you Mr. Clark at all. You're not everyone. I close my eyes and count to ten, wishing I could just walk out of his office. But I need a job. Despite him, my first day here has been great. Colleen has shown me what I need to know in reception, and Juan is showing me around the mail room. Okay, Mr. Clark, I say, patting myself on the back for the lack of sarcasm. I'd like to offer you a truce. I know you hate me, and you don't want me here, but I didn't set out to get a job at your family's company. However, it's a great opportunity, and I already love it. Can we start over, please? He stares at me, and I don't flinch from his stare. In fact, I don't look away. The blood pounds in my ears as he continues to look into my eyes. His eyes finally leave mine and make their way to my lips. He looks back into my eyes, and his gaze softens. He even smiles. The moment is broken by the loud ringing of my phone. Shit, I mutter, as I take it out of the pocket of my blazer. In my haste to shut off the ringer, the phone slips from my fingers and lands on the carpeted floor by his feet. He picks it up and hands it to me as Blake's name flashes across the screen. I reject the call, shut off the ringer, and slide the phone back into my pocket. The hostility I now see in his eyes makes me think, I imagined the softness in his features just mere seconds ago. I never said I hated you. You're the one who hates me. I almost ask him what he's talking about, but I remember my words just a minute ago. Well, don't you? I ask, frustrated by his response. He leans back in the chair and looks at me from head to toe. No, I don't. Why would I waste my time hating someone who doesn't matter? Someone so insignificant. I consider the source of the words, but they still get under my skin. Insignificant, I ask. That sounds pretty hateful to me. He stands up from his chair, his large frame nearly filling the small space. I don't care enough about you to hate you, Vivian. Why would I spend my energy hating you? You were given a job you're not qualified for, and you report to me. I have all the power here. 
If you want to hate me, go ahead. Your hatred of me is as irrelevant as you are. He walks right past me, towards his door. He opens it, but turns back to me, his hand holding onto the doorknob. In case you haven't noticed, this is a place of work. Shut off your damn cell phone. You and your gay boyfriend can talk on your own time, not on mine. He slams the door behind him, leaving me standing in the middle of his office, stunned by this turn of events. Chapter 15 Vivi Are you sure you're okay, sweetie? You hardly ate anything, Sandy says. Thankfully, my back is turned to her as I wipe down the counter. I'm fine. It's been a long day, so just tired. I hate lying to my cousin, but I won't be the one to tell her that her husband's brother is an asshole. Even though I know his words shouldn't matter to me, they still hurt. I know I've played a role in our combative relationship, but the way he cut me down when I went in waving a white flag won't leave my thoughts. Sandy, I was thinking that work is only about three miles away. I can walk, you know. The exercise can't hurt. I can feel her eyes burning a hole in my back, but I refuse to turn and look at her. You've done so much for me already. I don't want to have to take your car, too. She walks to the kitchen counter and leans against it, giving me no choice but to look at her. Vivi, stop. You're my family. You're my cousin. But you're more like a little sister to me. I'm not going to let you walk six miles a day to and from work when there's a car sitting in the garage, okay? You're the one doing me a favor. I'm too stubborn to get rid of the car. It's the first new car I bought and paid off on my own, so it's sentimental. If you're using it, Jake can't nag me about getting rid of it. What's this really about? She takes me into her arms and holds me to her. I don't want to be a burden. She reaches up and gently strokes my hair. You can never, ever be a burden. I love you. The tears pool in my eyes and slide down my cheeks. I don't know how you could. I manage to croak out. She removes her hand from her hair and grabs my face with both hands. Because we're family. Because you are beautiful on the inside and out. Because I see who you are. And I love everything about you. You're strong, Vivi. You're fierce. Because, despite your shitty parents, you're an amazing woman. You have a lot of people who love you. The tears flow freely at her words. And I wrap my arms around her. She cradles my head and holds me until the tears stop. I don't know what I'd ever do without you, Tosh, and Auntie, and even Steve. You'll always have us. She kisses my cheek and steps away. Her words helped, but being called insignificant is still heavy on my mind. As I load and start the dishwasher, I hear the front door open, followed by a loud knock. Knock, knock. He closes the door and runs up the stairs. The dogs come running to him, jumping, barking, and licking him. He plays with them while I wipe down the table, my back to him. Hey, Luke, Sandy says, happy to see him. You missed dinner, but we have lots of leftovers in the fridge if you're hungry. You can bring Zoe next time if you want. I wasn't with her tonight. I can tell he's walking further into the kitchen, closer to me. The dogs follow him, Lady barking with excitement the entire time. I just came by to see how everyone was. He's standing across from me now. I can feel his eyes on me, but I refuse to acknowledge him. Sandy, I'm going to get to bed early. Have a good night. I rinse out the sponge, leave it in the sink, and walk to my room without even so much as a glance in his direction. After a shower, I pull my Kindle out of my purse and throw it on the bed. Eager to continue the book I started last night, I throw on a T-shirt and grab my bottle of lotion. During the school semester, I do nothing but read school textbooks. But during my breaks, I give in to my guilty secret pleasure of erotic novels. Just as I'm lathering lotion to my legs, there's a loud knock on my door. 
Assuming it's Sandy, I tell her to come in. My hand drops from my thigh, and I instinctively pull my shirt down, which only comes to mid-thigh. I can feel my face flush as Luke stares at my bare legs. He swallows as his eyes travel up my body, finally landing on my face. I refuse to make eye contact. I look past his head at the door as I wait for him to speak. Hey, he says. He shuffles his feet around and rubs the back of his neck. When I don't respond, he clears his throat. I, uh... I want to apologize for what I said in my office earlier. You came in with good intentions, and I was a jerk. I'm sorry, Vivian. I finally look at his face, and he looks at me in the eyes while he speaks. So lost in his green irises, I don't respond. He clears his throat again and breaks our stare. I didn't notice before, but he has a backpack. He takes it off his back, opens it, and pulls out a flat box. Just a little peace offering. He hands me a box of chocolates. I make no move to take it from him, but I quickly scan the box. It's expensive. Seventy pieces of Godiva chocolates. When I don't take the box, he clears his throat again and then drops the box on my bed. I'm sorry for what I said earlier in my office. If you're still interested, I'd like to take you up on that truce. He offers me his hand, but I don't take that either. I just keep staring at his face, looking him right in the eyes. No, you're not. You're not sorry. It's not the first time you've made comments about me and my family or my situation, which you know nothing about, by the way. He finally puts his hand down. You're right, and it's really none of my biz. I hold my hand up, and he stops speaking. You think you're the first person to make me feel small, unimportant? You're not. I've dealt with it my entire life. With the exception of a handful of people, I've been treated as insignificant my entire life. Listen, I... You listen. It's my turn to talk now, Mr. Clark. He visibly winces at my words. You want to put me down because of my issues with my parents? Go ahead. You want to walk in here and remind me that this is your brother's house, given to him by your grandparents. Feel free. You want to remind me that I'm so pathetic my cousin let me move in here with her husband, and not only do they feed me, but give me transportation. Or that my parents are such assholes that they won't let me pick up my clothes. So Sandy had to take me shopping so I can have something to wear to my new job? The new job given to me by the patriarchy. The job I'm not qualified for, even though my duties only include answering phones and delivering mail? You want to make me feel like shit because my parents don't give me a $70,000 car for graduating? Hell, they probably won't even bother to come to my graduation. Now you know my weaknesses, Mr. Clark. But next time you come for me, you better come with much more than that. Next time, I won't be meek. And you definitely won't like what I have to say about you. I turn my back on him, but not before seeing the shocked expression on his face. Not caring if he's still in the room, I continue applying lotion on my legs as I wait for him to leave. Only the door never opens. He walks closer and stands so close to me I can feel the heat radiating off his body. You know, Vivian, you said plenty of shit to me, too. But that's no excuse for how I treated you. I'm better than that. I don't know why I said those things. You said them because you mean them. You think I'm nothing. And I don't know why I care what he thinks, but I do. And I pray he didn't notice that my voice cracked or sense the tears threatening to fall down my cheeks. I become immobilized when he puts a hand on my shoulder. A wave of warmth shoots through my entire body. I want to shrug his hand away, but I don't. I can't. Slowly, he spins me around to face him. I don't think you're nothing. I don't think you're insignificant or irrelevant. He puts a finger underneath my chin and slowly moves my face upward. When my eyes clash with his, neither one of us can look away. When I think about you, I just can't. He stops speaking. 
It's as if he's unable to find the words. But he doesn't look away. He continues to look into my eyes. I try to move my face, but he doesn't let me. He holds my gaze and looks at me as if he's seeing me for the first time. I don't know what happened. Your phone rang and I just... He doesn't finish his sentence. He lowers his face slowly. Then he raises it again, asking me with his eyes. I stand still, unmoving, unblinking. He lowers his head faster this time and gently brushes his lips with mine. The kiss starts off slow, just his soft lips searching mine. I open my mouth to take a breath. In that second, everything changes. His tongue finds his way in my mouth. Unable to resist any more, I kiss him back. I wrap both arms around him, stand on my toes, and devour his mouth. He tastes of rum and mint and smells of expensive cologne. Unable to stand on my toes any longer, I surprise him by jumping into his arms, wrapping both legs around him. He moves me to the dresser, knocking some contents onto the floor, all without breaking the kiss. His hand finds its way up my shirt, cupping one breast in his large palm. I slide my hands from his hair, down across his chest and abs. I lift his shirt up and slide my hand down his pants and grab onto his thick cock. He lets out a loud groan, and I bite his bottom lip as I feel my desire coating my panties. I scoot to the edge of the dresser and pull him between my legs. He squeezes a nipple as I grind into him. He kisses my cheeks and the side of my throat, surprising me by biting and then sucking the base of my neck. His hand leaves my breast and I groan in protest. He shuts me up by slamming his mouth on mine again, as his hand travels down my stomach. He reaches the edge of my panties and pulls on the elastic. Yes, I moan. The moment his hand makes contact with my moist flesh, my phone breaks the spell. The loud ringing brings us out of our lust-filled haze, and as if we've both been burned, we quickly pull away from each other. I jump off the dresser and reach for my phone, shutting it off. Leave, I manage to croak out. Without a word, he walks out of my room, slamming the door behind him. Chapter 16 Vivi I press my ear to the door of my bedroom, anxious for Jake and Sandy to end their discussion and leave. I've been walking since I was one and driving since I was 16, Jacob. I've never had an accident. I've never even had a speeding ticket. Can you say the same? I can't see her, but I can imagine the eye she's giving her husband right about now. You're stubborn. I've known this since the night we met, but I'm not changing my mind. I'm driving you to work. I'm walking you inside, and I'm picking you up tonight. I don't hear anything for several seconds. Then I hear footsteps and the sound of a door opening. It's not the front door, but I'm hoping it's the coat closet. You don't want to know what I thought of you the first night we met— this is ridiculous. We live in Boston. It snows here. You're acting like a madman. Fine. I'm a madman who is taking his wife to and from work. It's icy, and I don't want you falling, Dee. No arguments. I hear some shuffling, followed by more footsteps. Finally, the front door opens and closes. I open my bedroom door, poke my head out, and look up and down the hall. The coast is clear of humans, but the dogs run to me and follow me into the master bedroom. I hate myself for doing this, but I have no choice. The master bedroom is huge and usually immaculate, but today the bed has been left unmade. I notice the clothes they had on last night are scattered throughout the room. I tiptoe into the walk-in closet and open one of the drawers, the one that has all of Sandy's scarves. I look through until I find one that will work with the outfit I have on, I prefer dark clothes to Sandy's favorite color, but the scarf with pink flowers will have to do for today. I curse when I see the Hermes label on it, but these are desperate times. Hopefully no one will notice, and I won't spill anything on it. As I walk out of the room, I ignore the urge to look at the messy bed, otherwise I would fix it and give myself away. Come on, guys, 
I say as the dogs follow me back to my room. I tie the scarf around my neck, hiding the bite mark Luke left. When I woke up this morning, I had convinced myself what happened last night was a nightmare, but the hickey proved otherwise. I tie the scarf a little tighter and walk out of my bedroom. After making a sandwich for lunch and a quick breakfast, I pull out of the driveway as Jake is returning from dropping Sandy off. We wave at each other, and I wonder why he drove her to work today. It can't just be because it's a little icy, but it probably is. That would be such a Jake thing to do. Last week, Sandy tripped over one of the doggy toys, and Jake almost lost his mind. He fussed at the dogs like they were kids instead of animals, and threw their toys in the garage. Then he carried Sandy to the couch and rubbed her feet for about half an hour. The three-mile drive to the office only takes a few minutes, and as I slowly walk through the icy parking lot, I think of Jake holding Sandy's hand as he walks her into work and wonder what it would be like to have someone love you so much they do these kinds of things for you just to make your life easier. Relieved to reach the warm air of the building, I put my coat away and run to the kitchen to put my lunch in the fridge. As I help myself to the free coffee and wait for my cup to brew, I have my back turned to the door. But soon heavy footsteps approach. The familiar smell of his expensive cologne gives him away. But I don't bother to face him, instead choosing to focus on stirring my beverage. My silent prayers asking that he leave the small space go unanswered. Good morning, Vivian he says, his voice tentative. Good morning, Mr. Clark, I respond. I hear a thud on one of the tables, followed by a long sigh. I was hoping we could have a do-over. Forget about the Mr. Clark stuff. I, uh, I went by the bakery this morning and got a bunch of things. Just my way of apologizing again. A peace offering, if you will. Unsure of what to say, I sip my coffee my back still turned. Turn around. When I make no move to turn, he says, Please. I take one more sip and slowly turn to face him. He looks good, but tired. His usually clean-shaven face has about a day's worth of growth on it. He rubs the back of his head with his hand as he looks at me. Look, Vivian, last night was... He stops talking when three employees walk into the kitchen. One, an older man who works in the mailroom, follows behind them. His eyes instantly light up when he sees the box. Without asking any questions, he helps himself to a donut. Hey, Vivi, he says, his Spanish accent thick. I see you came back. This one is a tyrant, he says with a mouthful. He cackles as he slaps Luke on the back. He makes himself a coffee and talks to us the entire time, not realizing, or not caring, that neither one of us has said a word back. You sure you're not Puerto Rican, Viv? My wife wants to get our son away from his girlfriend. She... That's enough, Juan. We don't want a sexual harassment suit on our hands. I'm relieved Luke interrupted him, but Juan just laughs and walks away. Come see me in my office when you go on your break, please. Luke walks away leaving me breathless. Chapter 17 Luke Be kind, be kind, be kind. Jake's words play over and over in my head. Kindness. I can do that. I can't sink any lower than messing with her self-esteem, walking into her room, jamming my tongue down her throat, feeling her up, and practically finger-fucking her. That was only after I tried to give her diabetes with that giant box of chocolates. It's only up from here. What the hell am I going to do now? I already couldn't get her out of my mind before, but now? I'm screwed. Her break started five minutes ago. She has ten minutes left before she goes back to the desk, and I wonder if she is unable to face me. Will she be like Tori and avoid me? If I know anything about Vivienne Chateau, it's that she's nothing like Tori. Approximately two minutes later, there is an aggressive knock on my door. 
She doesn't bother to wait for me to tell her to come in before she walks through my door, doing her best to look fearless. She walks in, head held high and shoulders back. She's in another pantsuit today. This one black with some sort of cream-colored shell blouse. She has a scarf tied around her neck. I'm taken aback by the scarf because she's not one for feminine accessories. You wanted to see me, Mr. Clark? Her voice is firm, confident. Luke. Luke, she says. You wanted to see me. I'd like to take you up on that truce. Look, I'm not the type of person who kicks others when they're down. I feel horrible about the things I said to you, and I want to apologize again. I hope we can start over and end this hostility between us. To be honest, Vivienne, I don't know why we're so hostile towards each other. I finish my speech and wait for her to respond. When she sinks her teeth into her bottom lip, the kiss we shared last night flashes through my mind. All I can hear are the sweet moaning sounds that filled her room less than twelve hours ago. Her soft skin was like silk against my fingertips, and I know that at this moment I would do anything to touch her again. Right. Of course. Listen, Luke, she says. When she starts to speak, I reluctantly stop looking at her mouth and look into her eyes. I want to apologize as well. We both said things, and I want to offer my own apology. And yes, I would very much like a truce. Let's just move on. She plasters a fake smile on her face and offers me her hand. I take it, and before I can talk myself out of it, I rub my thumb over the top of her hand. The fake smile leaves her face as she lets out a shuddered breath. Likely embarrassed by the noise, she tries to pull her hand away, but I hold on and take a step closer to her. You were right about what you said last night. I don't know anything about your circumstances. My parents have always supported me in everything, and I don't know what I would have done if they didn't. I don't think I'd be able to be as brave as you. You're here. Working and fighting. That's admirable. She opens her mouth to speak, but quickly closes it. She gives me a curt nod instead and tries to pry her hand from mine again. And what happened in your room last night? I didn't come in there for that. As if I have no control over my body, I take one small step forward. It's fine. Let's just forget it. It's not like it will ever happen again. She does this fake laugh, but then she catches herself and stops. She clears her throat and looks away from me. I take another step and touch the scarf around her neck. She moves her hand and tries to swap mine away, but she ends up hitting the scarf, loosening it. When I see the red mark, I understand the need for the scarf. I loosen it completely and take it off her neck. Her hand flies up to hide the mark but I gently move her hand away. She swallows, but doesn't move. I caress the side of her neck with my index finger. I can feel her pulse increase at my touch. Her breathing becomes more rapid as I rub the mark with my thumb. I see the slight tilt of her head, giving me more access to her neck. I slide my finger up the side, around her chin and over her lips. I'm sorry about a lot of the things that happened between us, but not this, I say, touching her soft skin as I close the remaining space between us with one final step. Without giving her any time to move away, I cover her mouth with mine. I expect her to push me away, but she surprises me. She jumps in my arms so unexpectedly. I take two steps back before catching my balance. She lets out a loud moan as she sticks both hands in my hair while she kisses me back. I walk back to my desk and sit in my chair, her body straddling me. Neither one of us comes up for air as we taste and tease each other. Her lips are soft but firm. She tastes of coffee with a hint of chocolate. I leave her mouth to kiss her face, neck, and collarbone. Unable to contain myself, I bite the other side of her neck, 
She lets out a little squeal, but makes no attempts to move. She does move her head, though, and kisses me again. She opens her mouth, inviting my tongue inside. She pushes my jacket and loosens my tie. When she can't seem to get the tie off, she abandons it and pulls my shirt and T-shirt from my pants. Her warm hand ends up on my abs, roaming my body. I lean back, giving her better access, warmth spreading across my body at her touch. You have an amazing body for a barbarian, she says against my mouth. It's all the killing and pillaging. Keeps me in optimal shape. Shut up, she says. Make me, I say back. And she slips her tongue in my mouth again. I pull it in and suck on it. I grab her breast over her shirt and give it a good squeeze. We both feel a vibration at the same time. It's like ice water on a fire. We stop mid-kiss and stare at each other. Reality dawns on us and she jumps off my lap. She fixes her clothes, grabs the scarf from the floor and ties it back around her neck. Without so much as a glance or a goodbye, she leaves my office, closing the door behind her. Chapter 18 Vivi It's Friday evening, and after sliding my dinner inside Sandy's dual-range oven, I practically skip to my room. The dogs follow me, but I close the door to my bedroom as soon as I enter, freezing them out. The last time I let them in while I showered, they made a mess— since Fridays are casual at the office, I take off my jeans and sweater and toss them in the hamper. As I wait for the water to heat, I put on my shower cap before stepping inside. I let the hot water relax my tense muscles, relieved to have the first week of the new job behind me. Despite the horrible first day with Luke, things have improved between us. We're not friends, but we are now cordial. I make sure to keep a professional distance— yeah, right. I guess dry humping him in his office on your second day of work was your idea of professional distance. I clear my mind of that day. No need to relive that kiss or the one that happened prior. He is my boss. And just a few days ago, he was my enemy. I need to keep this professional. And the best way to do that is to make sure I am never alone with him again. I can concede that Lucas Clark is hot— whether he's wearing a suit or jeans and a sweater, the man is one sexy beast. But there are plenty of other sexy men that I can ogle, like Blake, though he's not on the same level as Luke. Luke's taller, broader, and when he smiles, his entire face changes. Like that time he laughed when Juan put on some music and started to twerk. Or that time he practically tackled Troy in the lobby and Troy lost his balance. Troy was not amused, but Luke had to hold on to the wall to control his laughter. He looked so carefree and happy at that moment, I couldn't help but laugh, too. He must have heard me laughing because he looked my way and caught my eye. The laughter died in my throat, and I quickly averted my gaze and began to type something on the computer. I wash quickly. I scrub my skin as if I'm trying to rid thoughts of Luke from my mind. He is all wrong for me, not that I'm even looking. The last thing I want or need is a relationship. Practically everyone I know who is in a relationship is miserable. My parents, for example. A few of my friends who aren't even married, but are so afraid of being alone, put up with anything. That's not for me. I'd rather be by myself than be miserable with someone who's supposed to love me. It's fine to look, I remind myself. He's good eye candy, and I'm not blind but we could never be anything else. Even if I changed my mind and decided to try the relationship thing, he would not be the one for me. But who am I kidding? I will never be in a relationship. If I wanted that, I would be with Blake right now instead of enjoying a Friday night in solitude. I turn off the water and step out of the most luxurious shower I've ever enjoyed, only to wrap myself with a decadent towel after changing into a pair of black leggings, I dig out a black T-shirt with Wild Feminist written in bold white letters. I put my hair in a messy bun and make my way back to the kitchen. My mouth waters at the smell of the salmon I have cooking in the oven. The dogs come walking to me as soon as they see me. I'll get you guys fed soon. 
I guess I need to take you two out, don't I? I look outside, and it's gray and cold. Or maybe I can just let you two out in the yard. After pulling my food out of the oven, I turn to the dogs, who are staring at me. Fine, I'll let you two out now, so you can let me eat in peace. As I walk towards the sliding glass door leading to the backyard, I hear the front door open. I do an about face. Sandy, did you guys change your mind about going to New York? I yell. Not as far as I know, Luke says as he walks up the stairs. He's changed out of the clothes he had on earlier. Now he's in dark blue jeans and a light blue long-sleeved ribbed tee that shows off his tapered waist and wide chest. Damn. Hey, Luke, what are you doing here? I ask, trying to sound as nonchalant as possible. Jake asked me to walk the dogs for him. He whistles, and the dogs go running to him. He grabs two leashes and attaches them to their collars. I was going to take them out. I lie. He looks over my body, his eyes lingering a little too long. I can feel my cheeks blush as he looks directly at my chest. Ordinarily, I'd either grab a sweater or cross my arms and shield my boobs, but don't. I can feel my nipples pucker underneath my T-shirt. Since I'm not wearing a bra, he notices it too. But as soon as he does, he shakes his head and turns away. You can't control Zeus. He outweighs you by about 30 pounds. He pulls the dogs and starts to walk towards the stairs. I follow behind him. That doesn't matter. If I speak to him in a firm voice, he'll do as I say. I have no idea if that's true, since I've never had a dog. But I can't be the first petite person to walk a big dog. Oh, really, dog whisperer. Tell me more, oh wise one. I ignore his arrogant attitude and snatch Zeus's leash from him, pulling the dog towards me. Zeus sits down and doesn't move an inch. Zeus, come here, I command, and point directly in front of me. Zeus just stares at me, his tongue hanging out the side of his mouth. Come here, boy. I pull the leash, and this time he stands. But instead of walking, he runs to me, stands on his hind legs, and puts his front paws on my shoulder. I open my mouth to tell him to sit, but he barks and licks the side of my neck, and the sudden movement knocks me on my ass. Jesus, I hear Luke say under his breath as he pulls Zeus off me. He offers me his hand, and I take it, ignoring the jolt of electricity that my body experiences as he pulls me up. You okay? He asks. I'm fine. I need another shower now that I'm covered in dog drool. He swallows at my words. Well, you can come with me to walk them if you want. You can hold ladies' leash. A little embarrassed by what happened, I decline. It's fine. You go ahead since your brother asked you to do it. He doesn't say a word, but he looks at my body again before turning around and walking out the door with the dogs. Finally able to breathe again, I run to the bathroom and scrub my neck and face clean of Zeus's spit. I return to the kitchen and throw the leftover red beans and rice in the microwave. While the rice is warming, I toss a salad and pour myself a glass of water. Just as I'm plating my dinner, Luke and the dogs come back. He sets out food and water for them, and as they eat, I set my beautifully plated dinner on the kitchen table. I look over at him. He's leaning against the sink, watching me. Have you had dinner? I ask, hoping he'll take the hint and leave. Nope. Is all he says. He crosses his arms, his eyes going from my plate to my face. Well, I'm sure you probably have plans with Zoe. I don't. His eyes go back to my plate, and then back to my face. He tilts his head to the side, waiting for me to speak. He arches his eyebrows as he waits. I'm sure you like fancy food, and this isn't fancy. But if you want, you can have some. Before the words are out of my mouth, he's grabbing a plate and filling it. When he sits down, I see he's taken most of the remaining salmon and has a mountain of rice on his plate. He also has a small bowl, but the only thing in it 
is cucumber slices. I'm not even going to ask what you meant when you said I like fancy food, he says right before he shoves a mouthful of rice and fish into his mouth. He lets out a loud moan as he chews. Caviar, steak tartare, or whatever rich boys like yourself eat. He rolls his eyes at me, but his mouth is too full to talk. When he swallows, he says, I had that for lunch. His green eyes twinkle as he lets out a small laugh. I smile at him as we eat in silence. I'm halfway through my meal when I hear the scraping of the chair. He walks back to the kitchen and refills his plate, taking the rest of my salmon and most of the rice. When he sits at the table, he takes the cucumbers from my salad and puts them in his empty salad bowl. Um, excuse me, I was going to eat those. Not anymore, you're not, he says, as he scoops the cucumbers with his bare hands and shoves all of them in his mouth. Who raised you? I thought someone like you would have better manners. Lillian and Joshua Clark did, and they did a fine job of it. I would never do this if my parents were around. He eats the rest of the salmon in one bite and starts to eye my plate. I shield my plate with my arm and quickly finish my salmon. I think you were raised by barbarians. I look up at him. He lifts his plate from the table and puts it face level with him. He catches my eye, and without breaking eye contact, he picks up his fork and shoves the rest of the rice in his mouth. Wow, I say. It's a fork, not a shovel. He tries not to laugh, but can't help himself. His mouth is full, and pieces of food fly out and land on the table. Oh my God, you're disgusting, I say, as I push my plate away. I've lost my appetite. He quickly snatches my plate and eats the rest of my food within seconds. That was fucking fantastic, he declares, rubbing his flat stomach. I don't think I've had a bad meal in this house since Sandy moved in. He stands up and picks up our plates and walks back to the kitchen. Excuse me, but I cooked this meal. He turns his head and looks at me. He nods as if he's impressed. Well, it was delicious. Thank you for sharing. He turns his back to me again, and I watch his shirt stretch across his wide back as the muscles in his shoulders flex. I take advantage of his back being turned to ogle his ass. It fits well in his jeans and not flat like Blake's. I wonder what it would feel like to bite it. Luke surprises me when he turns the water on in the sink and washes the dishes. After he finishes, he walks over, takes my empty water glass, and washes that, too. When he's done with that, he wipes down the table. Thanks again for dinner, he says, finally looking at me again. You're welcome. He nods at me, and without saying another word, walks away and out the front door. Relieved to be alone again, I make my way to the living room, turn on the TV, and plop myself on the couch. As I channel surf, I hear the front door open again. Luke comes back up, drops an overnight bag on the floor, and sits next to me. What are we watching? He asks, as he snatches the remote from me. He puts on ESPN, and I snatch the remote back. Not that, I announce. Anyway... Don't you have plans with Zoe or with friends? I told you I didn't. Why don't you have plans with your gay boyfriend? Um, he's not my boyfriend, and he's not gay. And we have plans tomorrow. We don't have plans, but he asked to see me tomorrow. I hadn't given him an answer yet, but I will now. I'm pretty sure he's gay. Otherwise, why wouldn't he be here with you right now? I look at him surprised by his words. Be careful. That almost sounded like a compliment. I wait for him to say I'm taking his words all wrong and for him to deliver an insult, but he surprises me again. Come on, he must know you're attractive. I blush at his words. My aunt and cousins have always told me that, but they are family and aren't exactly objective. I've had boys tell me I'm pretty but I've never paid much attention to it. Luke's saying that, though, awakens my entire body. It's not something I think about. That's not important to me. And that makes you even more attractive. 
Neither one of us speaks after that. I know he's looking at me, but I have my eyes on the TV. The local news is on, predicting snow for Sunday into Monday. I know he's still staring, but I pretend to be engrossed in the forecast. I mean, your personality leaves a lot to be desired, but if you keep your mouth shut, you're attractive. You'd make a good mute. I grab one of the pink decorative pillows and throw it at his head. He catches it before it makes contact. Well, I will never be silenced. Get used to it, Lucas Clark. Vivian Chateau will not keep quiet for you or any man. I throw another pillow at him, and he catches it too, and puts both behind his back. I am woman, hear me roar. I throw another pillow at him, and he catches it. Now I have all the pillows, all part of my master plan. You're not smart enough to devise a master plan, I counter. He leans back and lets out a contented sigh, says the one with no pillows. Seriously, why aren't you out? It's a Friday night. You seem to only hang out with your brothers and Zoe. I just prefer family, and I don't hang out with Zoe that much. It sounds like there's a story there, but I don't pry. Our truce is new, and I don't want to overstep. Before I can change the subject, he speaks. What about you? Why aren't you out with girlfriends? I have a small circle, and my good friend Terry Ann is visiting family in Barbados for the winter break. She does this every year. But, like you, I prefer family. Nothing is better than being with Tosh, Sandy, and Steve. They're my circle. You should have gone with your friend. Barbados is nice. Yeah, well, that's hard when you're broke. I roll my eyes at him. Of course, he has no idea what it's like to not have money to do things. And I don't have a passport either. My parents would only go to Canada. And when my passport expired four years ago, it never got renewed. Now they won't let me into the house to get my things. Despite my aunt calling my father, he wouldn't relent. Auntie is not the type to roll over, though. She had Chris drive her to my parents' house a few days ago and demanded they give her my things. My father gave her some of my clothes, but would not give them my birth certificate or expired passport. From what Chris says, my father went on a rant and accused my aunt of stealing me away. He even went so far as to say he regretted letting them have a relationship with me, and he was coming over here to give Sandy a piece of his mind. When Tosh and Chris told us what happened, I told Sandy I would leave her house to avoid any drama. Tosh laughed and said if my father so much as looked at Sandy wrong, Jake would unleash all kinds of hell upon Ike's and Chateau. Listen, Vivi, there is nothing your father can do. You're an adult, so he can't make you go back home. He's lost all his power, and he knows it. He wants to keep your stuff? Let him. He's only doing it to hold on to his last shred of control. All of that is replaceable. Sweetie, we'll just request a copy of your birth certificate, and we can go shopping anytime you need, for anything you need. You're free, Vivi. Sandy reached across the table and held on to my hand. Thanks, Sandy. And you've done too much for me as it is. You already bought me a new wardrobe. Then I'll take you shopping, Tosh says, grabbing my other hand. Point is, you're not alone. I cried that night. But it was a cry of relief rather than sadness. I cried for that little girl who's never known the unconditional love of a mother. I cried for the girl who's been fighting against her tyrant father her entire life. I cried because I stayed three years longer than I should have. But I didn't want to be a burden to anyone else. And my father at least paid for college courses. I cried for the young woman whose mother just stood there and watched in stony silence. There were no words from her to defend me. I stuffed a few things in my bag and took the bus to my aunt's house. Like expected, she hugged me and took me in. She sent me to Sandy's house in case my father decided to come to her house looking for a fight. That night, as I laid in Sandy's guest bedroom, I cried tears of joy for having family. As awful as most of my life has been, I'm thankful for having a family full of strong women 
who help each other freely and without expectation. I made two promises to myself that night. I promised I would stop crying over things I could not control, and I promised I would pay it forward through charity work and mentorship. My reverie is interrupted when Luke speaks. Maybe you can save up and go next year, since you have a job now, he says, as if he's doing his best to understand being broke. Yeah, maybe. Hopefully, I'll have a full-time job. I do want some work experience before going to graduate school. He seems surprised by that admission, but then he tells me of his plans of getting a master's degree in finance. He even jokes about moving out of the mail room. I'm not sure how it happened, but the room gets darker. The dogs settle down in front of the couch, and a movie is suddenly on the TV. I grab a throw, which matches the pillows Luke is hoarding, and spread it across my body. I'll share the pillows if you share the throw. He lays a pillow on his side and beckons for me to come over. I slide along the couch and lay on the side of his big body, my head on the pillow, which is practically in the crook of his arm. I drape the throw against us. Troy had a huge crush on this actress when he was a kid. He says, as Sandra Bullock is driving a bus, he had posters of her, and I drew on all of them one day when he was out. I think I gave her mustaches and horns and all of them, and I colored one of her teeth black. That's the only time I remember him ever getting mad at me. Jake laughed so hard he almost pissed himself. I smile at the story and picture a little blonde Luke wreaking havoc in his brother's room. I don't have siblings, but I can sort of relate. I remember driving Sandy crazy because I always wanted to play in her makeup. What I didn't know was that it was secret makeup she kept hidden from her mother. I lean closer to him, and in the dark and warm room, I let my eyes close for a second. I don't know how long my eyes stay closed, but the sound of a ringing phone is what wakes me. The room has gotten even darker, and a different movie is on. Luke must have fallen asleep, too because he jostles awake when I roll off him and run to the kitchen for my phone. Chapter 19 Luke I swear, if that is her gay boyfriend, I will punch a hole in the wall. But my hand is saved when I hear her say Sandy's name. I straighten up the couch as I pretend not to listen to their conversation. She laughs at something. The sound of her laugh is husky like her voice, and I decide that I like how it sounds. I watch her as she speaks. Her back is to me, one hand on her hip. Her messy bun must have come loose as she slept because her hair is wild and free and hangs down her back. Today was the first day since our first kiss that she's come to the office without a scarf around her neck. During lunch on that first day, I went to the mall and bought her a bunch of scarves. I had no idea what I was doing. I grabbed a handful and handed them to the cashier. I left the Macy's bag on her desk. She tried to return them, but I insisted. I explained I was the reason why she needed a scarf, so it was my duty to provide them. She reluctantly accepted, and to my surprise, when I saw her a few hours later, she was wearing one of them instead of the one she had borrowed from Sandy. When she ends the call, she finally turns towards me. She's in nothing but black yoga pants and an oversized T-shirt. She doesn't have on a stitch of makeup. In fact, she only wears the red lipstick on occasion, and she's still the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Oblivious of her beauty, she ties her hair up on top of her head, leaving her long neck on full display, ready to be bitten and sucked. That was Sandy, she says, ignoring the electrical charge in the room. They're on their way to a late dinner. Sounds nice. Yeah, it sounds like they're having fun. This is their downtime before all the Christmas parties they're obligated to attend this month. I guess you probably have a lot, too. I do. Between work and family, I must have half a dozen Christmas parties to attend. But the only ones I'm looking forward to is the one my parents have every year, and the one Jake and Sandy are having this year. I do. Not that I'm looking forward to all of them. Well, 
I'm looking forward to the office party, and to the one Sandy's having here. I'll be at my aunt's house on Christmas Day, which usually involves work, but I love being with her. She smiles as she says it. She walks closer to me and sits on the arm of the couch before she continues to speak. I honestly don't know how your brother and Sandy juggle both families. I'm happy to be selfish and spend the day with my family. Another pro in the single column. She smiles as she says it. It's almost as if she's figured out some secret. It's part of loving someone, Vivi. I think you'd want to do those things. Sure, it's a juggling act, but making your significant other happy should make you happy, too. I've watched my parents do it my entire life. Then I watched Troy and Tracy try to juggle family, you know. Tracy could have said fuck it, but she didn't because she loves my brother. Really loving him meant she understood what family meant to him, so she always remained open, even when things were hostile. Jake and Sandy have much better relationships with their in-laws, though. I think loving someone means going out of your way to love who they love, too. Yeah, I guess, she says as she shrugs. That will never be my problem. I don't want to ever love anyone that much. I don't want to love anyone at all. It's messy and complicated. I agree with her. I've loved, and it has led to nothing but heartache and loneliness. But her words still bother me. Not always, I counter. Sure, but it happens often enough. My aunt was a widow at a young age with two kids to raise on her own. My parents hate each other. Most of my friends' parents are divorced. Most of my friends have had cheating boyfriends. To me, it's not worth the risk. But maybe your aunt experienced this amazing love for a few years. My parents are crazy about each other still. My brothers love their wives. I'm sure you can see that Sandy is happy. What about Tosh? She's been happily married to Chris for years now. All of what you said is true, but I want no part of it. Why not? Because it makes you weak. Your happiness is dependent on someone else. I want to do what I want, when I want. I want to travel the world. And you don't think you can do that with someone else? With my luck, I'll end up with someone who's afraid to fly. She lets out a loud yawn as she stretches. Oh, I think I'm going to bed. Good night. She starts to walk away when I realize I'm not ready for the evening to end. How about another movie? I suggest, eager to have her little body pressed upon mine again. Lady's choice this time. I can tell she's weighing her options. She's halfway turned towards her bedroom, but she's not moving. I'm sure we can find Aaron Brockovich on demand. Or maybe a documentary on Gloria Steinem or Susan B. Anthony. Very funny, she says. But I claim victory when she walks back to the couch. She motions for me to come join her. The notebook? Clueless, I ask. She shakes her head at me and grabs my legs. She tries to twist me around, but she's not strong enough. Lay down, she commands. And you can't complain about my choice. Once I'm lying on my side, she grabs the remote and climbs over me. Unable to get a clear view of the TV from behind me, she practically climbs on my side, her head lying on top of my armpit. She drapes the throw over us, and two minutes later we're watching The Big Lebowski. I love the dude, she says. We watch the movie, laughing the entire time. After that she puts on Shrek, but she falls asleep about halfway through. In her slumber, she moves and shifts her body into mine. She even throws an arm across my torso. She looks so unguarded and vulnerable as she sleeps. I count the freckles on the bridge of her nose and take note of her thick eyelashes. I move her wild hair out of the way, exposing her neck, the blackness of her tresses a stark contrast to her skin. Despite her beauty... She's not the type I would go for. She's short, and I always thought I was only attracted to tall, leggy women. Vivienne is unguarded and speaks her mind. Zoe only opines on makeup or reality TV shows. Tori was a lot more conservative. She had impeccable manners and always said the right thing for whatever situation we were in. Looking back, I never knew her. She was a chameleon. 
changing to suit every situation. Tori would never give someone like Vivienne the time of day. I don't know how I was so blind, but her friends at Boston College were old money, trust fund babies. I had noticed her. She was a tall blonde and hard not to notice. I didn't think I had a chance in hell, so I didn't even bother trying. It was only after we broke up that I realized why she picked me. When Vivienne lets out a loud, unladylike snore, I forget all thoughts about Tori. I turn off the TV, pull her closer, and lay my cheek on top of her head before dozing off. Chapter 20 Vivi So, I say to Sandy, as I hop on top of her kitchen island, I'm wearing a short denim skirt, and the cold counter hits my bare legs. What do you need me to do to help? Maybe I can ask to leave work a little early on Friday to help you set up? Sandy and Jake returned from New York earlier than expected to avoid being caught in the snowstorm. Thankfully, they didn't arrive until a few hours after Luke and I woke up from our second night of falling asleep together while watching movies. It was quite a sight. I was tucked into his side. My hand across his torso had found its way underneath his shirt. His hand was on my ass when I woke up, and when he turned slightly, I felt a huge bulge underneath his pants. I jumped off the sofa as if burned, making some excuse about needing to shower. By the time I walked back to the kitchen, he had walked and fed the dogs, taken his own shower, and was in the kitchen cooking breakfast. I don't know what I expected, but he cooked a delicious frittata and made me a cappuccino. We ate in silence, and when we were done, he insisted on cleaning up. He said it was his way of thanking me for dinner the night before— and for keeping him company over the weekend. I'm reluctant to admit my perception of him was wrong. Yes, he was a mean jerk to me, but I wasn't much nicer to him, either. He's definitely not the spoiled rich boy I had painted him out to be. I can hear him now. He's in the basement with Jake and Troy, working out. Tristan, Travis, and Emma are in the living room, playing a card game but they keep complaining about Travis messing up the cards. Aunt Sandy, Emma says, pulling Travis by his hand. He keeps messing up the cards. Come here, Munchkin, I say, as I pick up Travis. You want a cookie? He starts to kick his legs and clap. Cookie, cookie. You know what? Let's make some cookies. He gets excited and follows me around while I get ingredients to make sugar cookies. So, I say, turning my attention back to Sandy, who is pulling ingredients out of the fridge, what do I need to do? Nothing. I only need you to show up and have fun. It's all being handled. The housekeeper will be here Friday to clean. The caterers will be here, along with the servers later. All you need to do is enjoy yourself. Have fun? How do we do that? We both laugh, because whenever my aunt throws a party, it's all hands on deck. We're so busy working that we hardly have time to enjoy ourselves. And who are you? I tease. I'm Mrs. Clark, sweetie. We burst out laughing again as I measure flour and cut butter. I have Travis pour the flour in the mixing bowl, and he pours half of it on the counter. Before I can move him away, he swipes his hand across the spilled flour, throwing a good portion of it on the floor. He claps at his handiwork, clouds of flour everywhere. Minutes later, I hear heavy footsteps as Jake and Luke approach. Luke's bare-chested again, a sheen of sweat glistening on his skin. He's wearing a pair of black shorts that come to his knees. Jake goes right to his wife, pins her against the fridge, and kisses her as if he hasn't seen her in days. She says something to him, and he goes and brings her mixer from the pantry, what are you making, baby? He asks. Cheesecake for the office potluck tomorrow? Potluck? Luke asks. That's your Christmas party. How cheap are those doctors you work for? They actually have a party the same night as your office party, so I can't go, but we do the potluck every year, Sandy says. Yuck! Travis says, when he finally notices his uncle. He runs to him and hugs his legs. Luke lifts him up 
and kisses his cheek before hugging him. Cookies, he says, pointing at the mixing bowl. Ye ye make cookies. And Travis makes a mess, I say. Jake grabs several bottles of water and hands them to Luke. Back to our workout. D, don't lift that mixer. I'll put it back for you later. Are we still going to your sister's for dinner? The snow is only going to get worse, he says, while looking out the kitchen window. I look out the window and notice it's snowing lightly, but the forecast predicts several inches. We live in Boston, Jacob. Your truck can handle the snow, but Tosh canceled. Chris isn't feeling well, so I'll make us something. She rolls her eyes at him, and he slaps her on the ass. I turn my attention back to the mixing bowl as they start whispering to each other. As I add an egg to the mixture, Luke comes and stands beside me. He's standing so close that our bodies are touching. I freeze when I feel his warm hand on my thigh, gently stroking it, causing an immediate need for a change of panties. You want some help? He asks as his fingertips graze across my skin. Travis and I have it under control. Sandy and Jake now have their backs turned to us, Travis in Jake's arms, as they continue their quiet conversation. Luke takes that as an opportunity to put his hand on my ass. I freeze while mixing, only to have him squeeze my butt. As if it never happened, his hand is quickly gone. Emma and Tristan run into the kitchen and offer to help, but when Travis sees his brother next to the mixing bowl, he practically jumps out of Jake's arms and pushes his brother out of the way. Tristan gives up and says he's going to work out with the guys, while Emma offers to help Sandy. Are you two coming back down? Troy yells. Let's finish so I can get home. The guys return downstairs, and we continue with our baking. But I can still feel Luke's hand on my ass. Vivian, I'd like to see you in my office when you go on your break, my boss says as he passes by my desk the next morning. I haven't seen him since he inhaled half the cookies Travis and I baked yesterday. He went home, and I went to my room. Well, first I went to straighten out the bathroom we share, but he had already done it, leaving behind his smell. I spent the rest of the day reading, watching the snow fall, and trying not to think about Luke Clark. We started off as enemies, but now we have a truce. Neither one of us is looking for a relationship, never mind the fact that he's the brother of my cousin's husband, the same people I currently live with. That's the definition of complicated. It's best we keep the truce going, and when I see him in his office, I will suggest we remain work acquaintances only, Maybe he can spend more time at Troy's house. I still don't understand why he doesn't get his own place, but I refuse to stick my nose in where it doesn't belong. At exactly 10.30, when it's time for my break, Colleen takes over, and I go into Luke's office as requested. He has the door open, and I tap on it as I walk in. Close the door, please. I comply, before I walk to the front of his desk and wait for him to speak. He's clean-shaven today, and I wonder how it would feel to run my hand along his jaw. The office has a relaxed dress code for the entire month of December, and he's wearing a V-neck sweater and a pair of dark pants. It also looks like he might have gotten a haircut between the time I saw him yesterday to today. You wanted to see me? I finally ask. He clears his throat and stands up, filling the small space. On instinct, I take a step back. I wanted to apologize for yesterday. Yesterday? I feign ignorance, but I know what he's talking about. Yes, for the touching. Oh, when you stroked my thigh and squeezed my ass in my cousin's kitchen? His cheeks redden in embarrassment. Yes, that was inappropriate of me. This needs to end right now. Let's forget about it. I want to offer my own apology for past events. I clear my throat when he arches his eyebrows at me. You're with Zoe, and I'm not the type of girl who goes after another girl's man, and Blake and I are sort of a thing. 
his eyes darken at the mention of Blake's name. The embarrassment is gone, replaced with irritation. He takes a step forward, and I take three steps back, right into the wall. I'm not with Zoe that way. That way? Well, whatever way, you two have something going on. Whatever you have going on is enough where you invited her to your family's house for Thanksgiving and introduced her as your girlfriend. He opens his mouth to speak, but I hold my hand up. What I'm saying is, whatever happened between us, let's not let it happen again. You're with someone, I'm with someone, and we, I say, gesturing between the two of us, can never, ever be anything. Sandy is the only thing we have in common, so let's not forget that. We have a truce now. But until recently, we couldn't stand to be in the same room. Let's just be professional here at work and cordial when we're doing the family thing. I do a loud exhale after finishing my speech, which I'd practiced in my head ever since he asked me to come into his office. Well, that was a mouthful. Two days ago, you said you'd never be in a relationship, and now you're with Blake? His voice is low, and his lips form a thin line after he finishes his question. It sounds to me like you're running away from something. I said I'd never be in anything serious or complicated. I'm not in any danger of that with Blake. But you know what? That's my business, not yours. I'm an adult, and I don't owe you or anyone else any explanations. I reach for the door to get the hell out of his office, but his large hand slams against the door before I can open it and flee. I leave my back to him and wait for him to remove his hand so I can leave. Even though he's not touching me, my body has already reacted. I can feel the blood pounding between my ears and the color creeping up my neck. I never figured you for a coward. I turn to face him, craning my neck to look into his green eyes. Excuse me? Coward? Who the hell are you calling a coward? I poke at his chest. When he doesn't even flinch, I put both hands on his chest and try to shove him. Instead of moving, he stands there, crowding me in. Dating a guy who's safe. Coward move. Oh, and what about you and that airhead, trust fund Barbie doll you had over for Thanksgiving? Maybe that bleach she uses on her hair has seeped into her brain. At least Blake's not an idiot. Done with this conversation, I turn to leave his office. But he grabs my shoulder and spins me around in one swift move. I open my mouth to give him a stinging rebuke, but he presses his body into mine, pushing me completely against the door. When I feel his erection against my hip, I tilt my head up to look at him. He holds my gaze as he presses himself further into me. Let's get one thing straight. Zoe has never been nor will she ever be my girlfriend. I didn't invite her over for Thanksgiving. She showed up on her own. I haven't seen or spoken to her since that night. I try to open the door, but it's impossible with him holding it shut. I give up and glare at him. Let me out of here or else. Or else what? He asks, his voice husky. You're going to do what? And I disagree about Blake not being an idiot. What else would you call a man who sticks around when it's obvious you're not into him? Either he's an idiot or he's desperate. Desperate little bitch Blake. He shifts my body, and instead of feeling his erection on my thigh, it's now pressing directly against my core. I hear myself moan as I feel the heaviness of him. I involuntarily start to grind against him as he sticks his head into the side of my neck. He runs his nose across my throat, inhaling my scent. As he's pressing me into the door, he takes both of my hands, intertwines our fingers, and holds my arms over my head. I should tell him to stop, and I open my mouth to do just that. But when he starts to suck on the base of my neck, I lose all willpower. I move my neck, giving him better access. I think I hear myself say something but I'm not sure what. All I can focus on is the way he's licking and sucking on my skin. He lets go of one hand, only to grab a breast, squeezing and twisting it in his big hand. 
You drive me fucking crazy, he says against my neck, his breath like fire on my skin. I take my free hand and grab his ass, pressing him into me even more. In an instant, he's holding me in his arms and walking back to his desk. He plops me down on the desk, and his hand goes up my skirt. He tries to stick his big hand through my thick leggings, but they're too tight. I think he's about to give up, but instead he rips the fabric apart. Barbarian, I whisper. I'll show you, barbarian. He slides his hand into my drenched panties, caressing my clit with his fingers. I close my eyes and throw my head back as I open my legs wider. He sticks two fingers inside of me and continues to tease my clit with his thumb. Oh, God, I say. I grab his face and turn it towards me. I tilt my head a fraction and slowly drag the tip of my tongue across his bottom lip. He opens his mouth, and I stick my tongue inside, mingling it with his hot one. Right there on his desk, with my legs spread open, leggings ripped apart, he fingers me. I'm shameless and mule like a bitch in heat, but any sound I make is muffled by his tongue in my mouth. I stick my hand in his hair and pull as hard as I can. He responds by biting my lower lip, pulling it with his teeth. He grinds into me again, and as he grinds, I undo his belt and stick my hand in his pants, grabbing his hard cock. I felt it before, but I don't remember it being this big. It pulses in my hand, and I feel moisture at the tip. I rub my thumb across it, and because I know it will drive him crazy, I break the kiss only to slowly lick his moisture from the top of my thumb. It works. His green eyes practically turn brown, and I hear a loud sound come from the back of his throat. I let out a sigh of protest when he takes his finger from inside of me, only to watch him slowly lick my moisture. Something within me snaps after he does that, I grab his cock again and start to stroke it. My eyes land on his mouth, desperate for his kiss. I inch toward him, and he meets me halfway, sliding his tongue back where it belongs. I can hear the sounds of our lips in his small office, but neither one of us comes up for air. His moans get louder as I stroke him, and I get wetter as he continues to finger-fuck my pussy and stroke my clit. His strokes increase, and I continue to grind against his hand, looking for relief. My desire for him continues to build. He moves closer and sticks his tongue in deeper, fucking my pussy and mouth at the same time. I can feel myself about to erupt. I let out a wild moan against his mouth as I come all over his hand. His kiss intensifies as he grunts. I break the kiss, look down, and see thick ropes of his seed over my hand. I lay a gentle hand on his chest as we both attempt to bring our breathing back to normal. He moves away, grabs some tissues, and wipes my hand, leaving pieces of tissue stuck to my skin. I grab my hand out of his grasp and jump off the desk. My leggings are torn at the crotch, but can be covered by my skirt. I'm a sticky mess. I grab a handful of tissues and wipe between my legs as best as I can. I turn back towards Luke, just as he's buckling his belt. On wobbly legs, I start to walk towards the door, not ashamed of what just happened, but confused by it. Vivian, he says. I turn to face him. He's put back together. The pink in his cheeks is the only evidence of what just happened. I don't regret what just happened. Unsure of my ability to resist him, I'm relieved when he sits behind his desk. But Zoe, I begin, only to be interrupted. I'm not with Zoe. Fuck Zoe. I open my mouth to speak, but he doesn't give me the chance. And before you say his name, fuck Blake, too. Your brother is married to my cousin, Luke. Neither one of us is looking for a commitment. What just happened here is the only thing that can ever happen between us, and it can never happen again. I have to get back to work. I slip out of his office and walk back to my desk, five minutes later than I should have. Chapter 21 Luke 
The crab cake tastes like cardboard in my mouth. By now I would have eaten about ten of these, but I'm struggling to finish my second. Jake and Sandy's house is filled with family, everyone laughing and full of holiday cheer. From the outside, I look happy, light-hearted, and ready for Christmas. But on the inside, I'm a fucking disaster. She hasn't been alone with me since I finger-fucked her to orgasm in my office five days ago. When I asked her to come into my office the following day, she responded by telling me to meet her in the staff break room if I had something to say. I still met her, but it was only to give her coffee and a croissant. Two things I know she likes. Even now, from across the room, she's beautiful in a red one-shoulder top, tight black pants, and a pair of ridiculously high heels. She's talking to Tosh, but every few minutes, she searches the room looking for me. Like a magnet, each time she looks at me, our eyes collide. She's wearing one of the scarves I gave her. In fact, she's worn one every single day since the tryst in my office. This one is black, decorated with holly. She throws her head back and laughs at something Tosh says. And when her aunt walks over and puts a protective arm around Vivi, the three of them put their heads together. When a server comes by with champagne, Tosh and Vivi take a glass and receive a reproachful look from Gabrielle, but they both ignore her as they clink their glasses. Her eyes find me as she sips her drink. I grab my own glass, tip it to her, and take a slow sip. She looks away from me and starts a conversation with Steve, and I imitate her and interact with the other guests at the party. I eat and drink, but taste none of it. As the caterer starts setting up for dinner, Jake tells everyone he has an announcement. A server hands each of us a small box as we wait for my brother to speak. On instinct, I walk closer to him and Sandy and our parents as I wait for him to begin. He grabs Sandy and intertwines their fingers together. We couldn't decide if we should wait until after the holidays or now, but we're so excited we decided to share with all of you tonight. My mother lets out a squeal in anticipation. She lets go of my dad's hand and runs over to hold on to Sandy's mother's hand instead. Everything is quiet. The caterers stop working as they wait for my brother to continue. Please open your box. The sound of paper being ripped open is followed by loud shouts. Everyone has converged on our hosts and engulfed them in hugs. I open my box and take out a Christmas ornament. Baby Clark arriving next July. I knew it, my father says, shoving everyone out of the way. He hugs Sandy, lifting her off the ground. I told you, Lillian, I've known since Thanksgiving because Sandy spent the entire day drinking ice water. Tosh, did you know? Sandy's mom asks her other daughter. You didn't tell me. She whispers something to Vivi, who goes running into the kitchen. Sandy's mom pulls her away and practically shoves her onto the sofa. I want to laugh at the exasperated look on Sandy's face, but her mom is not done. She grabs her legs and props them on an ottoman. By this time, Vivi comes back with a plate filled with food and hands it to Sandy. I turn from the scene and go hug my brother, but Troy, Chris, and J.D. have beaten me to it. The three hug, and I do what I do best. I crash into them. God damn it, Luke, Troy says, but he's laughing. I push him out of the way and hug Jake. I'm going to spoil the fuck out of this kid, I announce. Take a number, young Clark, Chris says. The uncle competition is going to be fierce. Young is the operative word. You old guys are lame. Uncle Troy is going to be the favorite uncle. Sleepovers at my house whenever. Except for the nights when he'll be sleeping over at Uncle J.D.'s. I hope it's a girl so Addison can have a best friend. But if it's a boy, keep him away from my daughter when they hit puberty. I know what you Clarks are like, J.D. says. He looks over at his wife and blows her a kiss. My mother approaches and hugs my brother. Jakey, are you going to find out the gender? Jake looks over at his wife, who's pushing her mother's hand away as she tries to put food in her mouth. Jake walks over, offers Sandy his hand, and helps her off the couch and away from her mother. He puts a protective arm around her shoulder and she leans into him. He places a kiss on her forehead before he responds to my mother. Nope. You can cancel your gender reveal party plans, mother. But we're going to have one hell of a baby shower. My mother rubs her hands together as she searches the room. 
Terry, Tosh, Gabrielle, and Tracy. It's never too soon to start planning. We have time for that, Lil. We want everyone to enjoy this party, Sandy says. Sandy's mom tries to pry her away from Jake, but Jake holds on to his wife, shielding her from her mother. I spot Vivi, only to find her looking at me. She looks away as soon as my eyes meet hers, walks to Sandy and hugs her, excitedly still rubbing her still flat stomach. She even bends down and kisses Sandy's belly before hugging her again. Vivi, unlike her aunt, manages to pry Sandy away from Jake. You okay? Jake asks, nudging me with his shoulder. I know what he's asking. I look at him and, despite the happiness radiating off his body, he's eyeing me, gauging me. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm happy for you guys. I nudge him back and turn, facing the room. He doesn't say anything, but... He knows me. He's waiting for me to speak. Whenever I pictured the baby, I always pictured a boy. He would only be a little younger than Travis and a little older than your baby. The three of them would raise all kinds of hell. I finish my speech and smile sadly. I'm sorry, Luke, is all he says. He's the only one I ever told. This is what brought us back together as brothers. Me too. I really wanted that kid, Jake. He would have been so loved in this family. Yeah, he would have. When the caterers announce dinner is ready to be served, Jake slaps me on the back before leaving me to join his wife. I hang back and watch as Vivi walks down the hall into the bathroom, and as soon as she closes the door, I follow her steps. When she opens the door to come out, I push my way in and close the door, leaning against it. Excuse me, she tries to push me away. You know we can't be alone together. Because you know you won't be able to resist if I kiss you. We're not going to do any more kissing. What about finger-fucking or dick-stroking? I move away from the door and take a step closer to her. She has the grace to blush. None of that either. Well, what if I want those things? With you. She opens her mouth to speak, but I cut her off. Think about it. It's the perfect solution for us. There is no us, she says, crossing her arms. That's my point. You don't want a relationship, and neither do I. But the fact remains that we are attracted to each other. I take another step forward. I'm not attracted to you, but you are. If I kissed you right now, you'd jump in my arms and you'd let me make you come just like you did in my office. You'd let yourself go because you want me that much. I finally reach her and put my hands on her shoulders. You admitted you want to explore your sexuality. Explore with me. She takes a breath. The already small bathroom gets even smaller, and all I can hear is the sound of my own heartbeat. Are you crazy or desperate? she asks. You told me on two separate occasions that a man would have to be either crazy or desperate to get involved with me. Which one are you? I lean against the door and smile, remembering saying those exact words. I'm desperately crazy. Or crazily desperate. Whichever one makes more sense. She continues to stare at me, and I hold her stare. We don't even like each other. I can argue whether that's untrue. The fact that she watches me constantly, finding me in a room full of people, tells me her feelings for me are more than just physical attraction. But that's not what she needs to hear right now. You're right. We have a truce, but we don't like each other. But liking and being attracted to each other are two different things. You don't want a commitment. You want safe. You don't want to worry about falling for the other person. And I want the same things. This can be perfect. I know you want me, and I want you. I run my hand along her jaw, lifting the scarf and seeing the faint bite mark I left on her neck. It's the perfect solution. To prove it to her, I kiss her lips. The kiss starts gentle, but the minute my lips start to move along hers, she opens her mouth, devouring me with her tongue. I feel her nipples harden underneath her shirt, and I let out a loud moan. Knowing that our family is right outside, 
I reluctantly break the kiss. Think about it. I leave the bathroom, satisfied knowing that I'm leaving her wanting more. Chapter 22 Vivi How the hell Sandy does this each year is beyond my ability to understand. This is the second Christmas party in as many days. Last night's party was family only, so Jake and Sandy could announce their good news. Tonight is Clark Enterprise's holiday party, and tomorrow they are going to Jake's uncle's holiday party. Thankfully, my holiday partying ends after this one. The Clarks do it big, reserving a ballroom at the Boston Plaza Hotel, where the family traditionally stays overnight and have brunch together the next day, so Sandy has reserved a room for me at the hotel. The rest of us wait in the elegantly decorated ballroom for the Clarks to arrive. According to Juan, they always walk in together, and the party does not officially begin until they arrive. As I chat with Juan and his wife, Colleen and the rest of the mailroom crew joins our table. As we're discussing our plans for the holidays, the door to the ballroom opens, and in walks Joshua and Lillian Clark. The rest of the Clark family follows behind them. Everyone stands as they make their way to the head table. Jake holds Sandy's hand as she trails behind him in a long green dress. Next are Troy and Tracy, followed by Luke. I take a sip of my cranberry martini as I look at the long line of Clarks until my eyes land on him, and Luke does not disappoint. He's in a dark blue suit and a white shirt with the top two buttons left undone. I can see the tanned skin of his upper chest from here. When I look up, our eyes are like two magnets. The family sits. Mr. Clark makes a speech, thanking us for all our hard work and dedication. I turn my head away from Luke and do my best to listen to the speech, but I feel his eyes on me the entire time. I quickly turn my head towards him, and he's watching me, his bottom lip between his teeth. When Tracy leans over and says something in his ear, he responds, but his eyes never leave mine. Feeling completely exposed, I force a conversation with Juan and his wife, my voice quivering and foreign in my own ears. Thankfully, Juan doesn't seem to notice. Instead, he pulls out his phone and shows me pictures of his son. Juan, stop embarrassing the girl, his wife Gloria says, but Juan ignores her and keeps scrolling through his phone. Amidst the servers serving appetizers and drinks, and the throngs of people mingling over music and cocktails, all I can focus on are the pair of green eyes that won't look away from me. He's no longer at the head table with his family. He's walking his way to our table. Boss man, what are you doing here with us little people? Juan jokes. Just thought I'd sit with my team instead of the family. He responds to Juan as he's looking at me. When his father takes the microphone and tells about a scavenger hunt for prizes, he slides his hand underneath the table and holds on to mine. I should pull it away, but I can't. I embrace the warmth of his large hand covering mine. When the rest of the table leaves to participate in the scavenger hunt, he leans over and whispers in my ear, You look so beautiful. Unsure of what to say, I look away, feeling a blush creep across my cheeks. What? You do, he tells me. Don't say those things to me. Why not? Because your proposal from the other day doesn't include you saying sweet things. He lets out a loud laugh before leaning back in his chair. You will never silence me, he jokes, throwing my words back in my face. I beckon him over with my index finger, and when he gets closer, I lean into him, getting as close to his ear as possible. Are you saying I'm not woman enough to do it? He turns his intense gaze on me. This time, it's him who gets close to my ear, close enough that his lips graze my earlobe. I don't know, Vivian. Are you? In a room full of people, he subtly leans in even further and licks the tip of my ear. He does it so fast. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought I imagined it. I open my mouth to form a response, 
just as Mr. Clark approaches our table. Vivian, get out there. Lots of prizes to win. Lucas, come on. You can't just sit here all night. You have to work the room, son. He slaps Luke on the shoulder, and he gets up and walks away with his dad. Two extra vacation days. Juan waves a piece of paper in the air. I jump up to try and snatch it from him, but he moves out of the way and shakes his head at me. Gift card for Manny Patty, Colleen says. What about you, Vivi? A hundred dollar Macy's gift card. We all fist bump while we order fresh drinks from the bar. Christmas carols play as everyone drinks and laughs. I look around and spot Luke standing with his parents, his mother holding onto his arm while they talk with employees I recognize from the accounting department. Sandy and Jake are chatting with Troy, Tracy, and several people I don't know. As usual, Jake's arm is around Sandy's waist, but I manage to catch her eye and wave at her. A few minutes later, she extricates herself from her husband's grip and walks in my direction. Having fun, Vivi? She asks, right before she orders a ginger ale. I wave my gift card in her face as my answer. Nice, she says. Too bad you can't participate, Mrs. Clark, I say to her. I know. The first year I came, I wanted to so bad. She does a fake pout at the memory. She hooks her arm through mine as we walk through the room. Soon dinner is served, and as I eat the delicious meal, I'm unable to help myself. Every few minutes, I look towards the head table, and every time I do, it's only to find him already looking at me. I can see the hunger in those green eyes from my seat. At one point, he puts down his fork, picks up his water glass, and takes a slow sip. When he puts down the glass, he slowly licks his lips, all without breaking eye contact. I don't realize I've stopped chewing until Juan says something that causes the entire table to burst into laughter. Unable to take its stare any longer, I look away and pretend to laugh along with the rest of the table. Stopping the heated looks doesn't take away my thoughts of him, though. I clench my thighs as I remember his hands between my legs. It's my turn to drink my cold water, as I imagine how it would feel to have his mouth between my thighs. I open my mouth and take a deep breath, and when I look at him again, I could swear that he can read my thoughts. Gloria and I met at a Christmas party, Juan says to the table. We've all had dessert, and the DJ is no longer only playing Christmas carols. She was wearing a red dress, just like this one. Gloria blushes and hides her face in Juan's bicep. She pulls away, and he throws his arm across her shoulders, pulling her to him. And when this song came on, he continues, pointing at the ceiling, I grew some balls and asked her to dance. And boy, can my Gloria dance. He stands up and offers her his hand. She takes it, and without a word, he escorts her to the empty dance floor. He pulls her so close to him that a piece of paper would have a hard time fitting between them. The entire room watches as they dance to Merry Christmas, Darling. They float across the room, their bodies in constant contact, I've heard this song. I've danced to this song, but I've never seen a couple dance so beautifully and romantically to it before. When they finish, they get a standing ovation, and Josh Clark requests that everyone get on the dance floor. An hour later, I'm in the middle of a dance-off with the mailroom employees. What started as something small, one initiated between the few of us, now has the attention of everyone in the room. Once dinner and dessert were over, the DJ mixed Christmas carols with hip-hop and pop music. When Rihanna's Under My Umbrella starts to play, I wave Sandy over, and she runs over and joins our group. Sandy smiles at me, probably remembering how we used to blast this song in her mother's house years ago, challenging each other to dance. Even though my back is to him, as I wait for someone to point at me to dance, I know he's looking at me. I don't need to turn around to know that he's walking towards our group, the temperature in the room increases with each step I know he's taking. 
I feel a huge pair of hands on my hips. I stand frozen in time. Luckily, everyone is too distracted by the dancing to notice my now rigid stance. He steps closer, and I immediately feel his erection on my ass. To torture him, I stick my ass out a little further, and he grinds on me. I let out a soft moan, ready and eager for him to grind on me again, but he doesn't. Instead, he spins me around, takes me in his arms, and we start to move to the music. I don't know how much time passes, but we never stop dancing, and I don't know or care what songs are being played. He simply holds me close, my body pressed into his, as we move in perfect sync. As the party winds down, the ballroom begins to empty, but I stay in Luke's arms. I feel him hard against my thigh. I try to move away, but he holds me close. I don't fight it. I lay my head on his chest and simply feel him against me, the sound of his heartbeat making its own music. Come to my room, he whispers in my ear. I look up into his eyes. I know you want me, he says, his voice hoarse. He leans down and whispers the room number in my ear. When the song ends, he walks me back to my table. He then walks to the bar and orders a drink, his intense gaze on me the entire time. When he finishes his drink, he shakes hands with a few people and walks out of the ballroom. Chapter 23 Luke I cringe as I overhear the conversation my brother is having with his wife as they wait for the elevator. I'm going to play Find the Pink the minute we get back to our room, Jake says. And what are you going to do when you find it? Sandy asks. What aren't I going to do is the better question. Sandy's eyes widen at his declaration. She moves away and starts to press the elevator button repeatedly. He pulls her back and starts to kiss the side of her neck. I let out a loud cough, alerting them of my presence, but it's as if they didn't even hear me. I'm right here, I say. When the elevator door finally opens, I start to follow them inside, only to have Jake shove me away. Take the next one, he says. The door starts to close, but not before I see him pull Sandy into his arms. Thankfully, I don't have to wait too long for the next elevator. Once in my room, I throw my suit jacket on the floor and pace the length of the space like a caged animal. After what feels like hours, I check my watch and realize it's only been ten minutes. The minute I saw her standing in the ballroom, I knew I was going to ask her to spend the night with me. She looked so beautiful standing at the bar in a red and black dress. I haven't seen her in a dress since Jake and Sandy's wedding. She was beautiful that day. But tonight, she was stunning. The top of her dress was red, but the bottom was black and shorter in the front than the back, leaving her legs exposed. She looked regal standing there, almost as if she was waiting for me. Her hair was down in wavy tresses, and for once it wasn't a frizzy mess. But as beautiful as she looked, I missed the frizz. Another five minutes pass, and I consider that maybe she's decided not to come. So I grab my jacket to make the trek to her room. But just as I'm walking towards my door, I hear a loud knock. The minute I open the door, I pull her inside. My lips are on hers before she has a chance to speak. She kisses me back just as desperately as she pulls the jacket off my body. I shrug out of it and toss it clear across the room as I pull her closer and unzip her dress. I finally step back when the dress pools at her feet. She steps out of it and I kick it out of the way. i felt her body before, but have never seen it exposed like this. She's in a black strapless bra and panties. The underwear itself is not meant to be sexy, but seeing it on her body, my dick hardens even more, and I feel pre-cum beating at the top. She steps closer and starts to frantically unbutton my shirt. Once that's off, she starts at my belt, but I pull away and take off my shoes first. The minute she undoes my belt, she pulls my pants and boxers down. My dick is pointing right at her. 
I smirk when she lets out a gasp at the sight of it. She reaches over, her hand wrapping tightly around me. This time it's me who gasps at the feel of her touch. As she strokes, I undo her bra and pull down her panties. She toes off her shoes and kicks her panties to the side. I drop to my knees and kiss her flat belly, reveling at the softness of her skin. She moans when I slide my hand between her legs, pulling her lips apart, feeling her wetness along my finger. I leave her stomach alone, only to kiss the top of her pussy, her neatly trimmed bush tickling my face. She opens her legs and I slide my tongue between her folds. Her loud moan fills the room as she grabs fistfuls of my hair and tugs. She surprises me when she throws a leg over my shoulder, causing her to lose her balance. I stand up and take her with me, while both of her legs are thrown over my shoulder and my face is buried between her legs. I toss her on the bed and jump on top of her, covering her body with my large one, while I suck at the base of her neck. I kiss my way down to her breasts, sucking and biting one while holding on to the other. She softly calls out my name, but she takes my hand off her breast and shoves it back between her legs. I sink one finger, then a second one inside of her wet, moist flesh. She arches her back and howls like a wild animal. I lift my head from her breast and look at her splayed out on my bed, her hair spread out against my pillows, her wet pussy on my hand, and I almost combust from the sight. The only sound of the room is our rapid breathing. Her brown eyes have turned nearly black as she looks at me. Her cheeks are flushed, and after she moves a piece of dark hair from across her face, she reaches for me, gently caressing my cheek. She lifts her head off the pillow, and I move my head closer to hers. Our lips gently caress, and when she sighs in contentment, she lays back down on the pillow, kissing my lips and caressing my face at the same time. In the large bed in my hotel room, my large body completely covering hers, I suck and taste every inch of her velvety soft skin. Without so much of an inch of space between us, her hands roam the entire length of my back, her nails digging and scratching my skin. She wraps her legs around my waist and my dick automatically lands at her opening. Just a small thrust, and I'd be inside. She's dripping wet. I can feel her juices on my body as I tease her entrance with the tip of my cock. When she sinks further into the bed, I slide the head of my cock inside of her. Are you on birth control? I ask against her neck, barely able to restrain from sliding all the way inside. No, she croaks. She turns her head and starts to kiss me, putting her tongue in my mouth. With one last shred of control, I break the kiss and reach for the nightstand. Within seconds, I've ripped open the condom and put it on my pulsing cock. I want to kiss her again as I slide in, but I don't. I hover above her until our eyes lock. Without breaking eye contact, I slowly sink into her. She's so wet. I glide right in. She moans and bites her bottom lip once I'm completely inside, my balls slapping her ass. I wait, giving her time to adjust to my large girth. She grabs my face and says, Move, right before she captures my lips in another needy kiss. Careful not to crush her, I start to thrust slowly. She moans into my mouth and grinds against me. Greedy for me, she squeezes my ass to pull me in deeper. Don't hold back, she mutters, right before she bites the side of my mouth. I want you so much, Luke. Don't you dare hold back on me. Spurred on by her words, I pull out and slam into her. She throws her head back and moans. I do it again and again, her moans becoming louder. I take one of her legs and throw it over my shoulder, allowing me deeper inside of her. She matches me thrust for thrust, and soon the room is filled with sounds of our pleasure. Oh, God, she says. She stops kissing me only to stare into my eyes. She holds my gaze even as she arches her back and sinks her head deeper into the pillow. 
She stops thrusting and repeats my name like a mantra. She starts to shudder, the sound of my name getting louder on her lips. She closes her eyes, and her mouth forms an O. Her loss of control takes me over the edge. I convulse on top of her. Beads of sweat from my hair and forehead fall on her face, but she doesn't care. She continues to shake and spasm underneath me. We're a mess of jerking limbs and incoherent words. I slowly slide out of her, take off the condom and toss it to the floor. I lay on my back, taking her with me and placing her on top of my body. She doesn't move away. She kisses my chest. When she starts to lick the side of my neck, I let out an undignified giggle. She looks at me, surprise marring her beautiful face before she erupts in laughter. Being caught off guard by her spontaneous laugh, I laugh with her. I'm glad you came, I say as I stroke her hair. Me too, she says, wiggling her brows. I cover one of her ass cheeks with my hand and she explores my chest. She kisses, sucks, and bites across my body. Loving the feel of her on top of me, I put my free hand behind my head, giving her full access. She rolls off of me and grabs my cock, which is already hard again. She runs her hand over it, flicking the wet tip with her finger. I make a jerk and it hits her on the side of her face. I've never really seen one in real life before, she says, as she looks it over, turning it as much as possible. I've only ever done it once before you, she explains. I tense at the mention of her doing it with someone other than me. I swear to God, if you say Blake's name while we're naked in bed, I begin, but she stops me. You're obsessed with him. It wasn't he who shall not be named, she jokes. It was over two years ago and underwhelming. Had it been like this, I would have definitely gone back for more. Well, you can always have more of me. I say as she bites me just below the navel. Oh, I plan on it. Chapter 24 Vivi His body is like a heat source. His strong arm is wrapped around me, holding me against his chest. I want to turn around and run my fingers across his skin again, but I can't move. I let out a contented sigh and close my eyes as I feel the dull ache between my legs. But never has an ache felt so good. I had two more orgasms last night, the second brought on by his mouth. Then he flipped me over and had his own orgasm from my mouth. I can still taste him on my tongue. The third happened only a couple of hours ago. We both woke up, locked eyes, and shared a kiss which led to him reaching over and grabbing another condom. Even now, I can feel his hardness pressed against my butt cheeks. Even in slumber, he's aroused. He's a 23-year-old man, Vivi. He probably gets hard every time the wind blows close to his crotch. He mumbles something I can't understand and pulls me even closer. When my eyes reopen, the bedroom is still dark. I look at the clock and see that it's only a few minutes past six in the morning. I'm reluctant to end our night, but the morning has brought me back to reality. I lift his heavy arm enough to slide out of the bed and run to the bathroom. When I return, I quickly and quietly pick up my discarded clothes. What are you doing? He mumbles, just as I slip on my now wrinkled dress. Going to my room. I search for my shoes, but can only find one. It's early. Come back to bed. He holds out his hand. I know it's early. I don't want to do the walk of shame later. I spot my other shoe next to his side of the bed. When I reach for it, he grabs me, and before I know what's happening, he's flipped me on my back, and he's on top of me, his hand sliding under my dress. No panties, I like, he says, kissing the side of my neck. Don't go. I'll go to your room and bring back your stuff. He jumps off the bed and goes into the bathroom. He comes out a few minutes later and puts on a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. I give him my room key and tell him where to find my suitcase. Chapter 25 Luke 
After freshening up in the bathroom, she slides back into the bed and into my arms. She turns on her side, facing me, and slowly moving the bedspread off my naked body, sliding her hand along my abs. That's more like it, I say. This is much more better than talks of you leaving. I kiss her forehead, and I think I hear her sigh in contentment. Much better, I say, closing my eyes. When she glides her fingertip across my lower abs, she bumps her wrist against my hard cock. Seriously? Again? she asks. It's only been fifteen minutes since the last time. I can't help it, I say as I pick up her hand and place it on my cock. She immediately wraps her hand around it. I know you must be sore. Yeah, she says. She lays her head on my chest. I can tell she's thinking about something, so I wait for her to speak. Was it okay? She lifts her head off my chest and looks in my face. Being with me? I've only ever done it once before last night and this morning. I'm sure you've had plenty of experience. I wait for her to look me in the eyes, but she leaves her head on my chest. She's stopped breathing as she waits for me to speak. Surprised by her sudden insecurity, I grab her chin as I hold her gaze. It was the best night of my life. She tries to look away, but I hold on to her chin. And I've done it more than once, but I've only been with two other people. What we had has surpassed anything I've ever experienced. I see a slight blush spread across her cheeks, but the shyness is gone when she shoves a finger at my chest. You better not be lying to make me feel better, Clark. Trust me, I never lie to make you feel better. We can still be sworn enemies by day and lovers by night if you prefer. We are not lovers, she says. But as she says it, she's pressing herself closer to me and rubbing the head of my cock with her finger. We're not? No. That requires a certain level of intimacy. We are just sleeping together. We don't even like each other. You're just crazy for my body. That's it. I don't know if she realizes it, but she nods once she finishes her declaration. I want to ask her if she's trying to convince me or herself, but I don't. I let her believe what she wants as I pull her closer and inhale her hair. Got it. So does that mean you don't want to walk into brunch holding hands? I joke. Not going to brunch. That's a Clark family thing. I'm going to do a little Christmas shopping in the city. I'm not surprised by her response, but I don't like it. You can still come, and you're part of the family. Not really. I know your family wouldn't mind. Everyone is super nice, but I don't want to intrude. She yawns and drops my dick. She puts her arm across my torso and quickly falls asleep. I look at the time and close my eyes, grateful to have a few hours before I meet my family. It's Sandy, I say, holding her phone. She doesn't look happy as she takes it from me. When I heard it vibrate, I reached it before she could, ready to tell Blake to fuck off. But lucky for him, he wasn't calling. I do my best to pretend like I'm not listening to her one-sided conversation with my sister-in-law. I don't miss her eyes on my body as I dress, still wrapped in a towel as she digs through her suitcase. You came by my room? She says as she pulls out black leggings a denim skirt, and a black sweater. I just got out of the shower. It's technically true. What she fails to mention is that she just got out of my shower after showering with me. No, that's a Clark thing. I assume Sandy just invited her to brunch. I pretend to busy myself by putting on my belt. That's sweet, Sandy, but I don't want to intrude. You told me this is a family tradition. Please don't worry about me, okay? She listens some more as I put on my shoes. She's right about it being a family tradition. We've had the company Christmas party here all my life, and the entire family meets for brunch the next day, followed by Uncle John's Christmas party later that night. I was going to spend the day in the city, do a little Christmas shopping, she explains, standing in the middle of my room, phone attached to her ear as she holds on to her clothes. I can get lunch at a McDonald's or something. It's not a big deal. I cringe at the thought, but keep my mouth shut as I continue to eavesdrop. She finally sighs in resignation. Fine, I'll see you in a few. She ends the call and tosses the phone on the bed. 
She loses the towel and slathers lotion on her naked body. Sandy convinced you to come to brunch, I ask as casually as I can. She refused to take no for an answer. As she dresses, I consider how she'd react if I hold her hand as we walk into the private room my family has reserved for brunch. Instead of her usual leggings and a big t-shirt, she looks so incredibly beautiful in a mini skirt over her leggings with an off-shoulder black top that gives her an 80s look. But when she shakes her hair out of that messy bun, I become breathless. It's a big, long, curly mess that tumbles down to her mid-back. She doesn't even bother with a comb or brush. She runs her hand through it a few times and shrugs at her reflection. Without bothering with any makeup, she puts on a pair of high boots, shoves her clothes back into her bag, and throws the bag over her shoulder. Whoa, I say as she starts towards the door. What are you doing? I take the bag from her and throw it at the top of the closet, out of her reach. Putting my stuff back in my room. I pull out the extra room key from my back pocket and hand it to her. Leave your stuff and just come back here. I try to shrug as if it's no big deal. You're giving me a key to your room. She smiles as she puts it in the back pocket of her skirt. Don't get too happy. It's only a room key, not the key to my mansion. She throws her head back and laughs so hard she snorts. There would never be a day when I need a key to your mansion, rich boy. Her words are playful. She tries to punch me on the arm, but I dodge her and put my arm around her shoulders instead. Let's go have brunch. Um, no. She shrugs out of my hug. You go first, and I'll wait a few minutes. I shrug to mask my disappointment. For now, we'll do this her way. Whatever. Just bring your little ass here later. She walks up to me and jabs me with her finger. Who do you think you're ordering around, barbarian? She's looking up at me, both hands on her hips. I resist the urge to laugh. Instead, I pull her to me and silence her with a deep kiss. I'll see you soon, suffragette. Chapter 26 Vivi I wait a full fifteen minutes before I leave Luke's room. I know Sandy and Jake aren't on this floor, but I poke my head out of the room and look in both directions before exiting. I walk as quickly as I can to the elevator and let out a huge breath of relief when I managed to get to the banquet room without anyone seeing me. When I arrived at the party last night, the last thing I expected was to end up spending the night with Lucas Clark. And what a night it was, too. I can feel my nipples hardening at the thought of his hands and mouth all over my body. I knew the barbarian had a great body, but nothing compares to seeing him completely naked. As if I can sense him. I turn my head to find him looking at me. I blush because I know he's probably thinking about last night, too. My thoughts are confirmed when I see a smug smile spread across his handsome face. Sandy and Jake walk in, hand in hand, Sandy laughing. Mrs. Clark sees them and walks over, hugging Sandy tight and placing her hand on her still very flat belly. She hugs her again before kissing both of her cheeks. Sandy says something to Mrs. Clark, and she throws her head back with laughter. She then turns to Jake and pinches his cheek before she kisses it repeatedly. Jake and Sandy walk to what looks like an omelet bar. He stands behind her, her back to his chest, his arm wrapped possessively around her. As I watch the sweet scene, I can't help but think how lucky Sandy is to be in love and loved back by not only her husband but his entire family. It's so easy. Most of my mom's family live outside the country, and no one in my father's family interacts with my mother. This is what a family should be. For a few hours today, I'll watch from the outside. By the time I fill my plate and find my seat, Troy and his family arrive. Tristan and Emma head straight for Jake and Sandy, while Travis runs to his Uncle Luke. Not missing a beat from his conversation with his father, Luke swoops Travis up into his arms, and something inside me melts when Travis puts his head in the crook of Luke's neck. When he finishes talking, he walks to the buffet and gets Travis a plate. He finds a high chair and puts him at the head of the table. While Travis makes a mess of his breakfast, Luke gets his own plate and finds a seat right next to me. We don't exchange any words, 
but my heart jumps when he slides his hand across my lap and grabs onto my hand underneath the table. I should move my hand. I should move my seat. But I can't. I can't look away as he reaches over and feeds Travis. If I'm being honest, he's pretty sweet. Everyone at work loves him, and he's like a big barbarian teddy bear around the office. And the way he is around the children is the tell. He adores them, and the feeling is mutual. Even now, he's patiently feeding Travis and wiping his mouth after every few bites. I shake my head and turn back to my food. Thankfully, Jake and Sandy take the seats across from us. Tristan and Emma sit next to them, and their parents join us, taking the last two seats at the table. Baby Rosie is in a harness across Tracy's chest, sleeping soundly. I go, Travis announces, and Tristan and Emma both groan. No, don't let him go, Uncle Jake. He ruined it last time, Tristan says, clearly frustrated by his little brother. And he made a mess. He spilled the popcorn and my drink, Emma says. He makes a mess with everything, Tristan announces. No, Travis yells, right before he throws a handful of pancakes at his brother. Travis Clark, Tracy yells, standing from her chair. It's okay, Travis. You're going to come over on Friday night, remember? Sandy tries to soothe him, but Travis is having none of it and starts to cry. We soon learn that Jake and Sandy are taking the other kids to the movies and then Christmas shopping for their parents. They tried to go to the movies last weekend, but Travis was so scared of the dark and the noise, they had to leave. It's okay, Tracy, Luke says, when Tracy starts to fuss at Travis. Let me talk to my nephew, man to man. He stands up and picks Travis up out of the high chair. He walks him to the corner of the room and they have this intense conversation. Well, it's a one-sided conversation, where Luke does all the talking. In the end, Travis nods vigorously. Don't worry, Trav, Luke says, as he continues to hold Travis. We'll scour the city for the best cookies. You don't want to go see a dumb movie. Tell the table what your wise Uncle Luke just told you. Travis just looks at his uncle and giggles. The third kid is what? Luke asks, The best! Travis yells. Travis sticks his tongue out at the other kids while nestled against Luke's massive chest. The other kids seem relieved and go back to their food, but I can't help but look at Luke holding on to Travis. He lets go of my hand to eat since his other hand is busy holding a toddler. I focus on my food as everyone around me talks, laughs, and reminisces of past parties. His uncle and his wife, Terry, come and join us at our table. There's the young lady who was doing all the dancing last night. Their uncle John says to me, You're coming to my party too, right? We need some young people. Our daughter Tiffany will be there, and she's only a couple of years younger than you. He finishes his statement, as if Tiffany being my age is significant enough for me to attend the party. I look around the table, and everyone is looking at me, waiting for my response. I look to Sandy, begging her with my eyes to tell them I can't, but all she does is smile at me. Well, I say, turning back to John, since Sandy will be no help, this is a Clark thing, and I didn't bring another dress. Nonsense. There are a million department stores. Get one. I look around, and his wife smiles at me, nodding her head. It will be fun, she says. Didn't you win a Macy's gift card last night? Luke says, nudging me with his foot underneath the table. It's settled, then, John says, as he turns his attention back to Sandy. And I can't believe you didn't invite her, Sandy. Honey, Terry says, reaching over and grabbing my hand. I'm going to tell you the same thing I told Sandy when I first met her. We have an open-door policy. You never need an invitation to anything. If we're having it, you're invited. We'll see you tonight. She leans over, kisses Sandy and Jake, and takes her husband's hand. Come on, Travis, Luke says, as he stands up with his nephew. Let's go get your coat, so we can go and search for cookies. Maybe Yee Yee can come with us. 
We'll go dress shopping with her and then have cookies. Oh, so you two are going shopping together now? Jake asks, looking from me to his brother, a smug look on his face. Yee yee go, Travis yells. I'm only going for Travis, I say quickly. I'll meet you two in the lobby in 15 minutes. I run out of the room before anyone can say anything else to me. Chapter 27 Vivi Despite being railroaded into going out with Luke and Travis, I find myself anticipating the afternoon. After changing into jeans and more comfortable shoes, I grab my coat and wait for Luke and Travis in the lobby. A few minutes later, they come out of the elevator, Travis all bundled up and ensconced in his stroller, a thick blanket thrown over him. We walk out of the hotel and down a few blocks to Macy's. Once inside the store, Travis convinces Luke to let him out of the stroller, and the minute Luke takes him out, he starts to run around in women's clothing, hiding in the clothes racks. After a few minutes of chasing him around, Luke puts him back in the stroller. I find a dress, a short red number with a plunging neckline, which works perfectly with the shoes I have back at the hotel. I'm going to get this one, I say to Luke, after modeling it for him outside of the dressing room. I liked the dress on the hanger, and it was on sale. But seeing the hungry look in his eyes as I modeled it for him was the deciding factor. Good choice. Let me hold it for you while you change. After taking off the dress, I crack the dressing door open and hand it to him. When I step out of the room a few minutes later, I find Luke and Travis gone. Once I make my way back to the middle of the floor, I find them at the cash register, and the cashier is handing a garment bag to Luke. What are you doing? I ask. I have the gift card right here. I paid. Without another word, he pushes Travis towards the elevator. I run to catch up with them, and as we wait for the elevator, I hand him the gift card. Take it. I say to him. He looks from the car to me and back again. Calm down, suffragette. I'm not taking that, and there's nothing you can do to make me take it. You ready for cookies, Trav? Cookie! Travis yells, clapping his mitten-covered hands. You've been overruled. It's cookie time. When the elevator doors open, he ushers me in first and follows behind me. I don't argue with him, knowing that I will just slide the gift card into his wallet later tonight. After walking back to the hotel and depositing my dress in his room, we go back outside and take a long walk through downtown to Boston's North End. It's a crisp, cold day, but the sun is shining as we walk through the city. At some point, Luke throws an arm across my shoulders and pulls me closer to him. Liking the closeness, I put my arm around his waist and he holds me close as we both push the stroller. By the time we arrive at Mike's Pastry, my cheeks are flushed and I'm ready to warm up. The place is crowded, but we find a table at the back of the bakery. Don't tell my aunt, but I love this place, I say, as I take my gloves and hat off. Their tiramisu is the best. I don't know if I want a cappuccino or hot chocolate. Chapter 28 Luke Her cheeks have turned pink as her lips as she talks. I don't know if she realizes it, but she rubs her hands and licks her lips as she looks at the dessert case. Sit tight. I'll go get us some stuff. She starts to dig around her purse, probably looking for money to give me, but I take off before she can find it. The line is long, but when I finally get to the front, I order a bunch of cookies for us and some to take back for Tristan and Emma. I also get an assortment of different desserts for me and Vivi, complete with two cappuccinos and three hot chocolates. The first thing she does when I get to the table is take a cookie for Travis. Then she grabs the tiramisu for herself. Oh, my God, she moans at about her third bite. I will my cock not to get hard at her moans. Good, I ask, eyeing her dessert as I eat some of the cheesecake. So good, she says. She puts a little piece on her fork and offers it to me. I return the favor by feeding her some of my cheesecake. As Travis devours his cookies and hot chocolate, Vivienne and I share our desserts, eating from each other's plates and feeding each other. 
As we eat, she laughs as Travis makes mess after mess. Without missing a beat, she wipes his hands and mouth, only for him to make a mess again a few minutes later. She not only keeps Travis clean, but she also runs her hands through his blonde hair every few minutes. Unable to help myself, I put an index finger underneath her chin, turn her head towards me, and kiss her lips. It's a soft kiss, nothing as passionate as what we shared last night, but I feel it in my soul. Her lips are soft against mine. She smells of coffee and chocolate. I breathe her in, open my mouth a fraction, and lick her lips. She opens her mouth, too, and right in the middle of Mike's pastry, we kiss. When she pulls away, her cheeks have pinkened. She looks around the room, and when her eyes find mine, she smiles. She goes back to the dessert, this time taking one of the cannolis. I can't help my dirty thoughts as she sucks the cream from the hard shell. When she catches me looking at her, she blushes again. I'm eager to get back to the hotel and drop off Travis, who has fallen asleep with a cookie in each hand. The party isn't for a few more hours, and seeing Vivi eat has given me all sorts of ideas. The first one, getting us both naked so I can have my second dessert of the day. Unfortunately, luck is not on my side. As soon as we walk into the lobby, we run into Troy, Tracy, and my parents. When they see us, my dad gives me the same look Jake did earlier. He arches his eyebrows and smiles smugly. Instead of going back to my room as I had planned, my mother convinces Vivi to join her and Tracy for manicures while the guys hang out in Troy's suite. As usual, Mom doesn't give Vivi time to respond. She puts an arm around her and practically pulls her out of the hotel. Jake's on his way back, so maybe we can just hang out with the kids before getting ready, Troy says. Jake's hanging out, too, I ask as I follow them to the elevator. Probably. He's dropping Sandy off with the girls, Troy says. I nod at my brother, agreeing with his plans, but secretly irritated at my family's heavy-handed ways. I sit at the back of Jake's Escalade as he drives us back to the hotel. I slide my hand over and lay it on Vivi's lap. She puts her hand on top of mine and squeezes it. We both stiffen as Sandy leans over, but she only lays her head on Jake's shoulder. When she doesn't turn around, I start to massage Vivi's thigh. Despite it being covered by her long coat, I manage to find my way to her warm flesh. She looks at me, her brown eyes almost completely black as she softly sighs and bites down softly on her lip. Jake stops for a red light, and Sandy yawns. You okay, Sandy? Vivi asks. Yeah, just tired. Making this baby is exhausting. All I want is to get back to our room and get to bed, she says, yawning again. Not too tired, I hope, Jake says as he reaches over and lays a hand on her stomach. Never too tired for that baby, Sandy says, giggling. She tilts her head up at him and he leans down and kisses her. Thankfully, the light turns green, ending the kiss. Gross, I say. Go up, Jake says back to me. No one else speaks as my brother drives. I lower my hand and glide it up Vivi's leg, and I'm rewarded with a moan. It's so soft, I know I'm the only one who heard it. She exhales, closes her eyes, and squeezes her thighs together. I continue to torture her as I think of the past few hours. Uncle John's party is different from my dad's holiday party. He shuts down one of his restaurants. With the nature of his business, the party is for management only, but unlike the one we went to last night, his is more informal. There's an open bar, buffet, and dancing. Sitting is informal as well. I ended up at a table with my parents, uncle, and aunt. When we arrived, Tiffany grabbed Vivi and sat her down at a table full of women. She did the same thing with Sandy and Tracy when they arrived forcing my brothers at the table without their women. Despite getting dressed while Vivi was in my room, we were short on time and didn't have an opportunity to do anything other than shower together and dress quickly. I watched her the entire night. As she talked with Tiffany and some girls I didn't know, my eyes were glued on her. I studied every expression on her face and memorized every curve of her body. And that fucking body. Holy shit. As much as I wanted to be next to her during the party, I stayed away. I watched her from afar, so beautiful, vivacious, and free as she laughed with Tiffany and her friends. 
I watched her have an entire conversation with Sandy and Tracy. When Sandy said something and started to get up, Vivienne shook her head at her, ran to the bar, and brought her back something to drink. But it's the dancing that did me in. When Santa Baby started to play, I became mesmerized. I stood at the bar, holding my drink halfway to my lips as I watched her. The dance floor was full, but I saw only her. She stood in the middle of the floor, the red dress hugging her every curve. As she had done the entire night, she searched the room for me. When her eyes found mine, she started to slowly move her hips, taking direction from the lyrics. Time stood still as she danced for me, moving slowly, sensually. Her eyes locked on mine as she moved to the music. I didn't dance with her, not trusting myself if I were to get my hands on her body. Thankfully, the party ended soon after that last sensual dance and we left. I'm brought out of my thoughts when Jake kills the engine, and I look around to see we are in the garage of the hotel. He jumps out and opens the door for Sandy, but Vivian lets herself out before I can get to her door. Sandy lets out a surprised yelp when Jake swings her in his arms, and I'm envious of the fact that I can't do the same for Vivi. The elevator is filled with sexual tension, both from me and Vivi and Sandy and Jake, but they have the luxury of kissing while we ride up. Vivi's floor is first, and I immediately feel her absence when she steps out of the elevator, saying goodnight to us. When I get to my room, I decide to give her five minutes before I go to her room and bring her back. I pace for a few minutes. Just as I'm about to take off my suit jacket, she comes walking through the door, the keycard in her hand. Her eyes lock with mine as she slowly takes her long black coat off. I watch, mesmerized, as she throws it on a chair. Without saying a word to me, she undoes the zipper on the side of her dress, and seconds later, the dress pools at her feet, leaving her in nothing but a red bra and matching thong. She steps out of the dress and kicks it out of the way. I take a step towards her, but she shakes her head. She takes off her bra before she rolls the thong down her legs. When she's in nothing but her black stiletto shoes, she slowly walks to the bed and crawls across it on her hands and knees. Your turn she says once she's lying naked on the top of the bedspread. Like lightning, I whip off my jacket and throw it across the room. Without breaking our gaze, I undo my shirt, one button at a time. She whimpers once the shirt and my t-shirt are off, revealing my torso. My belt comes off next, then my shoes, followed by my pants. All of it, she says, pointing to my black boxers. I want to see you she says huskily. As you wish, I say as I take them off, leaving my dick long, hard, and pointing directly at her. Unlike her leisurely stroll to my bed, I run and jump onto it. I kiss her deeply, hungrily, devouring her mouth with mine. She responds just as hungrily. I kiss my way down her body, biting and sucking along the way. Like I've done before, I suck at the base of her neck, leaving my mark on her skin. I suck her breasts, biting, nipping, and pulling her nipples. I feel her spread her legs underneath me, her hands lost in my hair, my name on her lips. Hearing her call my name does something to me, and I leave her breasts to take her lips again. I kiss her deeply, allowing her to taste all of me. As she opens her legs wider, I lay my big body between her thighs, feeling the moisture there. I leave her mouth and continue kissing my way down her body. My lips soon find my way between those smooth thighs. The aroma of her desire fills my nostrils. Unable to hold off for another second, I lick her slick folds, sliding my tongue across her slit. Oh, shit, she says as she pulls on my hair with both hands. Lucas, she says, her voice husky with desire. I continue to lick and suck, covering her entire sex with my mouth. As much as I want her to come on my tongue, I want to feel my dick inside of her even more. After one more lick, I kiss my way up her body, capturing her mouth one more time, letting her taste herself on my tongue. 
As soon as I open my mouth, she's sucking my tongue, moaning into my mouth. She squirms underneath me as she caresses my back with her fingertips. I want you so much, I say against her mouth. Her only response is to kiss me harder, holding my body closer to hers. I can feel her wetness against my groin. She opens more, waiting for me to slide inside of her. Like a siren's call, I find my way against her slit and slide right in. She arches her back and calls my name as I slide all the way inside of her. She grinds against me, matching my thrusts, our lips never losing contact. I give her slow, deep thrusts. I pull almost completely out, only to plunge back in with one hard push of my pelvis. Lucas, she says against my lips. Condom, Lucas, she pleads. Lost in her warm flesh, I thrust a few more times before her words register. Oh, shit, I say, pulling out and reaching into the nightstand to grab a condom. Once I'm sheathed, I slide back in, pumping in and out of her, losing myself in her silken folds. She comes hard around my dick. She yells out my name and pulls on my hair so hard I know I'll have bald spots, but I don't stop fucking her. Feeling close, I pull out, not ready to be done yet. I put her on her side, lift her leg, and glide back inside, losing myself in her completely. I feel my balls start to tingle. I sink my teeth into her shoulder before I detonate inside of her. Mm hmm she says. I slow down and count to ten before losing it completely. As her wet little mouth swallows my dick completely, I let out a loud moan against her wet pussy. She's hanging upside down on my body, her pussy on my face and my dick in her mouth. Her pussy is drenched, and I know she's close. I'm about to explode, but I need her to go first. I increase the pressure on her clit and bite down on it gently. That did the trick, because she gyrates, pressing her core so hard on my face she squishes my nose. She squirts on my face, her juices going into my mouth. Her sweet juices fuel my own release. I let out a loud grunt against her pussy as I come in her mouth. I try to pull out, but she holds me between her warm lips, licking and swallowing every drop of my release. Oh my god. She whispers as she climbs back on top of me. I open my arms and engulf her against my frame, and she sticks her head at the crook of my neck, running her tongue against my hot skin. That was amazing, she sighs. I kiss the top of her forehead. I guess she's unsatisfied with simply laying on my side because she climbs on top of me instead. She's small, but her body gives off so much heat. Feeling her hard nipples against my chest, I lay a large palm across her ass and pull her to me even more. Maybe we should get some sleep, I say. Since we got back from the party, we've been insatiable. When we ran out of condoms, I promised her I'd pull out, but she suggested oral instead. Sleep is overrated, she says, but I can tell she's tired. She sighs again and closes her eyes. Chapter 29 Luke me. I'm taking you shopping for a dress after this luncheon. Eat fast. I send her a gif of Homer Simpson shuffling food in his mouth. She responds exactly as I predicted she would. Vivi. Are you asking or telling? And what do I need a dress for? She follows her text with a shrugging emoji. Me. My parents' Christmas party. Definitely telling. Vivi. Not going, so no shopping necessary. If I were going... I would not need a dress. Isn't it casual? Me. You're going, and you look good in dresses. Be ready. Vivi. See my last text message? Luke. See mine. I end the message with a kiss-blowing emoji, and she responds with an angry face. I'd prefer it if she went with me to this party, but I know that will be an issue. It's only been two weeks, so I need more time. But this secrecy is not working for me. Hey, Troy says as I make my way towards the receptionist's desk. I went to the luncheon expecting Vivienne to be there, but since she wasn't, I decided to go search her out. You're going the wrong way. 
My world stops when I make my way around the corner and see the desk. The UPS guy is looking at my woman, and I come to an abrupt stop as I take in the scene. He's leaning casually against the desk, a predatory smile on his face as he looks down at her breasts. I love the tight red V-neck sweater, but the secrets underneath that sweater are from me, not this fucker looking at her like she's his last meal. What the fuck? The asshole just asked her to a movie tonight. Fuck that shit. I start to walk towards them, but Troy grabs my arm. I pull out of his grasp, but he's fast. Before I know it, he's pushed me against the wall and holds me in place. Don't you do it, he warns. Don't be so fucking impulsive. I stop and turn my head towards the scene. Vivienne stammers, turns her back, and leans down to put something in a drawer. When he stares at her ass, I push Troy away so hard he stumbles, but I only take two steps before he grabs onto my wrist in a vice-like grip. When Vivienne turns back to the asshole, she looks from him to me. She looks away from me as she puts a piece of her messy hair behind her ear and nervously licks her lips. She starts to sputter out a response to his question, but before she gets any words out, Troy interrupts. Hey, Viv, we came to get you for lunch. He walks away from me, goes behind the desk, blocking the man's view, and waits for her. Are you done with the deliveries, Larry? Troy asks. If you are, we'll see you Monday. Have a great weekend. Troy holds Larry's glare until he gives up and starts to walk away but not before he tells Vivi they'll talk on Monday. Troy walks back to me and stands next to me until Larry walks out of the building. Hey, guys, Vivi says as she walks briskly from the desk to me and Troy. Let's go. I'm starving, but you guys didn't have to wait for me. For someone with short legs, she walks fast, quickly passing me and Troy, leaving us to follow behind her. I watch her ass the entire way to the break room. Oh, my God, does it smell good in here. She says, and I finally look away from her to see the Italian food spread out for us. Change my mind about taking you to the mall at lunch, I whisper as I pie on my plate with Zidi. Oh, I seem to remember telling you I wasn't going. She chooses the sausage and peppers dish. Without even me asking if I want any of it, she puts some on my plate. In fact, she fills my plate for me, never once asking me what I want. Instead of being annoyed by it, I love it. No, we won't have enough time. I'll take you after work instead. We'll have dinner and then shop. Are you asking or telling? She challenges. Whatever will get you out of the house. If you want to believe I'm asking, fine. But it's happening. We reach the end of the line and she stops in the middle of the room. That's not what we agreed to. Dinner? Mall? You're blurring the lines, rich boy. Furthermore, I can buy my own dress. Not that I need one, she says. I take a step closer to her, lean down, and whisper in her ear. I'll pick you up at six. And in case you haven't noticed yet, the lines are so blurred they're practically unrecognizable. She opens her mouth to give me what I know would be a smart-ass response. But Juan and Colleen call her over, and she leaves me to join them. Instead of following her, I join Troy and Jake at their table at the back of the room. Jake's oblivious as he types on his phone, but Troy won't take his eyes off me. Tell Sandy I said hi, I say to Jake. We're going out tonight, he says. Then he looks up at me and says, Alone. I'm going out too. Jake doesn't bother to respond. Troy shakes his head at me in disbelief. I ignore him as I eat my food, only to turn around occasionally to look at Vivienne. As if we're connected every time I turn to look at her, she turns her head to look at me, a small smile on her lips. I don't even need to look up when I hear the door to my office open and close. I finish typing my text, hit send, and finally look up to find Troy hovering at my desk, arms crossed as he waits for me to speak. This is when I'd start talking. This is when his quiet older brother stance would take effect and I'd spill all my secrets and tell him the entire history between me and Vivi. These are the dynamics of the Clark brothers. Despite Troy being the oldest... Jake is the alpha among us. Despite my age, they always see me as the baby. I'm still the little boy they took care of growing up. I'm still the teenager they gave the sex talk to, talked to about girls, taught to drive. Until Jake and Troy's relationship severed for those five years, we were the best of friends. Despite the huge age gaps between me and my brothers, we were always extremely close, but the hierarchy always remained. 
when the relationship between them went to hell and I stopped speaking with Jake, things between me and Troy changed too. We were still close, but things shifted. He attempted to take on more of a father figure role, from giving unsolicited advice to practically ordering me to start speaking to Jake. Explain yourself, he finally says. Irritated by his order, I break our gaze. Last time I checked, I was an adult. Since I've broken no laws and don't need you to act as my lawyer, I don't have to explain shit, I say. To make my point, I grab my phone and respond to Vivi's latest text. So you're a smartass now? You're my father now? I counter. Deflecting. Okay, I'll be direct. What's going on with you and Vivienne? And don't bother lying. It's obvious. If it's so obvious, you tell me, Troy. I toss my phone across my desk and cross my arms. He takes a step closer to my desk, lays both of his hands across the surface and leans down. My phone beeps, but before I can grab it, Troy snatches it off my desk and reads my text. We'll see who the real boss is tonight, he reads. Irritated by the intrusion, I jump out of my chair, and in two steps I'm snatching the phone out of his hands. What the fuck is your problem? I don't go through your shit, I say as I put the phone in my pocket. She works for you. She's practically family, Luke. Out of all the women you can have, why go after Jake's wife's cousin? I walk to the door, open it, and gesture for him to get out. But instead of walking out, he closes the door and leans against it. This is Sandy's cousin, he reminds me. Jake's wife's cousin, Luke. Having had enough of Troy, I take a step closer to him and get in his face. Exactly Troy, I say, teeth clenched. His wife's cousin. Not Jake's wife, not Jake's girlfriend. Vivienne is single and so am I. I really don't need you in my face right now, especially since you have no room to give me advice when it comes to dating or Jake. I regret my words the minute the color drains from his face. I get out of his face and go sit behind my desk. Stunned at my words, Troy runs a hand through his hair. But instead of leaving my office, he walks back to my desk. I don't want you to have any problems with our brother. I'm looking out for you. You know how protective he is of Sandy, and by extension, anyone Sandy cares about. What the hell do you think I'm going to do to Vivi? Not that I need to explain anything to you, but I like her. I'm not using her for sex, if that's what you're thinking. He takes a deep breath before he speaks. I know that. But you've been saying for a while now that you're done with women. I don't know what happened between you and Tori, but I know whatever happened fucked you up somehow, and you never want to talk about it. Have you always been this overbearing? I had a girlfriend, and it didn't work out. I'm hardly the first person to ever break up with someone. That was years ago, so I am not allowed to move on to someone else? And the girl I like happens to be related to my brother's wife. So the fuck what? Where was this concern when you were the one attracted to Jake's girlfriend? You're being a hypocrite. His head rears back as if he's been slapped. His face whitens even more, and he starts to shake his head in disbelief as he takes an uneven step towards me. My apology is on my tongue, but he speaks first. Luke, I'm only trying to help. But you're not helping. I have the Creator breathing down my throat all the damn time now. I don't need you too. Fine, he says, throwing up both hands in surrender. I came in here with good intentions. I know that, I say to him. But your concern is not needed. At least in this situation, okay? I'm sorry for lashing out at you. I'm relieved when he nods. I think he's about to leave my office, but I'm wrong. He sits on my desk, eyeing me. You threw a fit when she was hired here and said you hated her. Now you two are in a secret relationship? Jesus, I say, running a hand through my hair. I changed my mind about her. Is that a crime, Troy? I like her. And if I have it my way, the relationship won't be a secret for much longer. Are you happy now? Yes, I am, actually. I've been worried about you since you introduced me to Tori. You were in a depression when things ended with her, and I always suspected there was more to it than just a breakup. He makes a face as he says her name, and I wonder if he even realized the change in his demeanor. It's not often that Troy dislikes someone after meeting them for the first time. 
We were thirty minutes into dinner when he excused himself to go to the men's room, but before he got up he kicked me under the table and signaled with his head for me to follow him. I remember my disbelief, followed by irritation when he asked me what I was doing with someone like Tori. What do you mean? I asked, confused. She's beautiful. Tori's long, tanned legs and blonde hair were the first things I noticed about her. Is that all you see in her? You're young, so you should enjoy yourself, he says, seemingly relieved. What? No, I like her for more than that. She's smart. I thought you, of all people, would appreciate the fact that she wants to go to law school. She's mentioned our family home in Martha's Vineyard three times, and has done nothing but talk about money and trust funds. You're making a big deal out of nothing. I invited her to the vineyard this summer. And so what about the other stuff? She's ambitious, and she doesn't need our money. Her father's a doctor. He runs a hand through his hair and rubs his face before turning to look back at me. Unwilling to hear whatever else he has to say, I try to walk past him, but he catches me by the elbow. She's having dinner with your brother, who is twelve years older than you are, and she hasn't asked me one question about you growing up. She hasn't looked at you or touched you once since she sat down. He says it plainly. And even though I know he's right, I refuse to acknowledge any truth to his words. I yank my elbow out of his grasp. You want her to stick her tongue down my throat in the middle of this restaurant? You want her to give me a hand job under the table, Troy? No. But when someone is into someone, it's obvious. You've been looking at her. Has she looked in your direction once? When you put your hand on top of hers, she moved it out of your grasp, Luke. It was discreet but noticeable. She's been quizzing Tracy. Have you been paying attention? She asked Tracy questions about her life before marrying a Clark. Do you know why she did that? To compare it to her life now. She's just trying to get to know your wife. Jesus. I know what you're getting at. She's not some social climber. You said it, not me. But that's what you're getting at, right? You showed me the way and made me come to my own conclusion. Isn't this the same thing that Mom accused Tracy of? Are you turning into Lillian Clark? You've known her for 30 minutes, and I've known her for a lot longer. And I resent the fact that you would think that a girl would only be into me for my trust fund. I start to walk out of the bathroom, but he pulls me back. Not all girls. Just this one. This is really shitty of you, Troy. This is the last fucking time I'll bring her around you. Don't worry. With all the shit between you and Jake, you'd think my loyalty to you would mean something. It's an awful thing to say to him. I know this. But he's hurt me with his words, and I want to retaliate. For the second time, I yank my arm out of his grasp and walk out of the bathroom. The rest of the meal is awkward, which everyone but Tori notices. I order a drink and decide to put the confrontation with Troy out of my mind. I ignore the fact that Tori continues to question Tracy about her lifestyle, particularly how it's changed since she married Troy. When the ladies leave to go to the bathroom, I refuse to speak to my brother. When they return, I ignore the changes in Tracy, like the look of unease on her face or how she tried to take control of the table conversation. I ignore her outright refusal to answer any more of Tori's questions. I ignored all of that and that led us to an unplanned pregnancy and an abortion I didn't want, which led me to barely finishing my senior year and living like a hermit in my apartment for the fall semester. When she started dating another senior by the name of Lawrence Toller, the son of a biotech engineering firm CEO, I moved back to my parents' house and commuted to campus. I couldn't even find it in me to be happy when I found out Lawrence left her to get back with his high school girlfriend, the daughter of a Google executive. By that time, the damage had been done. I'm over it now, I say to him, breaking myself from the reverie. You're right. I was depressed after the breakup, and you were right about Tori. But I wasn't ready to hear it then. I was blind. Vivi is nothing like Tori. For the first time since walking into my office, Troy laughs. I know she's not. I figured something was going on since the holiday party. It was always in your body language or the way you were always looking at each other from across the room. But your reaction today confirmed it. Vivi's a sweet girl. Anyone who agrees to take Travis into a department store is okay in my book, he jokes. Yeah, she is. 
I say, remembering the way she stroked Travis's hair and kissed his forehead. I never told Troy this, but after that disastrous dinner, the baby brother in me still wanted Troy to like my girlfriend. One day I asked Tori to babysit the kids with me one Friday night. She responded with an eye roll and told me to call her the next morning so I could take her to breakfast. Are you ever going to tell me what happened between you two? I know it was more than two people breaking up, Luke. You withdrew from all your friends at school. Jake and I became your only friends. We don't mind, but you've always had your own friends before. It doesn't matter anymore since there's nothing I could have done. But I'll tell you on the condition that we never talk about it again. When he nods, I continue. It was an unplanned pregnancy. I wanted her to keep it, but she said she didn't want it. I told her I'd raise it on my own. She agreed, and we decided we'd tell her parents together when I went to visit her. But she went behind my back and terminated the pregnancy. She said she wanted a career and wasn't ready to be a mother or go through a pregnancy. It was a shitty time. She started dating someone else when we got back from summer break, and I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle being around anyone. We had the same circle of friends, and I cut them all out of my life. That's why I moved back home during the spring semester. Why didn't you come to me? He asks. You had enough going on. Tracy was pregnant. You were trying to adopt Emma. All the shit with Jake, so I didn't want to add to it. There was one positive thing out of this, though. I had to tell someone, so I went to Jake. And that mended our relationship. He helped me. He lays a gentle hand on my shoulder and offers me a small smile. You can always come to me, Luke. It doesn't matter what I have going on. But I'm glad you went to someone. Chapter 30 Vivi Always sneaking into my room, I say against Luke's mouth as I push his pants and briefs down his legs. He kicks them both away before breaking the kiss. He pushes me, causing me to fall on my back onto the bed. He looms over me, looking down on me as if I'm a feast and he's a starving man. He lifts the long T-shirt and pulls my knees apart. He moans as he looks at me. I know this turns him on. Me in one of his T-shirts and no underwear. Oh, shit. I left the condoms in the car. He starts to reach for his pants, but I point at the drawer in the nightstand. He opens it and pulls out the box of condoms, but his eyes light up when he sees something else. What do we have here? He asks as he pulls out my purple vibrator. You nasty little girl, he says huskily. I can feel my cheeks pinken, but I hold his gaze. Woman, a nasty woman with needs, I say to him. Are you going to take care of my needs, or do I need to call someone else to do the job? Just as expected, my easygoing lover turns into a growling barbarian. His smile vanishes as he pins me down with one hand and turns on the vibrator with another. With the same hand, he forces my legs apart, leaving me completely exposed. Before I can get used to the new position, he's pressing the vibrator on my clit. Ah! I say a little too loudly. To silence my moans, I grab the pillow and cover my mouth with it, but Luke grabs it and throws it on the ground. He presses the vibrator harder, holding my gaze the entire time. My eyes roll back, and just as I'm about to fall over the cliff, he removes it from my clit. I groan in protest, but he's putting his body between my legs and piercing me with his cock. He catches my moan with his mouth, silencing me with his tongue. I taste all of him, as I run my fingers down his muscled back as he pumps into me. Only I make you come, he says harshly against my mouth, his five o'clock shadow grazing my sensitive skin. Says who, Lucas? He grabs one of my breasts and twists it, the pain causing my pussy to flood. But I manage to lift my head up and kiss him deeply. He takes one of my legs and throws it over his shoulder, going even deeper. My moan fills the room. I'm on my way to paradise when he suddenly pulls out. What the hell, Lucas? 
I whisper, confused. When he reaches over and grabs a condom, I realize we both forgot for him to wrap it. Grateful he remembered, I spread my legs as he slides right back in, pumping furiously into me. I attack his mouth with mine, holding him flush against my body. I call out, his name a muffled sound as I come. I shudder underneath him, my hands on his back, holding him as close to me as possible. He pumps harder, grunting as he empties inside the condom. We're both panting, but we continue to kiss. He peppers my face with them before giving me a deep, lingering kiss. He slides out of me and lies on his back as he tries to catch his breath. Mm hmm he moans as I massage the muscles on his back. You are strong for an itty-bitty. Everyone is an itty-bitty next to a barbarian, I say, as I knead his back. It's not even the least bit awkward, both of us naked, with me sitting on his back, rubbing my sore pussy on his tailbone. It's about two in the morning, and we've been back from the mall since around eleven. Luckily, Jake and Sandy were already in bed when we came in. Luke went into his room and came into mine through the adjoining bathroom. We had a great time at the mall. We went to a Korean restaurant where they cook the food at your table. We ordered something on the menu called the beef combo, and we filled our bellies with delicious cuts of meat and side dishes I've never heard of. I confessed it was my first time eating Korean food, and he promised he would take me to whatever restaurants I want. After eating everything on the table, we walked through the mall, our fingers intertwined the entire time. I had every intention of picking up a few gifts for my aunts and cousins, but I was too distracted by him. I ended up helping Luke, who had no budget, shop for his family. From jewelry to clothes, he bought it all. He picked out several red dresses for me, but I told him I'd agree to go, but I would wear something I already own. He agreed, but I saw him sneak one of the red dresses in with a pile of clothes he was planning on buying. When he saw me look at it, he lied and said it wasn't for me. You know I'm going to get you stuff for Christmas, right? He grunts, as if he's able to read my thoughts. I continue to massage his shoulders. Yeah, I thought you might say that. Good. Lower, he orders. I scoot off his body and start to rub his lower back, right above his firm buttocks. Unable to contain myself, I pinch him, and he moans. Don't make me fuck you again. So, about this stuff you're going to buy me, I say, ignoring his crude comment. What about it? How about this? We can exchange gifts, but they can't be anything we buy from a store. He tenses underneath my fingers. He rolls off his stomach and lies on his back, presumably so he can see my face. You don't have to buy me anything, he says gently, as he reaches up and strokes a piece of my hair. I'm not buying you anything, I say, putting the word buying in air quotes. I want to do this, but I want it to be from the heart. I'm not going to the mall to pick out another blue shirt for you. I don't care how good you look in blue, I said. He gives me a smug grin as he makes his pectoral muscles move. Okay, but I'm going to warn you that I'm not a do-it-yourself kind of guy. I can't draw or write music, so you're taking a huge risk, he says playfully. I'm estranged from my parents. I have a huge barbarian oaf in my room. My entire life is a huge risk, so what's one more? I don't care about things anyway, I say, as I lie down next to him and inch my way into his side. I grab the duvet and cover our naked bodies, intertwining our legs together, as he reaches over and turns off the lamp making our only source of light the soft moonlight peeking through the blinds. What happened between you and your parents? He asks, his voice tentative. He leans down and plants a soft kiss on my forehead. The soft kiss causes goosebumps to erupt across my body. Mistaking the goosebumps for me being cold, he pulls me closer. I committed the unforgivable sin of being born female, and my mother couldn't have any more children. My father never forgave either of us. He stays quiet, 
probably waiting for me to continue. But when I don't, he says, I don't understand. Of course you don't, I sigh. You have this perfect family. Your parents love each other. You and your brothers are so close. But I don't have siblings, so it was always just me. My father is very controlling. He controls my mother, and he controlled me, and every aspect of our lives, from money to food to my friends. My aunts say their father was the same way, but my father is like him on steroids. My mom, I've come to see, is clinically depressed. She's always just been uninterested in me. She let my father run the show. So, if I wanted to do something or go somewhere, she would never give me an answer. It was always, go ask your father. She never had an opinion or a thought of her own, and that frustrated me. Was your father physically abusive? Did he hit you? His voice is low, and being pressed against his side, I can tell he stopped breathing as he waits for me to answer. He never laid a hand on me. He exhales at my declaration. I just couldn't do anything without his say-so. He could be cruel with his words. When I was in high school, I hated classes like geography or history, and he would say I was stupid. Or if he had a son, he wouldn't have to worry about a stupid daughter. When I went to college, he wanted me to go into the nursing program and told me business was a waste of time for a girl. I went to my mom and told her how I never wanted to be a nurse and how much I loved the business courses. She told me life will be easy if I do what my father tells me, and since he was paying for some of my tuition, I didn't push it. I thought I'd learn to love it, but I didn't. I started taking more business classes, and I changed my major behind their backs. He found out, and that's when all hell broke loose. I lost it that day. It was like an out-of-body experience. After 21 years of being disparaged, ignored, and put down, I had enough. I told him it was my life, and I would pick the major I wanted. He told me I could not live under his roof if I was not going to do what he says. So I left. He called my aunt and told her to put me out, but she basically told him to fuck off. And here I am. I don't understand. Why would he treat you that way? You're amazing. Whatever gets thrown at you, you keep fighting. You'll never understand because your family is perfect. But it wasn't all bad. I have amazing aunts and cousins on my father's side. That's the only positive of being his daughter. Sandy's mom is more like my mom than my own mother. She's fought with my father over me so many times. She barely speaks to him. And I know it's because of his treatment of me. When I started college, I started going to see the school counselor. It's taken years, and it's still a daily struggle, but I know that my parents' issues are not about me. I didn't cause any of it, and it's not up to me to fix it. I focus on myself. And your brother and Sandy have given me this amazing gift. They've opened their home to me and are paying for my last semester of school. I'm not going to squander any of it. For several minutes, the only sound in the room is the sound of our breaths. As tired and sore as I am, the feel of his fingertips against my hip has me climbing on top of him and kissing him deeply. His hand leaves my hip and caresses my hair. You are going to do amazing things, he says against my mouth. And you're not alone. I know, I say, as I roll off his body and cuddle into his side again. That's the one thing he's given me. An amazing extended family. Right. But I don't just mean your family. I mean me. You have me. He moves away to lie on his side so that we can face each other. At his words, I lower my gaze, but he grabs my chin and forces me to look at him. That's not our deal, Luke. Sex only, remember? Still holding on to my chin, he says, I don't know if you've noticed, Vivi, but the deal's changed. It changed a long time ago. I don't want to hide this anymore. I want everyone to know. You want everyone to know what? 
Already knowing the answer, I try to move my chin from his grasp, but he holds on. That we're together. Together? I ask, running a hand through my messy hair, a nervous habit I've acquired. You said we would be exploring with each other. You hate me, remember? I've never hated you, he says, grabbing my hand. Not even for a second. You hated me, though. Why did you, by the way? From the moment you ran into me in the parking lot, you've had it in for me. Why? I never hated you. But I was having a bad day, the morning we met. I wanted to spend the school year at my aunt's house, but my father said he wouldn't cover the balance of my tuition unless I came home. That caused a huge fight between him and my aunt, which I felt bad about. When the summer ended, I'd have to go home, and that put me in a bad mood. Then we collided, and when I looked at you, I had these feelings, but I was hating on all men because of my father, so I took it out on you. I'm sorry, I say shyly. But you got really hostile around the time of the wedding. Well, you really hurt my feelings when you told the wedding planner you didn't want to walk down the aisle with me. I was coming over to extend an olive branch and to apologize, but I saw you talk to Nicole. You looked at me and pointed. Right after that, she told me I'd be walking down the aisle with Steve, not you. What? I never said anything to her about you. She got you and Diana confused, and I pointed at you and told her your name. She decided you would be a better fit with Steve because I'm so much taller than you. That's what that was. Even in the dark room, I could see his face has turned red. Oh, is all I say, embarrassed by my past behavior. Yes, oh. So you blamed me for the sins of your father and became my enemy over a misunderstanding. Very mature, Vivian. He rolls on his back putting both hands behind his head, staring at the ceiling. I'm sorry, Luke, but I'm really sensitive about people not liking me or wanting me around. I climb on top of him and grab his face with both hands. Forgive me? I'll make it up to you, I say, as I wiggle my eyebrows at him. I just want you to think about what I said, about us no longer hiding. I was thinking of something I can do right now. I can feel how hard he is against my leg. I scoot down his body, and in one quick movement, I take the entire length of him in my mouth. Chapter 31 Luke I made you an appointment at my hair salon. Meet me there after you leave the bakery, and no arguments. It's on me. Sandy says to Vivi, who is on her way out the door to go to work at the bakery. I stand, leaning back against the island, drinking a cup of coffee as I force myself to stay put and not follow her out the door and kiss her before she drives off. She only gives me what started out as a shy glance before walking out, but I don't miss the way her eyes linger on my bare chest. I arch my brows at her, challenging her, but she refuses to say anything to me directly. She thanks Sandy before walking out, which irritates me. She doesn't push back when Sandy gives her things, but will fight me over the smallest things. I could have easily given her the money for the hair salon. That's going to end soon. When Jake comes back inside with the dogs, I put my mug down and busy myself with getting fresh food and water for them. Why are you half-naked in my kitchen? Jake asks as he leans down and kisses his wife's forehead. Put on a damn shirt. He walks over and playfully slaps me on the back of the head. Stop abusing your brother, baby, Sandy says. Let's go out and have breakfast. We're hungry. She rubs her still flat belly and my brother's eyes light up as he puts his large hands across her torso. Let's shower. You coming with us, Luke? He asks, but he's already walking away. Thirty minutes later, I'm dressed and waiting, ready for breakfast. We drive to a nearby breakfast place, and right before we order my phone buzzes, I pull it out to see a text from Vivienne. It's a picture of her taking a bite out of a cinnamon roll. She knows it's my favorite, and my mouth instantly waters. This leads to us exchanging text messages throughout breakfast. Thankfully, Jake and Sandy are too busy feeding each other to pay much attention to me. 
When Sandy excuses herself to go to the bathroom, my phone buzzes again. This time it's a picture of Vivi blowing me a kiss. As I'm typing a response, Jake snatches the phone from me. Who the hell have you been texting all morning? He starts scrolling through my phone. I try to snatch it back, but he manages to dodge me each time. Give me my fucking phone! To my surprise, he hands it back to me, eyeing me without saying a word. I can feel the color on my cheeks as I slide the phone back in my coat pocket. Jake continues to look at me, a strange look on his face, but I refuse to be the first one to speak. Thankfully, Sandy comes back, and we finish our breakfast in silence. You know what? Jake says a little later. I'm still a little hungry. Let's go to the bakery for a bit. I know your mom misses me. He's speaking to Sandy, but his eyes are focused on me. Sounds good, Sandy says. But don't complain when she puts you to work. You, uh... I nervously rub the back of my head, avoiding all eye contact. You think Vivi or your mom would want something? I make the mistake of looking at my brother, who is now smirking at me. My mom definitely won't want anything. She thinks all restaurant food is garbage, but Vivi will. I grab a menu and make a show of asking Sandy what she thinks Vivi would like. When Sandy mentions French toast, I cringe. She just ate a cinnamon roll, so she wouldn't want something sweet. I mention the Denver omelet with extra bacon, and I'm relieved when Sandy agrees. As soon as the waitress brings the to-go bag, I drop a wad of cash on the table and jump out of the seat, eager to get to the bakery. The entire drive there, Jake keeps eyeing me through the rearview mirror as he carries on a conversation with Sandy. Irritated at his constant looks, I pretend to be engrossed with whatever's happening outside the car. Hey, guys, Vivi says when we walk in. She gives a casual wave, yet the brown eyes that are staring into mine are anything but casual. Hey, we brought you breakfast, Sandy says, pointing at the bag in my hand. Why don't you eat, and I'll take over for you for a bit. Her eyes light up when she sees the food and she comes running from behind the counter. A few more customers walk in, and Sandy gets to work while Vivi sits with me and Jake at a table in the back. I sit next to her, across from Jake, who doesn't look away from us the entire time. I was starving, so thank you, she says. Without being asked, I get up and bring her back a bottle of water, eliciting a loud laugh from Jake. What's so funny? Vivi asks. Nothing at all is all he says as he gets up from the table, chuckling all the way to the counter. Vivi looks around before quickly feeding me a piece of her omelet. Before she can protest, I kiss her cheek, which causes them to turn a light shade of pink. I missed you, I say as I lay my hand on her knee. Well, I've been gone a couple of hours. So? Well, I missed you too, she says, laying her hand on top of mine. Mrs. Etienne comes out of one of the tasting rooms and Vivi quickly removes her hand, leaving me feeling empty. Dee Dee, I didn't know you were coming with trouble and little trouble, she says as she leans down and kisses my cheek. She walks away and says something to my brother. Next thing I know, he's taking Sandy's place behind the counter and her mom is dragging her to the table, pointing to a chair for her to sit. You have to relax. I go get you cake. You and the troubles can take the dessert for a little party now. So good thing you come in. You saved me phone call. We stay at the bakery until the women leave for their hair appointments. Vivi and I stand awkwardly while Jake kisses Sandy, as if they were going to be apart for years instead of hours. After declaring his undying love, Jake helps Sandy in the car, and I open the driver's door for Vivi, giving her ass a discreet squeeze as she climbs in. You got anything you want to tell me? Jake asks once he's pulled out of the tight bakery parking lot. What? I ask as I take a huge bite of a cinnamon roll Vivi had handed me as we were walking out. Don't play dumb. You and Vivi, and why the hell are you two keeping it a secret? And you're lucky Sandy's been so preoccupied with the pregnancy because it's been pretty obvious to me for a while now. I finish eating and I tell him the story. I tell him how I realized I liked her and figured the only way to get her to be with me was to pretend we would only be together sexually. And over time she would change her mind and want more. Jesus. Jake says as he runs a hand over his face. You have no idea how stubborn the women in Dee's family can be. Let me give you some advice. You need to be direct with these women. Yeah? Were you direct with Dee? Fuck yeah, I was. And guess what? I had to chase her around like a damn puppy for weeks. Well, considering what happened that first night, that's expected. 
I say, giving him a smug look. So you don't have a problem with me and Vivi being together? No. Why would I? I like Viv, and I'm happy you're finally moving forward after that shit with Tori. He reaches over and messes my hair just like he used to do when I was a kid. Troy said you'd be mad. When he looks at me with a questioning look, I say, he figured it out and was worried you and I would have issues because she's Sandy's cousin. Troy's a moron. If you mess with Vivi, I won't have to do a thing to you. Sandy, Tosh, and their mom would take care of it. Not to mention Vivi would kick your ass. Like I'm scared of a bunch of women. He gives me a disbelieving look, and I shrug. Well, maybe just a little. He reaches over and pats my shoulder. Good for you, man. Here's some unsolicited advice. Find your balls and tell her you want a real relationship. Not some clandestine affair. Dee would walk all over me if I let her, so take it from me. I nod at him, pretending to heed his advice. I should tell him that his wife walks all over him anyway, but I'll let him believe he's in charge. Chapter 32 Vivi I was unsure how I looked until Luke's eyes landed on me. The minute I walked into his parents' huge house and took off my long wool coat, his eyes never left my body. Even from across the room, my body responds to his smoldering look. I've been responding since I walked through the door. As sexy as he is, he looks ridiculous in a Rudolph sweater with a lit nose. I laughed out loud when I saw he was wearing matching sweaters with Tristan, Travis, and Emma. Is this an ugly Christmas sweater party? I whisper to him. As I wait for the bartender to pour me a red drink, did I not get the memo? I lean over the counter. He stands a few feet from me, his back against the counter, and his eyes straight ahead. There's some serious competition with Jake for best uncle. This sweater is all part of my master plan. He rubs his hands over the sweater. I look around the room to see Travis and Tristan all over Jake. Travis is on his back, and Tristan is holding onto his hand. But forget about my sweater. Let's talk about that dress. I had originally planned on wearing a red shirt and black leggings, but I found this short red dress with a full skirt in the back of Tasha's closet. She gave me the matching shoes, and I completed the outfit with a Santa hat. The way his eyes travel up and down my body gives me a boost of confidence. Oh, this old thing? I say. Tosh gave it to me. He returns his gaze to me, and despite the desire I see in his eyes... He's also angry. I told you I wanted to buy you a dress. I'll buy you anything, so you don't have to take hand-me-downs from your cousin. I lay a hand on his arm and rub it gently. Your family has done so much for me already. You don't have to buy me things, Luke. Well, I want to do it for you, okay? I open my mouth to say more, but Aunt Gabrielle, Tosh, Chris, and their kids walk through the door. Aunt Gabby's sharp gaze lands on me. She looks from me to Luke, shakes her head, and starts a conversation with Tosh. Tosh looks over at us and laughs. When she calls me over, I leave the bar and walk to them. And to my surprise, Luke walks with me. This party has a different vibe from all the others. There are no business associates, only family, friends, music, food, and laughter. After an hour of dancing, I finally get a reprieve and find myself a drink of water. As soon as I've quenched my thirst, Luke takes my hand, pulls me into his arms, and we dance to silver bells. Our bodies are pressed together so tightly there is not a breath of space between us. I feel him against me, hard and wanting. When the song ends, my need for him is so strong, I have no choice but to walk away from the dance floor. The night continues with more dancing, food, and fun, and more neighbors arrive throughout the night. So, Vivi, how do you like working with the family so far? Tracy asks as she joins the table with me, Sandy, Tosh, and my aunt. It's great. I love it here, I say to her. She starts to talk, but I tune her out when I spot a tall figure with long blonde hair. Sure enough... Zoe is talking to Luke's mother. She's not alone, though. She's with an older couple, the woman an older version of Zoe, in a dress much too tight and short 
for a woman of her age. Lil takes Zoe's hand and walks her over to Luke, who was having an animated conversation with his brothers and father. When he sees his mom with Zoe, the smile drops from his face as he frantically searches the room for me. When he finds me, he mouths, sorry. I turn away from him, relieved when no one says anything as I excuse myself from the table. I don't know where I'm going, but I start to walk away from the party in search of a space to think. When I hear the kids laughing down the hall, I decide to follow their voices and join their private party. Just as I'm about to turn the corner, I feel a giant hand grab my elbow. I use all my strength to walk away, but it's like fighting with Bigfoot. I don't give up, though. I put a hand on his chest as I try to pull out of his grasp, but it's useless. Without even breaking a sweat, he lifts me off the ground, throws me over his shoulder, and walks around the back of the house. He finds a staircase I didn't even know existed, and a few seconds later, we are inside a bedroom. I know we've entered his room, despite never having been in there before. It smells just like the room he uses at Jake and Sandy's house. The room is huge, with a California king bed in the center. His bed has a pile of clothes on it, but the rest is neat, with plenty of open space. There's an area with a couch and a coffee table. Facing his bed is a giant flat-screen TV. He throws me on the bed, and I land on the pile of clean clothes— I get up and start to run for the door, but he catches me around the waist and throws me back on the bed. I look around, but he's blocking the door. My only escape is to run into the bathroom, but he must have read my mind because he shakes his head. Don't even think about it. I wasn't, I say. I don't run from shit. I get off the bed and stand in front of him. I didn't invite her. Her parents live down the street, and my mom invited all the neighbors— she does this every year, but this is the first time they've come since I was in high school. He lays his hands on my shoulders. When I refuse to make eye contact, he takes my chin and forces me to look at him. You don't have to explain, Luke. You don't owe me any explanations. My voice is high, and I can feel the color on my cheeks. I haven't thought about Zoe in weeks, but all I can do now is think of her kissing him at the dinner table on Thanksgiving— and the possessive way she held onto his arm. Bullshit. Don't act like this thing between us is nothing. I do owe you an explanation, because if the shoe were on the other foot, you'd owe me a damn explanation. I look around the room, and the differences between us have never been more obvious. He grew up in a huge house with loving parents and two older brothers who still dote on him. He spends money like it's nothing. His type, a long-legged blonde, is downstairs waiting for him, but he's up here with you, Vivi. This is what I've always wanted to avoid my whole life, I say to him, ignoring the voice in my head. I don't want to have to explain anything to anyone. Do you know what that sounds like? Like control. First, I'll have to explain. Then I'll have to tell you where I am every minute. And then I'll have to ask you for permission to spend my money. No, Luke. My life will always be mine. I'm only twenty-one. That's the same age my mother was when she got involved with my father. Do you know my mother is only 44 years old, but she's been miserable in her life? These patterns repeat themselves. Her mother was probably miserable, too. But I'm not going to make the same mistake. I'm breaking the cycle. I'm frantic at this point. I yank my chin from his grasp and violently shove his hand from my shoulder. As if I slapped him, he takes a step back. You think I want to do those things to you, Vivian? You're using your parents to push me away, when I've done nothing but show you how much I care about you. How? By sneaking into my room and screwing me every night? I know it's not true. I know my words are vile. But words are all I have. Bullshit. I told you I want to be with you. If you weren't such a coward, we would have come to this party together. But you're too spineless to make this real. He yells at me. Make what real? We agreed to just sex, remember? I told you I wanted to explore my sexuality, and you said I can explore with you. I've explored, and I'm ready to move on. I can feel the tears in the back of my eyes, but I refuse to let them fill my eyes and fall. I stand tall and face him. Really? 
You're saying, beyond the sex, you don't care about me at all. I'm going to lay it all here for you, Vivian. I want much more than sex with you. I always did. And I only said this was only going to be physical to get you to agree. I care about you. And I want you to walk back down to the party with me. I want there to be no more Zoe's or Blake's in our lives. I want nothing but Luke and Vivi. The ball's in your court. He crosses his arms and leans on the door, waiting for me to speak. I think about his words. And on one hand, I want to do what he says. I want to walk back downstairs on his arm, daring Zoe or anyone else to try and get close to him. But on the other hand, I've never wanted a relationship. The only relationship I was around every day was a case study in dysfunctional marriages, and there is no way I'd want to repeat that. I don't think there is any way to avoid it. I might not be controlled like my mother, but there is no way I possess the tools to make a man happy long term. Look at how I fucked it up tonight. I'm sorry, but I meant it when I said all I wanted was sex. I can't offer you anything else, and I can't offer you sex anymore either. Please let me leave. He doesn't say a word as his eyes bore into mine. I can see the pain there. I see the muscles in his forearms pulse and his usually plush lips form into a tight line. He opens his mouth to speak, but then he closes it. For the first time, I'm the one who looks away, afraid of what he'll see if he looks into my eyes. He steps away from the door, and I walk out without another word. Chapter 33 Luke I'll deal with the hurt tomorrow, but tonight is all about the anger. I count to one hundred before following her downstairs. I spot her immediately. She has her back to me, talking to Chris and Tosh. Even with her back turned, I can tell her mood has shifted from the happy girl she was just a few minutes ago. After everything we've shared, she walks away, too scared to take a chance because of some bullshit her parents did. I was wrong about her. I thought she had guts. But she's just as much of a coward as Tori. Fuck her. I spend the rest of the night with Zoe attached to my side, her lanky arm wrapped possessively around my waist. I'd like nothing more than to push her away, but the thought of Vivi watching us makes me pull her closer. I get her drinks, I make her laugh, and ask her to dance. When we're not doing any of those things, I keep her engaged in conversation. At one point, I tuck a stray piece of hair behind her ear. Just as I planned, Vivian watched the entire scene. But instead of claiming victory when I see the pained look on her face, I feel guilty for upsetting her. She leaves soon after. She grabs her coat and follows her aunt. Tosh, Chris, and their kids out the door after saying goodnight to my parents. What happened? Jake asks as I stand by the bar, drowning myself in whiskey. It's over, is all I say. What the fuck do you mean it's over? You were buying her breakfast and sneaking kisses at the bakery a few hours ago. He looks around the room before turning back to me. Is this because of Zoe? He whispers as Zoe walks our way. She's using Zoe as an excuse. I can see Jake wants to say more, but like a damn boa constrictor, Zoe has already wrapped herself around me, nearly suffocating me with the stench of her perfume. Fix it, Jake says before walking away. Zoe corners me, pressing her body into mine. She presses her lips on mine, but I can't respond. It's all wrong. She's too tall. Her smell is wrong. Her hair is too perfect. She has no personality. I push her away. Too dumb to take a hint, she invites me back to the guest house on her parents' property. Chapter 34 Vivi I can't identify the feeling in the pit of my stomach as I watch Luke talk to Zoe from across the room. She has her hand on his upper back as she smiles up at him. He's looking at her, fake smile plastered on his face. After about an hour of watching them, I'm relieved when Tosh decides to leave. I thank the host for having me and follow my family out after telling Sandy 
I'm going to spend the weekend with Tosh and Chris. The rest of the holiday was just a depression-filled blur. With Christmas falling on a Wednesday, the office was closed on Tuesday and only opened half a day on Monday. I walked inside the building, my stomach filled with butterflies, unsure of how I was going to interact with Luke. My first thought this morning was to call in sick, but I was too desperate to see him. I needn't have worried, though, because Luke took a personal day. He never mentioned a personal day. If he was planning on taking a day off, he would have tried to convince me to take it off, too. He doesn't have to tell you anything, Vivi. You made that loud and clear. You don't get to play the victim now. Sandy went to her in-laws for Christmas Eve, and even though I was invited, I declined and spent the day at the bakery with my aunt and Steve. Christmas morning, with no one in the house but me and my aunt, I curled into a ball on my bed and cried for hours. I cried for the neglected little girl who grew up in an unloving home. I cried for the grown woman who was so afraid of hurt and rejection that she ruined the best thing that had ever happened to her. I cried for the hurt I caused Luke, who had been nothing but wonderful since we agreed to our deal, a deal I now realize was a lie on his part. He never intended for this to be just physical. He understood me enough to know how to approach me. He understood I would have never agreed to be in an exclusive relationship, but that's exactly what we had. We ate lunch and had dinner together most nights. We slept together almost every night after hours of sex. I would massage his body before he would hold me in his arms. It was perfect. Looking back, he acted more like a boyfriend than a casual lover. What are you doing? I asked one afternoon. It had snowed during the day, and when I went to the parking lot, I found Luke clearing off my car. Give me your keys. He snatched the keys from my hand and started the car. He opened the door for me, signaling for me to step inside. While I sat and waited for the car to warm up, he cleaned the snow off and scraped my windshield clean. When he was done, he popped his head inside, gave me a hard kiss on the lips, and told me he would follow me home. Sandy and Jake were out that night, and Luke cooked a delicious pasta dish with shrimp and linguine and a white wine sauce. I set the table, and we fed each other bites of food between kisses. When I finally get up and look in the mirror, my eyes are red and swollen. My throat feels like I had swallowed a handful of nails, and my cheeks look sunken. With a heavy sigh and a heavy heart, I shower and dress. If there is one thing I'm not, it's a coward, and as such I don't run and hide. Except that's exactly what I did with Luke. He poured out his heart, and I ran and hid, like a coward. God, I'm stupid. Hours after texting him Merry Christmas, I've still gotten no response. Before I sent the text, I called, but the phone went to voicemail after ringing several times. I put a smile on my face, but I don't think my aunt buys my pseudo-happy mood. She doesn't say anything, but she looks at me, sucks her teeth, and shakes her head. She made a delicious breakfast and ordered me to eat, but the food tastes like cardboard. I was grateful when she didn't ask any questions, and we spend the day cooking and listening to Christmas carols in French. As I'm wrapping a few last-minute gifts for the kids, my phone rings. Excited for the first time since I walked out of the Clark Mansion, I drop everything and sprint into the guest bedroom, only to be disappointed when I see my mother's name flash across the screen. Unwilling to deal with whatever nonsense she wants to throw at me today, I hit ignore. When she calls right back, I ignore it again. Who is that? My aunt asks. I look up to find her standing at the door. My mother? I say, as I throw the phone across the bed. Why well, you don't answer? I can't deal with her today, auntie. I don't know why she's calling me. She hasn't called me in almost two months. Part of the therapy I've gone through has helped me to understand that my mother has her own issues, and those issues have nothing to do with me. But knowing it in your head and understanding it with your heart are two different things. But you run in here. 
Who do you think it was? She asks. She comes into the room and sits next to me on the bed. She takes my messy hair and pushes it to the side. I meet her eyes as she waits for me to speak. Just a friend, I say. A friend? Well, whatever happened with you and this friend, you fix it, okay? I don't like to see any of my girls so sad. My eyes start to fill with tears. But I will them not to fall. She abruptly stands from the bed and orders me back to the kitchen. People will be here soon. Let's finish and then you change. We have good Christmas. As I start to follow her out of the room, my phone rings again. But just like before, it's my mother, not Luke. It isn't until the afternoon that everyone arrives, filling the house with chatter and laughter of children. I called Luke two more times with no success. My heart is heavy, but I put a smile on my face for everyone. Why did you ask her that? I hear Chris ask, followed by a loud groan. Everything? Sandy says. He got me everything for Christmas. I thought the trip to Hawaii was my present. Don't get any ideas, Tosh. I can't afford everything. I already cleared out the Target clearance section for you. I shake my head as everyone laughs. I admire the new diamond earrings dangling from Sandy's ears, and I give Chris a sympathetic smile as Tosh admires a new Gucci handbag Sandy got. Hawaii is not even a Christmas present. It's a needed vacation to recover from the holidays, Jake says, as he plays a video game with Noah. I don't know how he's able to concentrate on the game when Nia is glued to his back, roughly styling his hair. This is when I see the resemblance between Jake and Luke, because if Luke was here, he'd be playing with the kids too, probably showing them his best wrestling moves from his Luke the Nuke days. I pick at the dessert in front of me. He would love this cake. He'd top it with vanilla ice cream and drown it in whipped cream. Without even realizing it, I bought two cans of whipped cream, and he's not here to spray it directly into his mouth. I want nothing more than to ask Jake and Sandy about Luke, but I can't bring myself to say his name. If I do, I know the tears will start to fall again. A few minutes later, I manage to sneak away and check my phone only to be left disappointed. More people stop by. More presents are opened. There's music, laughter, and so much joy in the room. But all I feel is a deep void only one person can fill. Tonight was going to be the night Luke and I were going to exchange gifts, but I'll be alone, crying myself to sleep. With Jake and Sandy leaving for Hawaii tomorrow and with the office being closed until the second day of the new year, I'm going to stay with my aunt for at least another week, with nothing to do but think about the biggest mistake I've ever made. I'm opening a new doll for Nia, when I realize the room has gone quiet. I look up to find my mother standing in the middle of the room, looking directly at me. The laughter filling the house must have been so loud I didn't hear the front door open. She looks the same and different all at the same time. Her eyes are the first thing I notice. It's not just the empty look, but now it's filled with something else. There's crazed desperation in her eyes. Neither of my parents are tall people, but my mother is taller than I am. As she stands here now, she looks much smaller. She's lost a considerable amount of weight in the short time since I last saw her. Her wild hair, so similar to mine, has a smattering of gray. I look around, and everyone is looking at me, presumably waiting for me to speak. My aunt walks towards me, putting a protective arm around me, but I shrug out of it and walk out of the room. The tears fall as soon as the door closes behind me, but I don't have much time to ponder my feelings because Sandy comes in right behind me, she doesn't say anything at first. She simply pulls me into her arms and holds me, running her hand through my hair over and over again. I can't deal with her right now, is all I managed to say after several minutes. I just can't. You don't have to. I'll go out there and ask her to leave. She's been calling, I say, 
It's been eight weeks, and she calls today of all days. I didn't take her calls. She watched and said nothing as my father put me out. She's not as vile as he is, but she's never done anything to protect me from him. So she's complicit as far as I'm concerned. Sandy starts to speak, but I cut her off. I know she has her own issues. I know that. Do you know a couple of years ago I suggested she was depressed and she should go see someone? Do you know what she did? She told my father what I said, and he accused me of trying to break up his marriage. I scoff at my own words. What marriage? You and Jake, Tosh and Chris, you guys have marriages. I don't know what the hell my parents have, but it's a damn disaster is what it is. My point is, she has issues, and when I tried to help, she threw me under the bus. I can't deal with her right now on top of everything else. Sandy stays quiet for several minutes before she speaks again. Everything else with Luke. I take a deep breath and nod. You know? Sweetie, Luke never spent this much time at our house before. And I came into your room one morning and found you both asleep in your bed. You two aren't as discreet as you think. It's been obvious, Vivi. Why didn't you tell me? It was supposed to be a secret. It was supposed to be nothing but sex, Sandy. I don't want a relationship ever, but he does. Or he did. He put it all out there at his parents' Christmas party. I got jealous when Zoe arrived and walked out of the room. He found me and said he wanted to walk back to the party as a couple. I made the biggest mistake and said no. Now he won't take my calls. The tears come again, and Sandy holds me as I cry through it. That explains why he was like a sullen ghost last night and this morning. He's miserable too, Vivi. And you know what? You made a mistake. All you have to do is tell him how you feel and ask for forgiveness. I'm scared. I don't know how to be in a relationship. What if I screw it all up? I wasn't even in one, and I screwed it up. You and Jake make it look so easy. Sweetie, it's not always easy, but it's always worth it. When I met Jake, I had my own issues. I did everything I could to push him away. But he was persistent. And when we got together, it was the best thing I ever did. Vivi, look at me. I look up at her, and she wipes my tears away with her fingertips. What goes through your mind when you think of the word relationship? Don't think about it. Just tell me. Losing your autonomy? Always having to justify yourself to someone? Explaining yourself? Loss of freedom? Fighting? Misery? Control? I spit out without any thought. Do you think those things apply to my marriage? Or with Tasha's marriage? No, but you guys don't have my father. That doesn't matter. You know why? Because of who you are. Despite your parents, look at you, sweetie. You've always known your own mind. You've always known what you wanted and have never compromised. You get to define what you want in a relationship. Whatever you want to do in this life, find someone who will stand by your side, fight for you, and cheer you on. No one can control you. Take away your autonomy or your freedom unless you allow it. And we both know you'll never allow that to happen. You don't have to be alone because of your parents' relationship. Vivi, that would be giving them the ultimate control. I just let Sandy hold me as her words sink in. I still feel empty, but I feel better. For the first time in days, I feel a sense of hope. I miss him, Sandy. He's a big clown, but he's so sweet. He's a lot like Jake in some ways. He always wants to take care of me like Jake takes care of you. I care about him so much, but I'm so scared I chased him away for good. Well, if he's anything like Jake, he will let you make it right. He looked so miserable, so whatever you're feeling, he's feeling it too. All is not lost here. Explain why you did what you did. Is it that easy? I ask. If he feels the same way, yes, it's that easy. Come on, 
Let's go before Mama comes in here and starts asking questions. We walk out of the room with her arm around my waist. When we get back, Tosh runs to me and hugs me, and Steve hands me a cup of something that smells strongly of rum. The room is back to being loud, and when I look around, I notice my mother is gone. I told her to get out, is all my aunt says. Mama, Sandy chastises, it's Christmas. Exactly, Didi, it's Christmas. Where was she at Thanksgiving? Where was she the past two months, all the past twenty-one years? I want Vivi to have good Christmas, not to cry. As if that settles it, everyone goes back to talking at once. I walk over and hug her, letting our closeness speak of what her support means to me. She hasn't left, Auntie, Steve says, as he looks out the window. She's standing outside, staring at the house. I walk over to the window to find my mother wiping tears from her eyes as she paces back and forth. She pulls her phone out of her pocket, and seconds later, my phone starts to ring. It's okay. Let her in, I say. Chapter 35 Vivi Twelve days after Christmas, I still have not spoken with Luke. The first week of the new year is slow, with a quarter of the employees still out on vacation. As I leave the building for lunch, I walk past Luke's office. Unable to help myself, I open the door, walk inside, and sit in his chair. I can still smell him in this room. I lay my head on the desk and think about the first kiss we shared in this office before I get up to leave. Luke is not the only missing Clark. In fact, the place is void of all Clarks. I found out from Sandy that Luke went on a spontaneous ski trip to Aspen with Tiffany and a few of her cousins from her mother's side the day after Christmas. A week after Christmas, there was a death in the Clark family. Josh's cousin, Eugene Clark, lost his wife after a long battle with ovarian cancer. The entire family went to Scottsdale, Arizona for the funeral, including Sandy and Jake, who had to cut their Hawaiian vacation short. I've called every day since Christmas, but the phone goes straight to voicemail. Some days I leave a message, and other days I just listen to his voice. After having another tasteless lunch, I return to the office. The minute I step through the front door, I sense a change. The energy of the building has shifted. Despite it being the dead of winter, it's like everything has suddenly come to life. I approach the desk as Colleen is speaking on the phone. In the waiting area is a beautiful young blonde, looking at her reflection in a compact as she fluffs her long tresses. She's sitting with her long legs crossed as she preens. She finally stands up, taking off the expensive wool coat. She's immaculately dressed in tight black pants, knee-length high-heeled boots, and an off-shoulder cashmere sweater. It's a slow week, with no interviews or meetings scheduled. I glance at the guest sign-in sheets. Victoria Palmer. The name does not ring a bell. Hey, Vivi, Colleen says, standing up. I tilt my head over at Miss Palmer, who is now adding more lipstick. She's here to see Luke. My stomach drops at the sound of his name. As casually as I can, I take my coat off. Well, did you tell her he's not here? When Colleen speaks next, all the air leaves my lungs. He got here a few minutes after you left. He came right from the airport. I miss the hangar and the coat falls from my hand, the sound of my keys reverberating against the hardwood. Really? I ask, trying to sound casual. But my voice sounds foreign to my own ears. Before Colleen can respond, the man who's been dominating my thoughts for almost two weeks comes walking into the lobby. Just like every other time we've inhabited the same space, our eyes find each other immediately. The first thing I notice is that he's dressed casually. His light blue v-neck sweater shows off his broad shoulders and wide chest. 
He sticks both hands in his pockets, opens his mouth to speak. But the long-legged Victoria jumps from her seat and throws her arms around his neck, pressing her perfect body into his. Lucky! She practically screeches. My stomach drops at the nickname she has for him. Lucky? Who is she to call my man Lucky? He breaks our gaze, but I don't miss the fact that he removes her arms from around his neck and takes a step back. That action should have made me feel better, but all I feel is a burning sensation in my chest and the hardening of my stomach. Without even realizing it, I take two steps towards them. But before I can reach my target, they walk away as Luke practically drags her towards his office. Who was that? I ask, my voice louder than normal. I've never seen her before, but did you get a look at her? That bitch is gorgeous. Of course that's the type of woman Luke would be with. Colleen talks some more, but I tune her out as I nearly break my neck to follow them into his office with my eyes. As soon as they turn the corner, I can no longer see or hear them. You think they're together? I ask. When would he have had the time? He was away after Christmas and had gone to a funeral. If there is one thing I know about the Clarks, it's that they are all about the family. There is no way he would have left to go meet women. No, this blonde Barbie must be from his past. Well, if not, they will be. He was surprised when I told him she was here, though. I had to repeat her name like three times. I wave Colleen off as I reach for my bottle of water, my mouth suddenly going dry. My hands shake as I set the bottle down. I put my head in both hands to stave off a sudden onset of nausea. Lucas Clark has a type. Victoria Palmer and Zoe could pass as sisters with their long blonde hair and long legs. Unlike Zoe, who is an airhead, though, Victoria Palmer looks like the picture of a calculating woman. I spend the next hour thinking about the past two weeks, especially the words Sandy spoke to me on Christmas Day. I call Colleen and ask her to take over at the receptionist's desk. When she arrives, I stand up, knowing exactly what I need to do. Chapter 36 Luke Talk about the best laid plans. After leaving the AT&T store, I slammed the door of my car a bit more forcefully than I normally would. Of all the ways I envisioned today, Tori showing up at my job did not even make the top 100. In fact, I don't remember the last time I even thought of Tori, but there she was. I ran out of my office like the hounds of hell were after me as soon as Colleen called. But because the gods hate me, Vivi was already back from lunch. I didn't miss the confusion and hurt in her eyes at first, quickly followed by anger, which is why I got Tori the hell out of the lobby before Vivi could approach. Despite the clusterfuck of an hour ago, the possessive look in Vivi's eyes spurred something in me. She looked at me like I was hers, and when Tori touched me, she was livid. It's been over five days since Travis threw my phone in the toilet. With the funeral and everything happening, I had no time to go buy a new one. That means it's been over five days since I heard her voice. Once the new phone beeps to life, I scroll through my messages. Hey, Luke. Happy New Year. I really miss you, and I think I made the biggest mistake of my life at your parents' party. Call me. Hey, Luke. Just called to hear your voice. Miss you. Hi, Luke. I forgot to say how sorry I am about your cousin's wife. I wish I could be there with you. I miss you. That was the last message. I listened to the messages again as I pulled into the parking lot. God, I've missed her too. It was torture not answering her calls when I had a working phone. But I wanted her to miss me. I wanted her to experience her life without me. If she didn't want to make amends, then I'd have my answer. But it went on for too long. Instead of taking a taxi home from the airport, I needed to see her first. So I came right to the office. Now I have the added complication of Tori showing up. Fuck you, Tori Palmer, I say out loud as I walk inside the building through the side door. 
I slam the door to my office and start scrolling through my new phone, relieved to find all my old pictures intact. I put the phone on the charger and pick up my office phone to call Vivi to ask her into my office. But before I can dial her extension, my office door comes flying open. She slams the door behind her and approaches my desk. Her hands are on her hips as she crosses the office in a few quick steps. I've missed her wild mane, but she has it in a side French braid today. For the first time in almost two weeks, I can breathe. Chapter 37 Vivi Lucas Clark, for almost two weeks, I've called you every day, only to have you ignore my voicemails and text messages. I'm not perfect, Luke. I made a mistake. I was a coward because I let someone else's relationship dictate ours. If I could go back in time, I would have gone to that party on your arm. I would have told all our families that we were together, but I didn't. I was a spineless jellyfish, and for that I'm sorry. I'm here asking you to forgive me and take me back. I stop talking and take a deep breath. Luke stands up and opens his mouth to speak, but I hold my hands up. You laid your cards on the table that night, so it's my turn now. Lucas Michael Clark, I am in love with you. I've been lying to myself for weeks. I try to convince myself what we have was just sex, but it's so much more, Luke. It's this all-consuming, crazy, I don't even recognize myself, love. I never thought I'd have that. I never wanted it. I was scared of it. But I'm not with you. I love you, Luke. If you give me a chance. Before I can finish my speech, he cuts me off. Shut up, he says, coming around to the front of his desk. Just shut up. Ready to fight for him, I open my mouth but he surprises me when he opens his arms. Shut up and get over here. I've missed you so fucking much. It takes a few seconds for his words to register, but when they do, I run across the room and fly into his arms. The minute our bodies make contact, he's lifting me off the ground and his lips are on mine. Feeling like I'm home for the first time in twelve days, I lose myself in that kiss. After kissing for what feels like hours, we break apart, both of us panting and searching for our next breath. Why the hell didn't you return any of my calls, Lucas? I ask, gently slapping him on the chest. I've been going crazy. Were you punishing me? No, but I thought absence would make the heart grow fonder. I was a fool, but Travis threw my phone in the toilet when we were in Arizona I've been without a phone for five days. It's been hell. He leans down and kisses the top of my head. I press my head into his chest and inhale. You smell so good, I say against his chest. I've missed your smell. I've missed everything about you. Even your snoring. I don't snore, I say against him, unwilling to let go. He lifts me and walks back to his chair. In an instant, I'm sitting on his lap. I kiss him again and slide both hands underneath his sweater. I pull his T-shirt out of his jeans, but he grabs my hands and pulls them away. We have to get some things straight. First, this is not going to be a secret. I want everybody to know about us. That includes your family, my family, and everyone who works here. I want that, too. I'm sorry I ever hurt you, Luke. I know. And I forgive you. I understand fear, Vivi. I was scared for two years. Then you came along, and all was right with my world again. For the first time in almost two weeks, I laugh. Hardly. We did nothing but antagonize each other for two years. Let's not rewrite history. I say against his chest. Yeah, but... Antagonizing you gave me purpose, he says, and I laugh again. And you haven't heard the second thing, I have to say. Listen up, because this is the good part. As I wait for him to speak, he tells me to look at him. I look up to find his eyes more intense than ever before. I love you, too. The tears fall down my face at his declaration. He pulls me closer 
and whispers the words over and over again against my hair. This is the best day, I finally croak out. I want to stay in your arms, but Colleen's going to kill me. I told her I'd be right back. Come on, then. I'll walk you back to your desk. I'll tell Colleen you were talking to the boss. He stands up, sets me on the ground, intertwines our fingers, and escorts me out of his office. Colleen's eyes bulge out of her head when she sees us, but she gives me a wink when she stands up to walk away. Tonight, I'm taking you home so you can pack a bag. I want you to come home with me for the weekend. We'll have the house to ourselves, since the parental units won't be back until Sunday night. We'll go out for dinner and then go home. Sound good? Sounds perfect, I say shyly. He kisses my hand before walking back to his office. I've never seen anything like that, he says, as I follow him upstairs to his bedroom. Shut up, I say. My words got jumbled in a large hiccup, which causes him to laugh at me. I was hungry, okay? I haven't been eating that well. I think that double bacon cheeseburger weighed more than you do. I'm pretty sure I saw you dislodge your jaw. And why haven't you been eating? He gestures for me to sit on the bed. And when I do, he helps me take off my boots. When he takes his shoes off, we both lie on our backs on top of his bedspread. I was miserable and stressed. I don't eat well when I'm stressed. He pulls me to his side, and I lace my legs with his. There wasn't a second I didn't think about you. Even at the funeral, all I could think about was you. Same, I say, changing the subject and asking the one question that's been on my mind all afternoon. So, who is Victoria Palmer? I feel the tension in his body at the mention of that name, so I trace my hand across his chest to help him relax. My ex. It ended around the time we bumped into each other in the parking lot. In fact, when I bumped into you, I had just flown in from California. That's where she's from. And I went there to speak with her, but she wasn't interested in seeing me. Why did you break up? I ask. He looks at me, his body gone completely tense. He doesn't speak for several seconds. Finally, he shrugs before he says... The relationship ran its course. We were together until we weren't. She's not who I thought she was. She's really beautiful. My gut tells me there's more to the story. If she's not who he thought, something happened to change the way he saw her. You think so? Maybe she is on the outside, but when I think of beauty, she's not who I think about. I think about you and your wild, messy hair and how your cheeks turn pink when you're excited. I think about how beautiful you look when you laugh. Sometimes you laugh so hard, you snort, and that makes you laugh even harder. And you know what I love the most about you? You are the most honest and fearless person I know. You busted into my office and spilled your heart out. I can never get enough of that girl. No one else has ever or will ever come close. I sigh and cuddle closer to him. I reach up and softly kiss his cheek. And you're so sweet when you want to be, he says. When I want to be, I ask, a wide smile on my lips as I continue to kiss him. Mm-hmm. Underneath all that bluster, you're sweet. You are like your aunt and Sandy. You love hard, and you'll do anything for the people you care about. Come here, he says. He turns his head and captures my lips, leaving all thoughts of Victoria Palmer aside. He moves his body closer to mine as he deepens the kiss. No, I say as I pull away. I had onions on that burger. I hop off the bed and grab my bag. I need to shower and to brush my teeth first. He jumps off the bed and despite sleeping together for weeks, I'm still amazed by the sight of his erection. He holds his hand out to me. Let's go. Chapter 38 Luke Our eyes never break contact. We undress each other, 
her touch leaving goosebumps as her fingertips graze across my skin. Unable to bear her touch for another second without giving in to my desire to have her, I take her hand and lift it to my lips. With my eyes never leaving hers, I guide her into the huge shower. She stands to the corner, and when the shower starts to fill with steam, I pull her to my naked body, the water beating against the shower cap. I grab my shower gel, and we take turns washing each other, sharing kisses and soft touches. Soon I'm wrapping her in a huge towel. She steps out of the bathroom, telling me she's going to get ready. I give her some time as I dry off and debate whether I should put on underwear. In the end, I decide that it will only take a few seconds to take the damn underwear off. When I step inside the room, I notice she's dimmed the lights and is waiting for me on top of my bedspread. Unlike me, she's completely naked. By the time I take the few short steps to the bed, I'm already semi-hard. I stop short when I get a full look at her. What's this? I ask as I point to a small red bow resting right below her belly button. This is the Christmas gift I was going to give you. This, she says, pointing to her lower body, a pink blush on her cheeks. And this. She hands me a small bag. You're giving me your body, and... I reach inside the bag and pull out a small flat package. A package of birth control pills? It's my second package of birth control pills. She's now leaning on her side, watching me, presumably waiting for me to understand her gift. But all I do is scratch my head in confusion. Oh my God, seriously, Luke? I'm on the pill. Do you know what that means? Understanding dawns on me before I know it. I'm jumping on top of her and devouring her mouth, kissing her senseless. I leave her mouth and kiss my way down her neck to her breasts. I take each brown nipple in my mouth, sucking, biting, and pulling. The only sounds in the room are now her moans. I finally slide my hand between her legs to find her dripping wet. You know how you refer to me as barbarian? Well, I'm about to go really barbarian on your ass. Spread those legs. She spreads wide and I slide inside of her bare, filling her to the hilt. She calls out my name, and I nearly come inside of her, but I manage to get control of myself. Hold on to me. Things are about to get rough. Go for it, she says. Without ever breaking eye contact, I thrust into her over and over again, pulling out and filling her completely. I know she wants to lay her head down, but she refuses to look away. I lean down and bite her bottom lip, pulling and sucking it. Her wet pussy pulls me in, taking me deeper with each thrust. I love you, I say, barely able to hold on. She digs her nails into my shoulders. I love you too, she moans. I spill as soon as the words leave her mouth. She's right behind me, screaming, calling out my name and convulsing underneath me. Best Christmas present ever, I say as I collapse on her back. She moves from underneath me as I start to kiss the back of her neck, a spot I've recently discovered is very sensitive. You've got to let me rest, she moans, moving her hair out of her face. I laugh as I pull her into my arms. She's right. This is the fourth time I've had her tonight. The first time only lasted a few minutes, followed by her riding me. We took a break only for us to sixty-nine and get each other off with our mouths. This last time was of me taking her from the back. How about some food? I'm starving and it's barely ten o'clock. I'll cook. That did the trick because she's out of bed and puts on a pair of matronly button-down pajamas. Where did you get those things? I ask as I undo a few of the buttons. They're hideous. I'll be sure to tell my aunt you said that. She gave me these for Christmas. I love your aunt, but she must not realize how sexy you are. That gets a laugh out of her. I don't think she does. I take her hand, intertwine our fingers, and make the trek to the kitchen. Okay, apparently the housekeeper didn't shop this week. Do you feel like pizza or Chinese? I ask after standing in front of the near-empty fridge for several minutes. Pizza and wings. Chapter 39 Vivi It's hard to admit, but I've been a huge idiot. 
This weekend has been amazing, and to think it could have been that way months ago makes me angry at myself. But I can only move forward. He's like a heat source, and he sleeps like the dead because I've been lying on top of him for ten minutes, and he still hasn't budged. Despite being fully clothed, I can feel how hard he is. If he has it his way, he'll wake up and slide inside of me, as if he's been doing it for years. But we don't have time for that this morning. Taking matters into my own hands, I plant soft kisses on his neck. When his large hands find my ass, he starts to knead and gets harder. Good morning, I say, against his neck. You have on too many clothes, he groans. He starts to slide his hand inside my leggings, but I grab his hand. You know this love thing we have going? I think it's the best. I agree. Now let me show you how much I love you. When he starts to nibble on my neck, I almost give in. For self-preservation, I jump off his body. I promise that when we come back, we can spend the entire day in bed. But we have to go to Tasha's house for breakfast. She texted two hours ago, come on. To show him I mean it, I slap him on his bare ass. We've been in the car for ten minutes, and he hasn't let go of my hand. And that's not even the best part. The kisses I get every time he stops for a red light top the hand-holding. It was like this yesterday, too. I sigh in happiness at the thought of yesterday, the most perfect day of my life. I woke up alone in his massive bed, disoriented and sore from the night before. With no Luke in sight, I went in search of him downstairs, only to realize I was alone in the house. He walked in as I was texting him, carrying several bags of groceries. When I tried to help him with the bags, he ordered me to sit as he made us breakfast. This was followed by more lovemaking and another shower. When I mentioned going to campus to buy books, he insisted on driving me. When we ran into one of my friends in the bookstore, Luke walked away and paid for my books, which caused our first fight as a couple. The fight ended when he kissed me senseless right outside the bookstore. I'll buy you whatever the hell I want, whenever I want. Deal with it. He whispered against my lips. What are you smiling at? He asks, as he parks in front of Tasha's house. You? You're not what I thought at all. Well, what did you think? That you were a spoiled rich kid? Well, I kind of am, so you weren't wrong. He gets out, and before I can even get my door open, he's offering me his hand and helping me out of the car. Yes, but you're sweet and funny and kind and a good cook. You can thank my mom for that. She let me help her in the kitchen, despite all the messes I used to make. That's another thing. I assumed they let the servants do everything for them. But I've come to realize that his parents were very hands-on in every way, and they raised three amazing sons. So, I say as we walk to the house, hand in hand, we're going to tell everyone we're just friends, and I only invited you to breakfast because your parents are away, and I feel sorry for you. He stops walking, but when he sees the smile on my face, he pulls me into his arms. I was right about you, though. You're a huge pain in the ass. Before I can open my mouth to tell him he's right, the front door is yanked open, and Tosh lets out a shriek loud enough to wake the entire neighborhood. Get in here! She grabs Luke's hand and pulls us both inside, slamming the door behind us engulfing us both in a hug. Dee told me, but I had to see for myself. I didn't believe it until just now. She takes our coats and throws them in a closet. Chris, you were right. I owe you ten bucks. Chris steps out of the kitchen, holding a mixing bowl and a whisk. He looks at me and Luke, who now has an arm thrown casually across my shoulders. I want that ten bucks now. Go get it and put it in my pocket. I'm not cooking until you pay me. Tosh sighs, but pulls out ten bucks from her own pocket and puts it in Chris's. I'll just steal it back from him later, she whispers to us. We follow them back into the kitchen to find Sandy and Jake sitting at the table. Hello, family, Luke says as he kisses Sandy's cheek. Big brother? To Jake's annoyance, he kisses his cheek right before he swipes his mimosa 
finishing it in one gulp. And just so you all know, I have a girlfriend. He picks me up and plants a wet kiss on my mouth. Oh my God, I say, hiding my face in my hands. And this is the best part, everybody. We're in love. Everyone in the kitchen cheers. I hide my face in Luke's chest, but all he does is drag me to a chair and sit me on his lap. Can we talk about something else? Get used to it, Vivi. The Clark men are known for being embarrassing, Sandy says. How was Hawaii? I ask to change the subject. Thankfully, Tosh brings a tray of fresh mimosas and plain orange juice for Sandy. Sandy leans back against Jake, and he gives her a kiss on the forehead. It was amazing. We were only there for five days, but I loved every second of it. She pulls out her phone, and I scan through their pictures as Luke looks over my shoulder. Look at this, I say, as I find a video of Sandy dancing along with the luau dancers, swinging her hips fast from side to side. Go, D. My sister's hips don't lie, Tosh says. They sure don't. If she wasn't already pregnant, she would have gotten pregnant that night. Sandy turns her face, clearly mortified by Jake's words. Please, man, I'm about to eat, Chris says. He's lying, Sandy says, blushing. We didn't do anything. Jake turns his shocked gaze on Sandy. Yeah, we didn't do any one thing. We did every damn thing, baby. You could barely walk the next morning, remember? He pulls her closer and sticks his face in the side of her neck. And if you had danced like that with me the night we met, I would have married you that night. We already had a priest there. I'm going to need therapy, Chris says. See what I mean, Vivi? Be quiet, Jacob. You know Chris's mental health is fragile, Sandy says as she strokes Jake's cheek. And she kept wearing these tiny little shorts. I've never seen you wear shorts that short before, and you can't wear them again unless I'm there. I almost lost my mind with those shorts. The women laugh, but Chris scrunches his face as he whisks whatever's in his bowl. You know why you haven't seen them before? It's because Mama would never let us wear anything that short. One time, Dee decided she was going to wear some booty shorts, and one of the neighbors saw and told. Let's just say she will probably never wear booty shorts again if there's a chance that Mama can find out. Remind me to thank your mom. Those shorts are only for me. Um, Sandy can wear whatever she wants, whenever she wants, I say. Sandy reaches over and gives me a high five. Fine. Then she should be ready for the consequences, Jake says. And what consequences would those be? Sandy asks. Whatever your mom wants to do to you when I call and tell her. I love how everyone here acts like I'm the only one who's scared of her. Chapter 40 Luke Just like I thought, she blushes when she reads my text. The shy look I love so much finds me and I blow her a kiss. She blushes again but doesn't look away. She holds my stare and because she loves to torture me, she slowly glides her tongue against her lower lip. A line starts to form, and I get behind the last customer. Thankfully, no one gets behind me, and when it's my turn to put in my order, the bakery is empty. She looks at me, a small smile on her lips as she waits for me to speak. I've had enough coffee and baked goods, but I'll never get enough of her. I grab her by her shirt and kiss her before she can protest. She's putty in my hands as she surrenders to my kiss but she pulls away all too soon. You better sit down before my aunt comes back, she warns as she looks towards the back of the bakery. She loves me, I say back. One more hour and we can go. You know you don't have to sit here all morning, Luke. I open the bottle of water she handed me and take a slow sip. I like being with you, and it's your Christmas present, remember? A day of Luke and Vivi, I remind her. It's going to be great, she says. Steve should be here soon and then we can leave. More people come inside, so I return to my table. When Vivi proposed giving each other gifts that didn't cost money, I had dismissed it immediately. But then we broke up and I was too miserable to think of shopping. When she was wrapped around me the night of our reunion and told me what happened on Christmas Day, 
I knew she needed to be shown how special she is. You never told me about your actual Christmas day. I was so jealous of Jake and Sandy because they got to share part of the day with you. Well, she says, taking a deep breath. I cried all morning, but felt better by the time people started arriving at my aunt's house. Then my mother showed up. I hold my breath and wait for her to tell me more. I couldn't deal with her being there on top of everything else, so I walked out of the room. Sandy followed me, and we had a great talk. I told her about us and how I ruined everything, and she talked me through my fears. Anyway, when I went back to the living room, my aunt had already kicked my mother out, but she was still outside pacing. I let her back in, and she just stood there like a deer in headlights, staring at me. You know my aunt is blunt. She asked her point-blank why she was still there. She ignored her, but looked at me, muttered some bullshit about how she never knew. Never knew what? I asked once Vivi goes quiet on me. I had no idea, and since I wasn't in the mood for riddles, I told her she was free to leave, but she pulled me into the bathroom and closed the door. Did she hurt you? I ask. In my mind, I have a dozen different ways I'm going to make her pay. No, she's never laid a hand on me, but she burst into tears. Between her sobs, she told me she didn't know how to be a mother. Her own mother was never interested in her or her siblings, so she raised me the same way her mother had raised her. Are you shitting me? I ask, thinking of my own mother, who has been nothing but doting and attached to all three of us. What kind of excuse is that? I know. I became so angry. I lost it and told her to get out. And she doesn't get to make any excuses after treating me like shit for twenty-one years. She started to speak, but I didn't want to hear it. She got the message and left. I'm sorry. I feel her shrug against me. It is what it is. Do you know how it feels to grow up thinking your parents don't want you? It's hell. It messes with your head and your self-esteem. It makes you question everything you do. You blame yourself. Despite the therapy I've had, I still have moments where I think I'm the one who did something wrong that I'm just not good enough. And I believed her when she said she didn't know any better. That doesn't make me feel any better. If she thought that would get her sympathy, she was wrong. Steve's on his way, she says, breaking me out of my thoughts. A few minutes later, Steve walks in through the front door. He holds it open, and a woman in a long coat follows him inside. I've only seen her once before at my brother and Sandy's wedding but I know exactly who she is. I quickly turn my gaze towards Vivi, ready to stand between her and her mother, but her back is turned and she's unaware of the surprise visitor. Vivienne looks more like her aunt and Tosh than her own mother, but the freckles she has across the bridge of her nose are from her mom. Their hair is also identical. The woman is taller by a few inches, but she's just as thin, almost unnaturally so. She's also very young, she looks around, frantic. She spots Vivi and relaxes for a split second, but the anxiety returns almost immediately. I found her outside in the cold, Steve whispers to me. Hey, Viv, he says, walking away from me. Vivi turns at the sound of Steve's voice, the smile on her face fading away when she sees her mother standing there. She recovers quickly, though. Her smile returns and she addresses Steve. We're ready to go, so we'll leave once you wash up. Steve nods and jogs to the back of the bakery. The three of us stand there, no one saying a word. Vivi removes her apron, walks from behind the counter, and comes over to take my hand. I squeeze it before lifting it to my mouth, offering her support in the form of a kiss. I sense her relief when Steve comes back, ready to work. His aunt soon follows, walking a bit faster than normal. Okay, Vivi says. Let's go, Luke. Auntie, I will see you tomorrow, I hope. She gives her aunt a kiss, and she starts to pull me towards the back. Vivienne, her mother says, her voice firm but tentative. The husky voice is another thing Vivi has inherited from her mother. Rather than answer her mother, Vivi walks faster. Vivienne, she yells, running behind us. Vivi stops and spins around to face her mother. She still doesn't say a word to her, but looks her in the eye, waiting for her to speak. 
Mrs. Etienne is right behind us, her arms crossing her chest. Vivian's mother licks her lips, looking from me to her daughter. Now that she has Vivi's attention, she seems unsure of what to say. I'm Jocelyn, Vivian's mother, she says with a tinge of an accent, offering me her cheek instead of her hand. Like the gentleman my parents raised me to be, I bend down and give her a small kiss. I'm Luke Clark, I say. She nods and gives me a genuine smile. She's a beautiful woman with a wide smile and eyes the color of milk chocolate. Jacob's brother, she says, and I nod. Can I talk to my daughter? Vivian huffs at the request. I'm not you. I can speak for myself. I don't need permission from Luke to do anything. Jocelyn's head rolls back but doesn't respond directly to the sharp rebuke. Her lips thin out as she finally looks away from me towards her daughter. Can I talk to you, Vivienne? she asks. No, is all Vivi says. She turns and we walk to the back room. She hands me my coat and we quickly put them on. As she's putting on her hat, her mother walks into the room and speaks. I'm doing the therapy, she says. As Vivi adjusts the knit hat on top of her head, she addresses her mother, her voice hostile. Really? Like I suggested years ago? Did you run to your husband and tell him I'm trying to tell you you're crazy? Is he going to come here and accuse me of trying to break up his marriage? If you can call what you two have a marriage. My point is, I don't care. In case you haven't noticed, I'm out and I won't be back. Jocelyn, get out before I put you out, Mrs. Etienne says. She's my daughter, Gabrielle. You have two daughters. Do you need mine too? I take off my coat so I can be ready to break up the fight, but Vivi steps between her mother and aunt. She's the only mother I've ever known. Thank God for my aunt, she turns to me and says. Let's go, babe. I left him, her mother yells. Vivi falters to a stop at those words, but she doesn't address her mother again. She straightens her back as we walk out the back door. I'm going to talk about it with you, she says once I get behind the steering wheel. I really am but not right now. I've really been looking forward to today. I just want to get the hell out of here before she comes out. She reaches over and takes my hand. I don't think I would have been able to handle it like I just did if I didn't have you, Luke. She smiles at me, a smile filled with love and gratitude. As strong as she is, she's incredibly sensitive, I've come to realize. But she's so open. I never have to guess with her. Luke loves Vivi, I say. Vivi loves Luke, she says back. Chapter 41 Vivi Oh my God, I groan as I climb onto Luke's back. This must be what it feels like to be 90 years old. I can't see him, but I know he just rolled his eyes at me. He grabs the grocery bags and walks to the front door as if I weigh nothing, I can't believe you, Vivian, he says, trying to sound annoyed. I had a great time, though, I say, as we finally walk through the front door. The dogs come running, sniffing at us. Luke walks to the kitchen and sets the bags on the counter, all with me still on his back. Hey, you two, Sandy says. She's all dressed up in a short black dress with a bubble skirt. She dresses it up with her pink diamond necklace and earrings. You look hot, Dee. You have a date? I ask. I do, and it's with the most handsome guy. There he is now, she says, as Jake comes out, dressed in a navy blue suit, white shirt, and no tie. She runs her hands over the suit jacket. I'm not even going to ask why you're carrying your woman around, Jake says. Hey, I'm not his woman. That's sexist. I'm a woman? Who happens to be in a relationship with him? I say. Which makes you my woman, Luke says, as he reaches around and slaps me on the butt. And I'm carrying her because she fell about a hundred times today. When she said she wanted to go ice skating, I assumed she knew how. But she's never even been on ice skates before today. But I've always wanted to try it, and now I have. I want to go again soon. I loved it. This big hot guy held my hand all day and picked me up every time I fell. Not a bad way to spend the day, I tell everyone. 
Hey, remember when you two hated each other? Jake asks, but he put hate in air quotes. Anyway, time to go, baby. We don't want to be late to your boss's engagement party. After they leave, Luke walks me to the bedroom and sits me down on the bed. I'm going to draw you a hot bath. You relax while I make dinner. He helps me take off my boots and clothes. I can see the desire in his eyes as he looks at my breasts. Bathe with me. Dinner can wait. He licks his lips as he looks at my naked body. I grab his sweater and pull him to me. The bath can wait, too, I whisper as I kiss his lips. Bathing is overrated. This is the life, I whisper as I sit between his legs in the massive bathtub. He wraps his arms around me and pulls me close, planting a soft kiss on the side of my neck. My body is still tingling from our lovemaking. The kiss started out frenzied, but when he laid me down on the bed, something in him shifted. He became gentle, and he kissed every inch of me, bringing me to the edge of orgasm with his mouth. But he didn't let me come with his mouth. He climbed back on top of me, holding my gaze as he slid all the way inside of me. I love you, he said, as we both came at the same time. To overcome, I couldn't speak. It was minutes later, as he held me in his arms, that I was finally able to tell him that I loved him too. You sure you're okay? He asks me. I lean back into him. I know he's not asking me about being sore or the bruises from my falls. I'm here with you in post-orgasmic bliss. I'm great. I know he's unsatisfied with my answer when he says, You don't have to pretend, Vivi. I don't know how I feel other than it's too little, too late. I don't want anything to do with either of my parents. If she's getting help, great. She should focus on herself because I'm going to be okay. Yeah, you are. You're a fighter. Did she really tell your father you suggested she get therapy? I lean back into him as I ponder my next words. It was during the end of my freshman year in college. The counselor I was seeing thought my mother has deep-seated issues she needs to work through, and it's possible she's been suffering from depression for a long time. I was relieved to hear that because I finally had an answer for why she was the way she was, I went home and told her she should get help, and there's medication out there. My father walked in during our talk. Well, it wasn't an actual talk. It was me talking while she sat there like a mute. As soon as he came in, I stopped talking, and I went to my room. I don't know what happened, but a few hours later, he confronted me. He doesn't say anything, but I know he's thinking of what I just told him. He takes his time washing my body, and massaging my shoulders. A few hours later, he asks, breaking the silence. Mm-hmm, I say, enjoying his hands on me. So, did she tell him? Or did he browbeat her into telling him what you two were talking about? Is it possible he overheard and confronted her first, and maybe you believe she betrayed you? I mull his words over. At the time... I was so angry and hurt, I never considered any other scenario, I admit. But it doesn't matter. That was one incident in 21 years of incidents. The control, the verbal abuse, making me feel like I was nothing, that I was unwanted. She stood there and let it all happen. Would your mother have let your father treat you or your brothers that way? I ask him. Chapter 42 Luke Never, I admit. Exactly. Mine was there and never did a thing. Hmm. Is all I can say as I continue to rub. Did your mother ever verbally abuse you herself? No, she never did. She just stood by and let it happen. What about other things when you were growing up? Who helped you with your homework or helped you get ready for school? Gave you a bath? Bought your school clothes? Packed your lunch? Made your dinner? Things like that. I ask as gently as possible. First off, Lucas, I never needed help with my homework, okay? 
she teases. I release a breath I didn't realize I was holding at her playful tone. And my mother did those things, I guess. And she did those things consistently? She tenses at the last question, and I hold my breath again as I lower my hands and caress her breasts. I'm rewarded with a moan and the loosening of her body. Yes, she admits. Listen, Vivi, I'm sorry you grew up that way, but I'm so glad you're sharing with me. I agree with you that she stood by and did nothing about your asshole father. I'd be angry, too. But it sounds like she's as much of a victim as you are. This time she bristles and tries to move away from me, but I hold on to her. Not the same, Lucas. I had no choice. She did. Her voice is as tight as her body right now. She crosses her arms across her breasts, denying me access. Yes, but maybe she didn't feel like she had a choice either. I'm not going to pretend I understand, but maybe she suffered too. She's still suffering. I pull her body back to mine. I'm on your side. Always. No questions asked. I didn't grow up with a sister, but one thing I learned from Tracy over the years is how complicated the mother-daughter relationship can be. Her mom had substance abuse issues and died when Tracy was still a teenager. But your mom is still here. I'm not saying you two will be best friends, but she's reaching out. Listening to her can only help you. Maybe you can form a relationship, or maybe you'll realize you can never have one. But either way, you'll have some closure. That's all I want. Please don't be mad at me. She doesn't speak for several minutes, but she doesn't try to leave the tub either. The water cools, but she stays in my arms. I sneak a peek at her face and her cheeks are pink, a clear sign that she's irritated. I'm not mad at you. I'm just not in a place where I can talk to her. Not right now. I like our bubble. She pushes away from me and stands up, splashing water on the floor as she steps out of the tub. She yanks the towel from the rack and quickly ties it around her body before walking out of the bathroom, slamming the door behind her. I'm right behind her and still wrapping my towel around my waist when I walk into her bedroom. Drops of water from my hair and chest fall on the plush carpet beneath my feet. So much for you not being mad, I say. I'm not mad, she yells, jerking her drawers open. She pulls out some clothes and storms back to the bathroom. I catch the door before it shuts in my face. You seem pretty mad to me, I say as calmly as I can. She ignores me as she takes off her towel, revealing her naked body. I have no time to admire her physique as she angrily tugs on her underwear and puts on her bra. I take her hand as she's reaching for her sweater. Hey, I say, turning her around to face me. Luke loves Vivi. The fight goes out of her immediately. She looks at me, eyes filled with tears before she wraps her arms around me, holding me close. Vivi loves Luke, she says. I'm not mad at you. I don't want to talk about her. Today was supposed to be about us. I don't want to give her the satisfaction of ruining it. She didn't ruin anything. Today has been perfect. I'll say one last thing, and then I want to get back to our bubble. I know she has some mental health issues. I've known that for a while, but I never considered the other things she did. I always focused on what she didn't do. And yes, she took care of me physically, but what I needed most was emotional support. I needed my mother's love. I needed comfort. I wanted her to fight for me, defend me. I needed her to hug me after a nightmare or a bad day. She pulls back and looks at me. Her eyes sad. Tears pool and fall down her pink cheeks. She never did. I reach over and wipe them, pulling her to me again. I don't know what it's like not to have those things. I'm sorry if I said the wrong thing. I kissed the top of her head. You didn't. I know what you're doing, and I love you for it. She pulls away again and pulls the sweater over her head. Enough of this. You promised me dinner, and I'm starving. And by the way, I want to go ice skating again. I throw my head back and pretend to groan. What? I loved it. I really want to go back, she says. Okay, but I'm getting you lessons because I can't keep watching you fall every few minutes. No arguments. 
I wait for her to argue and say she can pay for her own lessons, but she surprises me by jumping into my arms, wrapping both legs around me and kissing me deeply. Thank you. I've always wanted to learn. I want to give you everything you've ever wanted, I whisper against her ear. I pull away and lock into her clear brown eyes. Everything. I have the one thing I want. The one thing I didn't know I needed. I have you. Chapter 43 Luke Mrs. Etienne frowns briefly as she escorts a couple into one of her tasting rooms, but the other woman sitting in the bakery doesn't flinch. A lesser woman would have shriveled under the mean glare, but she simply smiles at me as she sips her coffee, the coffee that she ordered from her daughter an hour ago. I held my breath when she stood in line and ordered, but Vivi treated her like any other customer. Unlike other customers, she's been sitting here watching me and her daughter for far too long. I look at my watch, anxious for Steve to get here so we can leave. Something is brewing, and I don't want Vivi to explode at her mother today. I want us to walk out of here, go to her first ice skating lesson, and get on with the rest of our day. We've made Saturdays our day. We spend the entire day together doing whatever. Today's a full day with lunch, ice skating, dinner with her friend Terry Ann, and a nightclub. I don't care for nightclubs, but Vivi wants to go. Her mother smiles at me again. It's a sad but genuine smile, which I return. Her smile widens at my gesture and tears fill her eyes. She quickly brushes them away and looks at Vivi again. The line has gotten extremely long and I see Vivi struggle to keep up. She waves me over. Help me. I'll fill the orders and you ring them up, she whispers. Mrs. Etienne has a strict rule about only family working at the bakery, but I sneak and try to help Vivi from time to time. For the next half hour, we work together side by side. When the bakery clears, we both sigh in relief. Throughout all of it, her mother watches. Go back to your seat before Auntie sees you. She pushes me, but before I can get out from behind the counter, the front door opens and my entire family walks in. This is the first time I'm seeing my parents since I left Arizona. They ended up staying with my cousin Eugene for an extra week and arrived home late last night. Are the Clarks traveling in packs now? I ask. Travis sees me and runs into my arms. Cookie, he yells. Soon, thanks to Vivi, he has a cookie in each hand. I've missed my baby, my mother says, hugging me despite having Travis in my arms. She gets on her toes and kisses my cheek repeatedly. Creator, come and get your wife, I say to my dad. She's embarrassing me in front of my girl. Mom leaves me and runs to Vivi, taking her in her arms. So, the rumor is true, she says. Vivi has turned completely red at this point, but my mom is oblivious. I knew it. Can I get you guys anything? Vivi asks. Dad insisted on the entire family getting together for lunch. That's what he says, but he's only being nosy, Troy says, getting a snicker from Jake. Oh, Vivi says, turning redder. I catch Sandy's eye and nod towards Jocelyn. Sandy loudly gasps when she sees her, but doesn't say anything. Jake follows his wife's gaze and visibly cringes. We have plans today, I say, to put them off. You already plan on having lunch before Vivi goes to her ice skating lesson, my dad says. We have a room reserved at one of your uncle's restaurants. He and Terry will be joining us. How do you know our plans, creator? Are you psychic? Remember when I was dating Sandy and you were a mean little bitch? Jake asks. Payback. This is why Troy is my favorite brother, I tell him. Travis starts to wiggle, and I put him down. The little bugger runs to Vivi, and she gives him another cookie. Tracy grabs him, warning him about spoiling his lunch. It was Troy's idea. Come on, you know how the old man is when he gets something in his head, Jake says. I've missed my family, Dad says. You protested a little bit too much when we hired Vivi here. You protested? Sandy says. You have a problem with my cousin. Obviously not anymore, since I'm in love with your cousin, Sandy. You want to go to lunch, sunshine? Jake and Troy snicker at the nickname, but the women swoon. Vivi hides her face in my chest. Sunshine, Jake taunts. Um, yes? You call your wife every nickname out there, and I can't call my girlfriend Sunshine. I turn to look at Sandy and decide to goad my brother. You hungry, gorgeous? Jake's eyes turn into slits as everyone else chuckles. You want to sit down, princess? Tracy says. 
Jake looks at her, surprised at her audacity, but the situation is diffused when everyone starts to laugh. How's my baby, baby? Vivi says, rubbing Sandy's body while affecting her best Jake impersonation. This is why I love this girl, I say to the room. We'll wait for your shift to be over, sunshine, my dad says. Lukey, come sit down and let Sonny work. We put a few tables together and fuck with Troy and Tracy. I get cake for Emma and Tristan while they're distracted with Rosie. Steve arrives at the same time Mrs. Etienne escorts out the bride and groom. She eyes Vivi's mother again, but puts on a smile for my family. Josh and Leo, I need to talk to you about the men in your family, she says as she approaches. Oh, what about them? My dad asks. They are taking the women in my family one by one. Well, my dad says with a smirk, maybe it's not the men in my family, maybe it's the women in yours. You better watch out. I have a few cousins your age who are single. Mrs. Etienne waves my dad off as everyone laughs. Not possible. I gave up on that a long time ago. First, I watched this one chase my daughter, she says, pointing at Jake. And now I get to do it again. Vivi, you go. I will work the register while Steve washes up. She kisses Vivi and the rest of the family. But when she gets to Sandy, she caresses her face and wraps her arms around her daughter. Let's get this lunch over with, sunshine, I whisper in Vivi's ear. Hello. We all turn around at the voice that is eerily similar to Vivi's. I'm Vivienne's mother, Jocelyn Chateau. An awkward silence falls over the bakery. I'm not sure what my family knows, but it's obvious from the stunned expressions that they know something. They recover quickly because, in an instant, they are shaking her hand one by one. Everyone except Sandy and Jake. We remember you from the wedding, my mother says, looking from Jocelyn to Vivi with the fakest smile I've ever seen on her face. Yes, I wish we had an opportunity to talk more, but I understand you were parents of the groom. Everyone remains quiet after that last statement, unsure of what to say. Uh, we're going to lunch. You're welcome to join us, Jocelyn, Dad says. No, Vivi says loudly. Everyone turns to look at her, but I don't miss Jocelyn's shoulders sagging in defeat. The hurt in her eyes only lasts a second before she forces a smile. Jocelyn was just leaving, Vivi says. I'm Mom to you, not Jocelyn. That will never change. She turns from Vivi after delivering that rebuke. It will never change? Vivi asks. Well, I guess if giving birth makes you a mother, then you're right. Vivi, Sandy says. The entire room goes quiet after that. I reach for her hand underneath the table, but I can't stop looking at her mother. She doesn't shrink under Vivi's words. She stands taller and squares her shoulders. Thank you, but I can't today. Hopefully we can do it another time. I would really like to get to know the family of my daughter's boyfriend. Please. The last word comes out rushed and desperate. That's all it took for my mother to drop her fake smile and replace it with empathy. Offering her the comfort of a friend, she puts an arm around Jocelyn and walks her to the other side of the bakery, where they have a silent conversation for a few minutes. Are you kidding me? Vivi scoffs. She starts to walk over to our mothers, but I pull her back. Luckily, their conversation doesn't last very long. I will see you soon, Vivienne. Sandra and Jacob, it was nice to see you too. Thanks for taking care of my daughter. She's out the door before anyone can respond. Chapter 44 Luke She's already waiting for me when I get to the restaurant. She looks sad but resolute as she stands against the wall. She starts to look around and smiles in relief when she sees me. She walks towards me immediately, reaching me in a few quick steps. Like she did at the bakery, she offers me her cheek. That's not enough this time because she takes both of my hands in hers and surprises me with her strength by pulling me into a tight hug. I'm so happy you're here. I was scared you would not come. I smile nervously, and when the hostess tells us to follow her, I'm relieved to get a break from Jocelyn Chateau's intensity. Why am I here? I ask as I take a seat at the table, borrowing a page out of Mrs. Etienne's book and getting right to the point. And how did you get my cell phone number, Mrs. Chateau? Your calls and texts have got to stop. I'm desperate, Lucas. I got your phone number from Steve. Please don't be mad at him. 
He's the only one in the family who doesn't see me as a monster. I can tell she's nervous as her accent gets more pronounced. Fucking Steve. For someone who changes women as often as he changes underwear, he sure caved to the pressures of just one. I can tell you are a nice boy, Lucas. I watched you at the bakery. I know you care for my daughter. Your entire family does, and I'm so grateful. I'm going to stop you right there. I love you, daughter. Are you trying to manipulate me, Mrs. Chateau? I accuse. No, never. She takes a slow sip of her water. The waitress comes and asks for our order. I had planned on picking the first thing on the menu so that this lunch could end, but Mrs. Chateau asks for a few minutes. I'm not the monster everyone thinks I am. Oh, really? Then why does your daughter feel abandoned by both her parents? Why was she living with my brother and Sandy for two months before you showed up? Why did she tell me you were never there for her to stand up to her father on her behalf? Why does she feel unloved by you? All of that sounds pretty monstrous to me. I flag the waitress and order the first chicken entree on the menu. Mrs. Chateau orders the same. All that is true. I will make no excuses. But I was sick, Lucas. I didn't even know I was sick until Vivi left. It got so bad I thought of ending it all. She's the only reason why I didn't go through with it. I channeled my daughter's strength. I'm seeing a psychiatrist now. I'm on medication. I just want a chance with my daughter so I can earn a place in her life. She reaches across the table and grabs my hands. I know you love her, and I'm so grateful to you, Gabrielle, and her girls. Maybe you can convince her to talk to me. Her words are like a punch to my gut. I knew she had issues, but the degree surprised me. Vivi would have been devastated, and it's that thought that forces me to squeeze Mrs. Chateau's hands, offering her solace. She smiles wide at the same time her eyes fill with tears. She only lets go of my hands to grab her napkin, her hand trembling as she wipes her tears. I'm happy you're getting help, Mrs. Chateau, but I can't force Vivi to do anything. She knows her own mind, but I think the fact that you're... A shadow falls across the table. We both look up expecting to see the waitress, but find Vivi instead. I pull my hand from Mrs. Chateau's and stand up immediately, nervous at the angry look on Vivi's face. Really, Lucas? My mother? I thought you were here with that bitch ex-girlfriend of yours. But I find you here with her? She asks, pointing in the direction of her mother. I start to speak, but she interrupts me. Oh, my God. Is this who you were texting last night? These are the weird calls you've been getting? I quickly pull out another chair and point for her to sit, but she remains standing. Yes, she's been calling. Wait, why the hell are you bringing up Tori? Do you think I would go behind your back and meet with her? What the hell, Vivienne? I saw you come in here. I was going to bring you lunch, but since I saw you, I figured you were going to surprise me, so I left. Then I saw her name on the visitor sign-in sheets, and you never came back with lunch. What the hell was I supposed to think when I saw her name? She turns her attention back to her mother. I want you to leave us alone, Jocelyn. Her face turns red, just like her daughter's. I know she's going to offer a rebuke for being called by her first name, but I speak first. Let's get one thing straight. I would never, ever do that. Ever. And I want to help, which is why I'm here. She turns an incredulous look on me. I know that look. It's one second away from the look of betrayal. I grab her hand and kiss it several times. Let's have some lunch and talk. She's not going away, and you owe it to yourself to listen. You can't really make any informed decisions if you don't have all the information. If you still want to walk away, we're out of here. But I think you should sit down, share a meal, and listen. Mrs. Chateau is watching, and I can tell she's holding her breath, waiting for Vivi to decide. She still hasn't taken a seat, but we both breathe with relief when she says, Well, you have to call and ask Colleen to stay at the front desk. I told her I was coming right back. She finally sits down, but she crosses her arms across her chest, as I make the quick phone call to the office. I'll set it work. 
Let's get you a burger, okay? She nods, and I flag down the waitress to ask for a cheeseburger with extra bacon and sweet potato fries. After I place the order, I pry her arms from across her chest, intertwine our fingers together, and kiss the top of her hand. Our classes. Fine, she says before turning back to her mother, waiting for her to speak. I'm sorry you've been dragged into this mess, Luke. I wish you had told me she was calling you. I don't want this to become your problem. I'm here for you, always. Holding on to Vivi's hand, I turn to her mother as well as we all wait. Mrs. Chateau clears her throat and begins, <clears throat> Well, she says, voice trembling, I was telling Lucas that things got really bad for me after you left. I fell into a deep depression, and I didn't know how I was going to get out. I decided one day I was just going to give up. Vivi's hand goes limp in mine. She opens her mouth a fraction and takes a deep breath before turning to face her mother. I thought of you, and how strong you are, and I told myself maybe you got just a drop of that strength from me. I went to the hospital immediately. I was admitted and met this wonderful therapist, Dr. Rudeman. Vivian, I never realized I was sick before that. I thought I was just sad. I was stuck in an unhappy marriage, and I didn't know how to be a mother. I felt like a failure, and I didn't realize I was clinically depressed. I heard the words before, but didn't know the meaning. I had no joy in anything. I couldn't sleep. I didn't taste food when I ate. I didn't want to do anything. It was a struggle to get up and go to work every day. She finally stops speaking when the waitress brings our food. She uses that as an opportunity to grab Vivi's hand, and to my relief, Vivi doesn't pull away. I'm not making any excuses, but I have a real condition. I know that's no comfort to you when you needed a mother, but I want you to know I did what I could. I'm the one who pushed for you to go to your aunt's every summer, and he never covered your college tuition. Whatever financial aid didn't cover came from me, but he took credit. I went to the school to pay your bill for this semester, but when I got there, I was told you had a zero balance. She puts Vivian's hand to her face. I want you to know that I've always loved you. I didn't know how to show it. No one other than you has ever loved me. My own parents didn't, or they didn't know how to show affection. My father died early. And I think my mother was depressed, too. And I turned around and did the same to you. I'm learning a lot about myself in therapy, Vivienne. I married your father because I needed a green card. I came here with a student visa, and there was nothing left for me in Haiti. Your father is eighteen years older. I learned that I held on to him because I was looking for a father figure. I was so confused. I never had an idea of what a healthy marriage looked like. I was young and stupid, and I let him make all the rules. I know how that has affected you, and I'm so sorry. I failed you. I know that. And I have to live with it every day. But I'm begging you for a chance. Neither one of us has touched our food. I can see Vivi's eyes have glistened. I don't know if it's from sadness for her mother or rage. A chance for what? she asks. To get to know each other. To have a relationship. I'm going to continue with the therapy. It saved my life. I'm going to keep taking the medication. Maybe one day we can go to therapy together. I want to be your friend. I have an apartment. She fumbles around in her purse and pulls out her phone. She hands me the phone and Vivi and I look through the photos together. I have a bedroom for you. Why did you let him have the house? Vivi asks. You're just going to let him keep it? No. I have a lawyer and I want to sell the house. I don't ever want to go back there. There is nothing but sadness and misery in that house. Moving out has been good for both of us. When we sell it, I can buy something. But for now, I love my apartment. Maybe you and Lucas can come over this weekend. 
I could cook for you, she says, desperately looking between me and Vivi. I'm not going back to live with you, Vivi says. It's your home, whether you live there or not. And Lucas is welcome any time, too. He can sleep over. I know you're an adult, so I won't treat you like a child. She reaches over and strokes Vivi's hair with her free hand. And I know Gabrielle is old-fashioned and would never let him sleep over. I let out a loud laugh at the table, and Vivi giggles, which causes her mom to laugh and cry at the same time. You got that right, Mrs. Chateau. I can't even so much as get a little kiss when she's around. Jocelyn Lucas. Or you can call me Jojo. Call me Luke. She smiles again. The table is silent as we eat. Vivi picks at her fries as she stares straight ahead, but she hasn't pulled her hand from her mother's. Why didn't you let anyone in the family know you were in the hospital? How could you have not told me? Vivi asks. I was in a bad place and didn't want you to see me like that. I had failed you so much, and I didn't want you to feel obligated to take care of me. I wanted to come to you when I was healthy, so I can explain. I refused to see your father. He didn't know where I was for days. I haven't seen him since I went into the hospital. Vivi nods silently, absent-mindedly eating her fries. Jojo finally lets go of her daughter's hand to cut her chicken. Minutes later, Vivi pushes her plate away, her burger mostly uneaten. Unsatisfied with my meal, I reach over and take her unfinished burger. You have a big appetite, Jojo says when the waitress brings the check. Maybe you two can come to see the apartment. I will cook. Vivi doesn't say anything, and Jojo's smile falters. Can you cook like Mrs. Etienne? I ask. I can't bake like her, but I can cook. Maybe even better. You be the judge. She smiles at me again, and because Vivi has gone stoic, I smile back. When I pull out my wallet, Jojo quickly hands the waitress her credit card. I invited you. Let me pay. You know what I think? I think this lunch wasn't long enough for us to talk. Maybe we can do it again over that dinner you promised. Chapter 45 Vivi You've got to let me finish, I say to my boyfriend. He completely ignores my protest. Our position is ridiculous. We're in the middle of his bed. He's sitting, and I'm straddling him as I try to read the problem set for my economics class over his shoulder. Instead of letting me study, he slides his hand underneath my skirt, which is bunched up and is now practically at my waist. He squeezes my ass with one of his giant hands at the same time he bites the side of my neck, sucking lightly. You better not leave a mark on my neck, Lucas. Or what? Are you going to spank me? He squeezes my ass again and bites down harder on my neck. I think I might like a spanking from you, he says, against my neck. His hands leave my ass and find their way into my hair. He turns my head and, without any warning, kisses me, cradling the back of my neck as he deepens the kiss. I moan into his mouth. Economics is forgotten as I drop the problem set on the floor and grind on top of him. He pulls my sweater to the side, pushes my bra out of the way, and sucks a nipple into his mouth. I have a situation here, sunshine, he says, pointing at the tent in his pants. I'll help you study afterward. My response is to slide my hand inside his sweatpants and pull out his throbbing member. I run my thumb over the slit, and I'm rewarded with moisture. To tease him, I lick my thumb while looking into his eyes, which have now turned a dark green. That's a pretty big situation, Lucas. I don't know if I can handle something of that magnitude. With just one arm and hardly any effort, he lifts me and pushes my panties to the side, before sliding two fingers inside my slick folds. I spread my legs wider and throw my head back, giving him total control. He aligns his cock with my opening, and I slide down, letting him fill me completely. Oh, my God, I moan. And you'd rather study, he says, before capturing my mouth again.
Why might the government want to intervene in the market? Give three examples and explain the rationale for each. I have no freaking idea. You're much better at this than I ever was. We're still in his bed as I work on the last question on my problem set. The only difference now is that he's naked while I'm wearing his T-shirt and nothing else. I'm spread out across his stomach as I type on my laptop. You're supposed to be helping me, I whine. My whine soon turns to a moan as he traces his fingertips across my bare ass. He continues to touch me as I type out the answer to the final question and slam my laptop shut. I can feel how hard he is against my stomach as I'm sprawled across his chiseled body. Looks like someone's wet again, he says, before sliding a finger inside my moist flesh. I climb on top of him and start to kiss his broad chest. As amazing as his entire body is, his chest is my absolute favorite. It's hairless, with the smoothest skin I've ever touched. I kiss my way up to his mouth, and after kissing him deeply, I start to kiss my way down his body, eager to put something else in my mouth. Halfway there, both of our phones vibrate at the same time. I've lost my lady boner, I say, knowing exactly who just texted. I roll off his body. Since our lunch, my mother has started to text me regularly, but sometimes when I don't respond, she will text us both. He grabs both our phones, tosses me mine, before pulling me back on top of him. He places a possessive hand on my butt to hold me in place as he reads the text. She wants to confirm we're coming tomorrow. I figured. I try to roll off his body, but he tightens his hold. I'm going to text back that we'll be there at seven. He starts to text, and I reach over to snatch the phone, but he dodges my hand. You said you would go. I know, I know, I say, testier than I intended. I can go alone. I never intended to drag you into my mess. Or we can do something else like stay home and watch John Wick. Or go to the dentist. Give Zeus a bath. Or polish your mom's china. Anything would be more fun. It's not a mess. And I want to be there for you. I try to roll off him again, but he holds me in place. Talk to me. Resigned, I make myself comfortable on top of him and trace my hand along the side of his body. It's just that it doesn't take 21 years of neglect away. In my head, I understand she was sick. I believe everything she told me, and I want her to get better. But it doesn't erase my feelings of abandonment. It doesn't take away 21 years of thinking my mother didn't love me. On top of that, I feel guilty and selfish for even having these feelings. I want to be able to just hug and forgive her, but it's hard, Luke. I'm sorry she pulled you into this, and I'm embarrassed that you see what messed up bullshit I come from when you have this perfect family. I'm so jealous of your family. I hide my face in the crook of his neck as he glides his fingertips up and down my spine. In all the years we've known and feuded with each other, I never thought I'd see the day that Lucas Clark would become my lover and best friend. All reasonable feelings to have, love, he says. I nearly swoon at the endearment, the one he uses when it's just us. You just found out these things. You have to process them. But you're willing to try. I'm proud of you. He places a kiss on my forehead while he wraps both arms around me. And it hurt me when she said she was at a point where she wanted to end it all. I'd never have forgiven myself if she hurt herself. I don't know what to do, and I hate that. He's quiet for several minutes, but I know he's thinking and processing my words. You know what to do. You're just scared. But you don't have to be. I'll be there with you. I want to get to know her. I want to give her a chance. I'd love to have a relationship with my mom, like what Sandy and Tosh have, or what you have with Lil. But part of me wants to punish her, too. I know I can't, because I don't want to be that petty or vindictive. The only sound I hear is the beating of his heart as I wait for him to speak. He's quiet for several more minutes as he glides his fingers along my spine. 
Here's what I think. I don't think there is a right or wrong way for you to feel. I think all of your feelings are valid. The important thing is that you have an opportunity. You don't want to look back years from now and realize you chose bitterness instead of forgiveness. And don't forget, you still have the chance to address your feelings to her in front of her therapist. I think you should take her up on the offer to go to therapy and tell her exactly what you told me. Get it off your chest. Yell at her if you want. It will be ugly and painful, but then you can really start to form a relationship. If you keep those things inside, they will fester. The girl in my arms won't let her feelings fester and rot from the inside out. She's brave, she's a fighter, and more importantly, she's honest. That's what I think. We're quiet again as I absorb his words. I want to be the woman he just described, but the only way I can be that person is to face my mother and tell her my thoughts and fears. Who ever thought there would be a day when Lucas Michael Clark would be my best friend. Okay, I'm going in with an open mind. I want a relationship with her. I've really missed having a mom, and as much as I love my aunt, it's not the same. I know. You can have it, though. It will take some work, but it's possible. Hop on, Luke says. I'm going to do a lot of eating, so I need this. I climb on his back, and he jogs a few steps to the front door. She lives on a quiet, tree-lined street in a white triplex. By the time he walks up the few steps to the front door, she's already pulled the door open. She's anxious, and I observe her expel a breath when she sees us. It's not just happiness at seeing us. It's more like relief. I slide down Luke's back and she pulls me into a hug before letting me go and hugging Luke. I'm so glad you two are here. I've been thinking about this all day. We follow her to the second floor into her apartment. I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't this. Our old house was filled with so much big, dark furniture, you could hardly take a few steps without bumping into something. This is furnished, but the furniture is inviting and light. There's a neutral colored sectional in the middle of the living room. The kitchen has a white round table with four chairs and a vase of yellow roses on top. There's tasteful art hanging on the walls, along with a few school photos of me as a kid. I hope you two are hungry. I've been cooking all day. I make the salmon for you, Vivian, and I make steak too because I didn't know if Lucas likes the fish. I have meatballs and crab cakes. Oh, and I have cheese and crackers. Are you thirsty? She speaks fast, not giving us time to respond to her words. Sit, sit. We both take off our coats and hand them to her. Luke sits and pulls me down next to him, his arm holding me close. Stand, she says abruptly. I'm so rude. Let me give you a tour. We stand, and she shows us the master bedroom and the second room, which she says is for me. There's a queen-sized four-poster bed and a dresser, I have something to make a canopy, but I will need help. You can come and stay whenever you want. Lucas, you want wine? She rambles some more as she shows off the rest of the house, nervously looking back to gauge our reaction along the way. What do you think? She asks, swinging her arms in a way I've never seen before. It's nice. I managed to squeak out. I got the furniture for your room because it was on sale, but figured you can decorate it any way you want. Maybe we can go shopping? She briskly walks away to the kitchen. She opens the refrigerator door, but makes no attempt to get anything. She runs her hand through her hair several times before laying a hand on her hip. After about a minute of staring at the fridge, she snaps her fingers, reaches inside, and grabs two bottles of water. You don't want to take this one shopping. I say, pointing at Luke. He never checks prices and doesn't know the meaning of the word budget. What's a budget? Luke asks, shrugging his shoulders. Mom smiles at us. I do have a question. You have this nice apartment and beautiful furniture. How can you afford it? He controlled the money. She pulls out a bottle of white wine from the fridge and without asking us if we want any, pours two glasses and hands them to us. 
When I go to pour her a glass, she tells me she can't mix alcohol with her medication, so I put the wine down. When I got my first job as an accountant, she explains, I had this mentor. She was going through a nasty divorce, and instead of training me, she would tell me everything she was going through. She gave me a piece of advice. She said, You're an accountant, Jocelyn. You're smart. You don't need me to teach you this crap. Call me your fairy godmother because I'm going to show you how to hide the money. Women have to help other women out. She showed me, and I took her advice. Your father has a big mouth, but he is a small man. He has a small mind, and maybe that's why he's the way he is. I'm not rich, but I have money. If anyone should be worried about money, it's him. Taken aback at her words, I remain quiet, unsure of what to say. But a part of me wishes this woman standing here had been my mother all along. That thought brings all the anger back to the surface. If she could figure out a way to hide money, why couldn't she figure out a way to be a mother? Come, have appetizers. You two go ahead. I'm going to look around. She nods at me as she takes Luke's hand to pull him into the kitchen. I can hear their voices in the background. My mother laughs as Luke compliments her on her cooking. His voice is muffled, and I imagine him stuffing his face with meatballs. I walk to the back of the apartment, trying to figure out who the hell this woman is. My heart still aches for what could have been. I approach a set of French doors and open to my mother's home office. It's a small space with a desk and two monitors. Above her desk is a shelf with a picture of me and her. I have no memory of that picture, and I look to be about three. My mother is crouching down, looking down at me as I look up at her. She's doing something I never saw her do as a child. She's smiling adoringly at me. I pick up the picture and trace my finger along her smiling face when I hear someone walk in. She's standing in the room, looking at what I'm holding, and her eyes fill with tears. I have something for you. She pulls something out of her pocket and hands it to me. I told you, this is your home. I want you to have the keys. You can come and go as you please, Vivian. I look at the two keys in my palm, my vision gone completely blurry. I hand my mother the picture and run out of the room and into the bathroom, passing Luke, who is holding a platter of meatballs. I lean against the closed door, only to have it pushed open. Neither one of us speaks for several minutes, but when she finally reaches for both of my hands, the tears start to fall. She pulls me to her, and for the first time, I let my mother hold me as we both weep. I'm sorry, she says to me over and over again. I believe you, I say, when I finally get myself under control. I believe you're sorry. I believe you were sick, and I believe you love me. But none of that takes away the hurt. The fact that you're sorry doesn't change the past. You knew to hide money but not to be a mother? That was easy. Hiding money took no effort because I was a robot. Anything that required human emotion, I couldn't do. And I can never go back. But all I ask is a chance to be your mother now. Please. I'm so much better. I'm going to make it up to you. I can't give you back all those years. But I can feel the years ahead with so much if you let me. Please, let me. She kisses my forehead. More tears fall. Unable to speak, I nod, and she starts to cry again as she takes me in her arms. I don't deserve you, she says. I have some things to say, so I think your idea of going to therapy together is good. But I'm not ready yet. Soon, but not yet. Whenever you are ready. When she doesn't let go for several minutes, I say, We better go before Luke eats everything. We step out of the bathroom hand in hand and almost collide with Luke and his platter of meatballs. He puts it down as soon as he sees us. Everything good, love? He asks. I think they will be. I tell him. Group hug, he says, 
as he takes both me and my mother into his arms. Do you want more steak or salmon, Lucas? My mother asks. Yes and yes, Jojo, Luke says, patting his stomach. This has been amazing. It has, and not just the food. Once the tension died down, we had a good conversation. She surprised me by revealing she's been taking yoga and loves it. You two are a cute couple, my mother says, handing Luke another plate full of food. Did you start to like each other around the time of the wedding? I throw my head back and laugh so hard I snort. Luke chokes on his laughter between bites of food, and my mother looks confused. No, she hated me, Jojo. We take turns telling my mother the ways we tortured each other, and she laughs at every story. What do you like about my daughter, Lucas? So many things. First, she's beautiful, and she doesn't even know it. She's strong and fierce and honest. I never have to worry about where I stand with her. She's so damn smart and good with numbers. She has a big heart, he says, looking directly at me. I'm so happy about you two. I was worried that Vivian might not want a relationship, so I'm glad she has you. I hope we can all be good friends. I hope so, too. The best part is, I don't have to be scared of my girl's mom, like Jake is. She's intimidating, but she's a good person, very loving, extremely loyal. It wasn't easy on her raising two girls by herself, my mother says, in defense of Aunt Gabrielle. And she spoils Jake and Chris, I say. She makes them special meals, gives them the high-end rum, while the rest of us get the lower-end stuff. She'll invite us all to dinner, but Jake and Chris get a whole separate meal, which they lord over us. That sounds like her, my mother says. That means she loves her sons-in-law. Trust me, if she didn't love them, you would know. Mom leaves the table and walks out, but comes back in a few minutes with something in her hand. For you, Lucas. It's a bottle of rum, like the one Jake has. Luke jumps up, hugs my mom so tight he lifts her off the ground. Love, Jake and Sandy won't be able to compete with us, Luke says. Chapter 46, Luke Tell me about your childhood, she says to me as we lay in my bed at home. We're both naked, wrapped around each other, her hand caressing my hip every tooth. Her hand caressing my hip every few seconds. I want to hear about a happy childhood. Her words make my heart ache for the unhappy little girl she once was. It was perfect. I had everything. But the best were my two older brothers. They took me everywhere, played with me, and taught me things. Not only did they love me, but they loved each other. They were best friends, and the three of us were always together. My parents and extended family doted on me. We took trips, had great holidays and birthdays. It was perfect until I was fifteen. Her hand stops mid-caress, and I lay my hand on hers, prompting her to continue. She gets the message, and I relax into her touch. What happened when you were fifteen? Troy was about twenty-seven, and Jake twenty-five. Something happened between them, and they didn't have a relationship with each other for five years. The only time they interacted was obligatory family functions, and those were always a clusterfuck because they'd get into fistfights or arguments. She continues to caress me, but it's not with the same tender touch she had before. I can tell my words have rattled her. What? They seem like the best of friends to me. They're always joking at work, and Troy comes over to work out with him all the time. They went jogging together just the other day. Well, things are better now. But they are nowhere near as close as they used to be before the rift. What happened? It's not my story to tell. But let's just say that Tracy was Jake's girlfriend first. O.M.G. Does Sandy know? Her eyes widen and her hand leaves my hip to reach over me for her phone on the lamp table. She starts to search through her phone, but I take it from her. Of course she does. And what were you going to do? Call her at 3.30 in the morning to tell her this? Come on, Vivi. It was a long time ago. You wanted to know about my childhood, and I wanted to let you know that it wasn't all perfect. 
We all have our shit. She relaxes and her hand goes back to my body. She opens her mouth to speak, but I put my index finger on her lip. I'm not comparing love. I would never do that. I know you wouldn't. I wasn't thinking that, but you just blew my mind. I don't know if I should feel bad for Sandy or nominate her for sainthood. Why would you feel bad for her? My brother adores her. Yeah, he does. And you adore me, right? You know I do. Stop fishing for compliments, I tease. So, you want to have dinner with Blake? Point taken. I'd kill him before drinks were served. Like we'd even get that far, she says with an eye roll. You'd just kill him on sight, and I'd kill Zoe and that bitch Tori with my bare hands. Don't tell me you're the jealous type. I am, I've come to realize. I want all of this to myself, she says, running her hand all over my body. It's all yours, love, I say as I pull her on top of me. No one else has ever mattered. Yeah, there's Zoe, Tori, and that group of girls from the wedding. Tori was a long time ago, and I don't give a shit about her anymore. I only got with Zoe because I was sick of thinking about you. The girls from the wedding were only there because I knew you were watching. And I only knew you were watching because I couldn't stop watching you. You looked so beautiful in that pink dress. I couldn't take my eyes off you during the ceremony. I don't give her time to respond. I capture her lips in a kiss and run my hands over her body as I moan into her mouth. I love you, she says against my mouth. I love you too. Let me show you. Sit down. I'll be right back. Vivi runs to her bedroom, and I sit in one of the chairs in the kitchen as I wait for her to come back. It's been a month since she decided to give her mother a chance, and it's been great. They have their first therapy session later this week, but we go to dinner at her house once a week, and she joins us for lunch whenever she can. Vivienne invited her to the office this week. Instead of meeting and going off-site for lunch, she brought us a homemade meal, which we, unfortunately, had to share with Troy. Luckily, Jake and the Creator weren't in the building. This morning, when I was too tired to get out of bed, she met her mother for the 8 a.m. yoga class without me. Each day, things with us get better. We fall deeper in love, and I learn something new and strange about her. Like her fear of heights, or her weird theory that cats are evil and should be avoided at all costs. I found out about it completely by random when a stray cat ran across my parents' driveway. Vivi let out a blood-curdling scream as she jumped on my back, making me slip on the ice. She also loves black licorice, but will only eat chocolate if it's mixed with something else. She will tolerate a romantic comedy, but much prefers an action movie, preferably from the 80s or 90s. Last week when we babysat for Troy and Tracy, Rosie had two diaper explosions and I pretended to be busy with the other kids both times. Although I didn't miss her smirk, she didn't flinch when it came to cleaning Rosie up. In fact, she never complains about anything at all. If something doesn't go as expected, she simply readjusts. I've only had a few girlfriends before her, but each of them were spoiled and selfish in their own way. This girl is the opposite of everything I knew. The only thing she's ever asked me for is my time, and in return she's filled my world with unconditional love. During the time I was with Tori, I came down with a cold. For that entire week, she wouldn't come to see me, worried about catching what I had. No visits, no calls, only a few random texts until I was well enough to take her away for a weekend. Two weeks ago, when I came down with a cold, Vivi spent the entire weekend with me. From homemade chicken soup to hot toddies and making sure I showered, she was with me through it all. She even changed the sheets and did my laundry, despite me telling her she didn't have to do it. She gave zero fucks about getting sick and stayed in bed with me for the entire weekend as we watched all the Die Hard movies. I was sick, and I never wanted to get better. Do you realize you've taken care of me all weekend? I asked her late Sunday night. You cooked for me, brought me medicine, made sure I showered, and you even changed my sheets and did my laundry. She rolled her eyes at me as she pulled out work clothes from her overnight bag. I love you, and you needed me. You would have done the same for me. End of story. Plus, you are sweaty and gross. I was doing the world a favor when I forced you into that shower. I smile at the memory. I continue to smile as I hear her footsteps approach. I can't believe you're still in the same clothes you slept in. 
she says, running a hand through my bed head before leaning down to kiss my cheek. At least I brush my teeth, I respond, shrugging my shoulders. And these are different sweatpants. The other ones got wet from the snow when I took the dogs out. His Royal Highness is still in bed, I say about my brother Jake. He's going to miss me when I get my own place. She only laughs at me. Every time I mention moving, my mother tears up and my dad reminds me of our deal. What did your dad offer you this time? She asks, with her back turned to me. I crane my neck to see what she's doing, but she's completely blocking me. A new BMW. Well, he told me last year that he was giving me the house, so Troy and Jake can suck it. He's sweetened the deal, though. The house won't be mine until I'm 25, but he said you can move in now. I see her body go completely rigid at that statement. Yeah, right, she says, laughing it off. I'm dead serious. You may get the key to my mansion after all, love. What do you say? The old folks are hardly ever home. Whatever. She doesn't say anything else on the subject, and I let it drop. I know what she wants. She wants to graduate, find a job, and be able to live on her own. What I don't tell her is that the living on her own portion of her plans will never happen. Close your eyes, she orders. I have a surprise for you. I close my eyes, my pulse racing at the surprise. I got this for you for Valentine's Day, but I couldn't wait to give it to you. And who cares about a commercialized holiday anyway, right? I hear Jake and Sandy's fancy coffee machine roar to life, and I know she's making me a cappuccino. Yeah, love, who cares? Commercialized holidays suck big donkey balls. By the way, I totally went over the $20 budget you set for gifts. By like a lot. The machine quiets down. Why do you always do that? Because I like to buy you gifts that cost more than $20, or whatever ridiculous amount you dictate. You can't boss me around, Thumbelina. I can smell the coffee. I hear her footsteps as she walks closer to me. There's a loud clunk on the table and a hand glides into my hair. She kisses my ear and whispers, Open your eyes. When I do, I find the frothy cappuccino in front of me, and she managed to do a heart with the foam. But it's the mug it's in that gets my attention. It has a selfie of us with her kissing me on the cheek. I have my hand in her hair as she kisses me. The picture is inside a heart, and underneath it says, Vivi loves Luke. Do you like it? she asks, kissing my temple. I pull her to me, placing her on my lap. I give her a loud kiss on the mouth before taking a sip of the drink. I love it. Second best gift I ever got. She lays her head in the crook of my neck and drapes an arm across my torso. What's the best gift? she asks. You letting me hit it raw when I got back from Arizona. Oh my God, you're such a pig, she says, laughing. I snort loudly, and she laughs harder. Seriously, I love it. You're the best, I tell her. You've totally changed your opinion of me. Remember you called me the worst the weekend of the wedding? Opposites, suffragette. Whatever I said or did, I wanted to do the opposite. And I'm pretty sure it was you who called me the worst, not the other way around. This time it's Vivi who snorts while her head is in the crook of my neck. That's another thing about her. She just snorted without a care in the world. She's still sweaty from yoga, and her hair is in a crazy bun, and she's completely comfortable letting me see the real her. She's gorgeous in every state. But Tori wouldn't go to the school dining hall without doing her hair and makeup. Making dinner for her at my apartment was never appreciated. She always wanted to go out. But this girl in my arms goes crazy when I cook for her. You know what? I ask, running my hands over her yoga pants. These things are like a chastity belt. How am I supposed to stick my mammoth paw in your pants if I can't get them in? Stop fondling me in the kitchen. She pulls my hand out of her pants and does one of the things I love the most. She intertwines our fingers together, puts my hand to her mouth and kisses it repeatedly before laying it on her lap. Let's go shower together, I suggest. I take a sip of my drink and hold the mug to her lips while she sips. Last time we did that, you got my hair all wet. Behave yourself this time. I kiss her cheek and we sit in the kitchen, sharing a cappuccino in my new favorite mug. Not even Sandy and Jake's approach affects our snuggling. You two are sharing a mug now? Jake asks. And to be a jerk, he ruffles my hair. I jerk out of his touch. He pulls a chair out for Sandy and he stands next to her. 
My new favorite mug, I declare, holding it up so they can see it. I don't want you two drinking out of it, I point to him and Sandy. Sandy rolls her eyes and Jake gives me the finger. I'll drink out of any mug I want in my house. You're just jealous because Princess here, I say, pointing at Sandy. Never got you a mug like this. They're both jealous, Vivi says. Oh, please, Sandy says, laughing. Yeah, we're so jealous. Jake takes Sandy's hand and shows off his and her wedding rings. We have a marriage, a home, and a baby on the way, but you hold on to your mug, Lukey. Boom, Sandy says, pretending to drop the mic. If you two will excuse me, I'm going to make my wife some tea. He turns his back on us and fills the tea kettle with water, while Sandy looks at us smugly. Well, we don't want marriage, do we, Luke? Marriage is an antiquated concept which we're way too progressive for. Think about it. A man gives the woman away to another man while she's wearing a white dress symbolizing her purity. No one ever thinks about a man's purity or virtue. I'll be damned if any man is going to give me away. We wake up every day and choose to be together. We don't need a piece of paper. Right, Luke? Vivian says. She looks at me, waiting for me to speak. Jake looks at me, giving me a knowing smile, which I ignore. Thankfully, Sandy chimes in before I can think of a way to spin this. Or you can love someone so much and just know you want to spend the rest of your life with them. You want to declare your love, and making it legal tells the world that this man is mine, and I have the piece of paper to prove it. I didn't think of the white dress as a symbol of my virtue, just a clean slate and a new beginning. The best part is that I wasn't even looking for love when I met him. It was like we were meant to meet each other. I wish I could marry you every day, baby, she says, looking at Jake. He walks over and kisses her gently on the lips. Well, I have way too much I want to accomplish. I still need to graduate. I want to be able to fully support myself, buy my own car, go to graduate school, and travel. Those things are fine, Vivi. I did all those things. But if I had met Jake in my early twenties, I would have loved to have experienced those things with him, too. If you find the right person, marriage won't prevent you from doing any of those things, sweetie. Remember what I told you? Find someone who will want to experience those things with you. It's not all or nothing. She takes a sip of my drink, seeming to mull over Sandy's words, then simply shrugs and hands me back the mug. Maybe. I'm not putting down marriage, but I don't think it's for me. I don't need a piece of paper or the noose of a diamond ring. Yeah, Jake chimes in, his eyes playful. You and Luscious here are too woke for that. I can see the blush on Vivi's face. Luscious? Sandy says, throwing her head back, laughing. I don't even want to know. Oh, yeah. I wish I didn't know either. I overheard her call him that at work this week. My ears are still bleeding, Jake says. We're not ashamed of our love, Vivi says. And your brother is Luscious. To prove her point, she bites my ear. Luscious went to bed until he was eleven, Jake says. First of all, I was ten. Second, only my girl can call me Luscious. It sounds creepy coming from my brother. And third, I would never give you a diamond ring. I'd put an emerald on your finger so big they'd be able to see it from Mars. You're too feisty for a plain diamond, I tell her, winking. And you're forgetting about the legality, suffragette. If something happens to me, I need you in charge, kicking ass and taking names. That's the only reason. Not for love or anything like that. Don't even think you can tie me down, Clark. Don't tell me what to think, Chateau. I smirk at her. Jake and Sandy snicker and Vivian rolls her eyes at me. She finally opens her mouth to talk, but I kiss her. Come on, let's go to Newcomb Farms for breakfast. Jake's paying, I say. We have to let Troy know or he gets jealous. And if he comes, he has to pay. Clark family rule. Oldest sibling always pays, Jake says. Fine, but they better not take forever to get ready, I grumble. Vivi gets downright cranky when she's hungry. Chapter 47 Vivi Me I can't wait for our trip this weekend. Tell me where we're going. Luke You'll find out soon enough. Patience, suffragette. Just know you won't need panties. I send him the eye roll emoji before I type my next message. Me Fine. Just know that at some point over the weekend, we are watching the most romantic movie ever made. Luke, you're going to make me watch Pride and Prejudice? The Notebook? Me, bite your tongue. 
The most romantic movie ever is Rocky. Adrian and Rocky are relationship goals. Luke, see? This is why I love you. You sure you don't want to get married? You can have Chris walk you down the aisle to Eye of the Tiger. I send him a thumbs-down emoji, followed by a gif of a bride running away. Me, as if I would let anyone give me away. I'm walking myself down the aisle. Don't you know me at all? Luke, so, you've thought about it then. You want to walk yourself down the aisle soon, or what? Me, how about the 30th of never? Luke, spoiled rich boy, remember? I always get what I want. Me, get your rich, spoiled ass back to work. He sends me the blowing kiss emoji. I slide my phone back in my pocket and start sorting the mail for delivery. This is the part of my job I love, because I get away from the phone and get a sneak peek at the other departments, especially the accounting department. The anxiety about what would happen to me after graduation has died down. My mom is positive she can get me hired at her company, but Mr. Clark wants me to stay on as well. As great as that is, I want to find something on my own. And for now, I'm grateful neither of them knows about the interviews I have coming up. Things with my mother have come such a long way since Christmas Day. Our first therapy sessions together were hard. And when I told her what her indifference has done to me, we spent the majority of the hour crying and apologizing. But I told her I didn't want any more apologies. I want to focus on moving forward. Part of the therapy is being honest with each other, and she let it drop that my father has been trying to contact her. His voicemail messages alternate between blaming her for his problems and ordering her to move back home. He's refused to even speak with a divorce lawyer and says the only thing wrong is with her. I don't care what he says, she said to me and the therapist. If he doesn't want a lawyer, that's his choice. I've made mine. I can't control him. And he needs to learn he can no longer control me. That was the proudest I've ever been of my mother. It takes me about an hour to deliver all the mail throughout the building. By the time I get back to my desk, Luke is there fielding the calls. When I approach, she stands up and holds me my coat. Our weekend begins now. I convinced your very handsome boss to give you tomorrow off. Surprise! Eager to find out where we're going, I put on my coat, and we're out the door in minutes. He drives me back to the house where I'm given half an hour to pack. Soon, we're on a train heading to New York City for the weekend. Since you couldn't go to New York for the bachelorette party or any of the bridal things, I thought I'd take you. The only plans I made for us is ice skating at Rockefeller Center. Other than that, we're free to roam the city and act like tourists. We talked the entire train ride to New York City with me in his arms. It was late by the time we arrived in the city. After checking into a hotel in Manhattan, we walked around the city and had dinner at an Italian restaurant called Bice Cucina. Afterward, we held hands and walked to Times Square while the harsh February wind turned both our cheeks bright pink. Before going back to the hotel, we stopped by a cafe and had frozen hot chocolate. Hold on, I say to him, as I grab my vibrating phone out of my pocket. My mom is FaceTiming. When I accept the call, she's holding the large bouquet of pink roses we sent her for Valentine's Day. She doesn't stay on the phone for long, but tells us how much she loves the flowers and promises to meet us for lunch next week. Later that night, after making love, we lay in the messy bed, limbs intertwined with his head resting on my chest. We're silent as I stroke his hair with my fingers and kiss his forehead. Tell me what your plans are for the future, love, he says, finally breaking the silence. I want to graduate in three months, I begin. I plan on being there. Get a job, take him past the CPA exam, buy my own car, move into my own place, graduate school, travel, I say. I want to be there for all of that, he says. I want you to be there for all of it. I stroke his hair again, my heart beating fast, unsure if I should say what's on my mind. 
What? I feel like you're holding back on me, he says. I don't just want you to be there. I need you to be. And that's the scariest thing I've ever said. I always thought these feelings that I have for you would make me weak. But it's the opposite. You've been there for me so much these past few months. I don't think I would have been able to do it without you. I know you would have been able to do it without me. But you won't ever have to do anything without me. I want to be there for you through everything. And I want to be there for you. It's been one-sided, but you have me. It has not. You've helped me in so many ways. You've helped me see what I thought was love before was nothing. It was a mirage. What we have is the real deal. We have what my parents have, what my brothers and their wives have. It's not always pretty, but it's always beautiful. I wake up the next morning with an emerald necklace draped around my neck. I had been nervous about my gift, but when he sees it, he laughs so hard he falls off the bed. We spend Saturday walking around the city, me wearing the Smurfette long-sleeved tee under my long winter coat, and Luke wearing his Papa Smurf shirt. We find the best pizza in the city, hold hands, and walk through Central Park. He promises another weekend in New York City, come spring, complete with a picnic in the park and a trip to see the Statue of Liberty. It will be a graduation-slash-birthday trip. What? he asks, when he notices my surprised look. You think I didn't know that your graduation falls on your birthday? It's not that. My mom said something about throwing me a party. I know. I'm helping her. I stop in the middle of the busy sidewalk and look up at him, ready to object. Anticipating what I'm going to say, he bends down to kiss me right in the middle of a busy New York City street. Whatever protest I was going to make is long forgotten when he takes my hand and leads me back to our hotel. We spend the rest of the afternoon naked in bed. Hours later, we drag ourselves out of bed and find the best Chinese food in the city. We order several dishes and feed each other, we spend most of the meal laughing at my attempts to use chopsticks. After dropping my third pile of shrimp lo mein, he takes the chopsticks away from me and feeds us both. Sunday morning comes fast, and due to an incoming snowstorm, we're on a train back home first thing in the morning, arriving just as the first snow starts to fall in Boston. I need a hot shower and a bed, I say to Luke, as he unlocks the door to Jake and Sandy's house. The dogs immediately come running to us, licking Luke's hand. Sounds good to me, he says, stretching. Our hopes of sleep post-shower are dashed when Jake informs us of the family brunch at his parents' house. Have fun, I joke. Family brunch. Bring me something back, though. Luke responds by throwing me over his shoulder and walking us directly into the shower. We emerge from my room, clean and refreshed, me in skinny jeans and a plain black sweater, Luke in dark blue jeans and a sky-blue long-sleeved T-shirt with the word feminist written across his chest. Jake snorts and rolls his eyes when he sees him. First Smurfette and Papa Smurf shirts, and now this? You two kill me. What? Luke says. She's Smurfette and I'm her Papa. You are not my Papa. I roll my eyes at him. You two ready to go? Jake asks. If you want to go together, let's leave now. I want to get back before the snow gets too bad. It's Luke's turn to snort at Jake. We're going half a mile. I'm sure Princess can handle being in the snow for the two minutes it will take us to get there and back. Okay, Mr. Feminist. Don't make me kick your ass in front of your girl. She would totally kick your ass on my behalf. Luke jokes back. She's small, but she's scrappy. I'm not afraid to have my woman fight my battles. He not only wears the shirt, but he lives by the principles, I say. What principles? Jake asks, shaking his head at us. I wouldn't expect you to understand, Jakey, Luke says, playfully punching his brother in the arm. You literally have your woman barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. And what's this? Did she bake pies? I didn't realize we were living in the fifties. Luke taunts. I look at him and nod in agreement.
smirking at Jake and Sandy. We all turn to look at Sandy as she stands in the kitchen drinking a glass of water. Hey, she laughs after she finishes her drink. Excuse me for liking to bake. No pie for the two of you, then. I'm throwing your ass in the first snowbank I find, and if sunshine gets in the way, she's getting thrown in head first. Equality and all that, Jake says to Luke. Brunch at the Clark House is as I've come to expect. Loud, crazy, fun. After eating, the guys take the kids outside to play in the snow, and I watch from inside as Jake and Luke try to throw each other in a pile of snow. When Jake gets the best of Luke, I run outside and jump on his back to get him off my man. True to his word, he tosses me in the snow. Luke tackles him, and the three of us all end up covered in snow, which causes the kids to jump on top of us. Troy takes that as his opportunity to pound us with snowballs while everyone inside watches and laughs. I lie on my back and make snow angels with Emma and Tristan, wondering how life could get any more perfect. Chapter 48 Luke So happy, Luke. I've never been this happy before, and I just know that something or someone is going to come along and fuck it all up. Her words from last night play over again in my mind. Despite changing the subject whenever I mention moving in with me, things have been perfect. The Creator has offered me the guest house. Even though the main house will be mine when I turn 25, nothing else will change. My parents will continue to live there, and I can either live there with them or stay in the guest house. On the upside, Vivi has agreed to help me decorate the place. Can't believe we overslept, she says as she jumps out of my car. I grab her hand and we briskly walk to the building. I'll bring you some coffee, I say as I help her with her coat. I run to the kitchen to find that someone has had bagels delivered. While I make her coffee, I toast and put extra cream cheese on her cinnamon raisin bagel. You're the best, she says when she sees her bagel. She offers me a bite before taking a small bite of her own. When the phone rings, she signals for me to come closer, and she wipes some cream cheese off the side of my mouth. When she mouths, I love you, I kiss her cheek and leave her to her work. With Vivi at another therapy session this afternoon, and Jake, Dad, and Troy at a meeting off-site, lunch is a sad and lonely affair for me. I pull out my phone and scroll through the pictures from our weekend in New York two weeks ago. I smile at the selfie of us in Central Park. Despite the sunshine, the redness of our cheeks reveals it was a blustery cold day. I make that one my background photo and continue to scroll when the door of my office opens. Are you back already, love? I ask, looking up expecting to see Vivienne, but finding Tori's cold eyes instead. Chapter 49 Vivi Damn it! Colleen hisses as I walk behind the desk. She's craning her neck as she grabs the phone, but I can't see who or what has caused her frustration. That bitch is back and ran down to Luke's office. What bitch? I ask, immediately eyeing the sign-in log. Victoria Palmer. My blood goes cold at the sight of her name. Knowing Luke was in love with her and bared himself to her makes me sick to my stomach. I'm calling security, Colleen says as she picks up the phone. I lay my hand on hers, stopping her. Don't do that. I'll go down and handle it. She's after your man, Vivi. Kick her ass. She's wearing so much makeup, she looks like a clown. Despite the speed of my pulse, I take solace in Colleen's loyalty to me. I put my coat away, go to the kitchen, and make a cup of coffee for Luke, and pray Victoria Palmer won't give me a reason to throw the hot liquid in her face. I slow my pace as I approach his office. I stop outside the open door, out of sight, and listen to the conversation. I am back. For you. There's a fakeness about her voice, as if she's trying for contrition that she does not feel. I've missed you. I count to ten to calm my temper and step inside the office. His eyes light up when he sees me, and I quickly cross the room and put the coffee next to him before turning my gaze on his ex. A coffee would be great, she says, 
tossing her long curls. Is there a cappuccino machine in the building? I'll take one with soy milk. Extra foam. Luke's cheeks redden, and his normal friendly demeanor is now borderline hostile. Right now, she says, when I don't make any move to leave the office. It's so hard to find good help. Baby, can you tell her to go so we can finish our conversation? Baby, I say, as I take a step towards this woman. Luke grabs my wrist and pulls me onto his lap. Victoria, the last time you were here, I told you never to come back. Realization dawns when she sees me on his lap, but she steals her shoulders and continues. Look, I know I messed up. I know I hurt you, but I wasn't ready for that, Lucky. I can make it up to you. Let me have a chance. What the hell was she not ready for? Was he asking her to move in and get married, too? You won't even take my calls or answer my emails. Do you not see me sitting on his lap? I ask. Luke's strong grip is the only thing keeping me from getting in her face. His grip tightens when I try to leave his lap. Leave so I can talk to him. Lucky, can you ask her to leave, please? You do know that word? I say to her. Don't call me Lucky. The unluckiest day of my life was the day I met you, and the only person I want to leave is you, Tori, he says, sounding bored. He takes a piece of my hair and puts it behind my ear. Thanks for the coffee, love, he says, as he takes a sip. Did everything go okay? he asks. It's as if he's totally forgotten that Tori is in the office watching us. Her? she asks, pointing a manicured finger at me. Really? Look, I don't care about her. I hurt you, and she was available, I guess. But I'm back now. She's a receptionist, for fuck's sake. I'm getting a law degree from NYU. Are you seriously going to take her to events and introduce her to your family and their associates? She's no one. I'm hardly ever struck speechless. A sharp retort and a stinging word are always on my tongue when warranted. Call it a trait inherited by my father— but I can dish it out as well as I can take it. But Victoria Palmer has rendered me speechless. She didn't have the same effect on Luke, though. He throws his head back and laughs. I can feel his abs flexing underneath me. He tightens his hold on me, leans closer, and inhales my wild hair. I forgot what a social climbing bitch you can be, Tori. You think everyone thinks like you, don't you? You look at Vivi and see a receptionist and nothing else. I promise you, she's ten times smarter and more ambitious than you will ever be. The difference is, she doesn't shit on others on her way to the top. In case you didn't hear me the last time, and I admit, maybe I wasn't forceful enough. I had just come back from Arizona, hadn't seen Vivi in over a week, and I was desperate to be with her. I might have given you a little more regard than you deserved, so listen up. I feel nothing for you. Whatever feelings I had died a long time ago. There is nothing that you can say or do to get me back. I'm sure you can get your claws in some other rich boy at NYU or Columbia. Harvard is only a few miles away. Why don't you go try your luck there? Just get the hell out of here. I see the tears flood her eyes, but she catches herself fast. She takes a deep breath, fluffs her hair, and takes another step closer to the desk. I deserve those words, Lucky. I told you not to fucking call me that. In an instant, we're out of the chair. He stands over the desk, both hands planted on top. Don't you fucking come in here and make declarations. Get the hell out. I'm sorry, she says, sounding desperate. We made a child together. You wanted to marry me, and now you want to act as if those things meant nothing, we will always be connected. What? I say. I turn to look at Luke, who has now gone completely white. His lips are pursed shut as well as his eyes. When he opens them, he looks at me. And from that one look, I know her words are true. Having enough of this woman, I step in front of her and look up at her face. What the hell are you talking about? You have a child? I look at the plastic Barbie in front of me, disgusted. 
No way would the Lucas Clark I know have a child and not be in its life. No way. Oh, he didn't tell you, she says, triumphant. Listen, you don't know. Tori, shut the hell up and get out of here, now. I still love you. There's no one out there like you, she yells. Well, I don't love you. I'm in love with this woman, he says, grabbing me and holding me to his side. What we had was nothing, Tori. It's over. It was enough to make a baby, she pleads, tears falling down her face. A baby you didn't want. A baby you aborted behind my back. And you didn't even have the guts to face me after doing it. What the hell makes you think I would ever have anything to do with you again? The entire room hears my gasp. She looks at me, eyes me up and down, flips her hair, and turns back to Luke. Her tears continue to fall as she angrily swipes them away. I made a mistake, Luke. Please. You made a choice. You made it and didn't even tell me until three days later. I feel him tense around me, and to absorb some of his pain, I wrap my arms around him, offering him solace. I'm not going to tell you again. Get out. The venom is gone from his voice. He simply resigned. Her shoulders sag, and she quickly wipes away a few stray tears. I know you're angry, but please call me. I can make this right. We can make another baby in a few years. She starts to walk away, but she stops when I call her name. She doesn't bother to turn around as she waits for me to speak. He's not going to call you. I can see her shoulders tense at my words. You were right about one thing, though. There is no one else out there like Lucas Clark. And I have him. I can give you a long speech about how great our relationship is, but you might get it in your head that you're competition, when in reality, you're nothing. You're not worth it. Dejected, she walks out without another word. That bitch has some nerve coming in here and declaring her love for you with me sitting on your lap. Who the hell does she think she is? I should follow her outside and kick her condescending ass. What did you ever see? He shuts me up by kissing me senseless. Don't you dare kiss me, Lucas Clark, I yell. I surprise us both when I push him away, and he takes a step back. Shocked by the display, he takes a step towards me, but I hold my hands up. I've told you every detail about me and my life. I've invited you into the clusterfuck relationship I have with my mother, and you keep this from me. I asked you the last time she was here, and you told me she was your ex. You never mentioned she was pregnant with your baby and that you wanted to marry her. You basically lied by omission. He takes a step forward, and I take one back. I shake my head, warning him not to come any closer. Is this what you do? Do you ask every woman you're involved with to move in and marry you? He flares his nostrils at me, staring me down. He takes a step back as he shakes his head. Did you just say that to me? He says, his voice low but filled with rage. Don't be ridiculous. You're making a huge deal out of this. What else are you keeping from me? Are you fucking kidding me, Vivian? I hate that she did that. I hate talking about that shit. I hate that someone I cared about did that and couldn't face me. You think I want to relive that every damn time her name gets mentioned? I expect you to confide in me the same way I confided in you, I yell back. You lied to me. I didn't fucking lie, he thunders. It's none of your damn business, so drop it. His words sting. For a man who invaded every part of my life, those words hurt. I've leaned on him for so much, but he wouldn't tell me about such an important part of his life. I've gotten to know this man. I know what she did hurt, and I know he didn't just get over it. He simply chose not to confide in me after everything we've been through. That realization is humbling. When he notices my tears, he starts to walk towards me. Don't you dare come near me. You're right. It's none of my business. I walk out of his office. Vivi, I'm sorry. I didn't mean... I don't hear the rest of his words. I slam the door and start to run down the hall. 
He's right behind me. And after just a few steps, he's grabbing my arm and holding me against the wall. I'm not done talking, he hisses. I'm done. I was done the minute you told me it was none of my business. I pull out of his grasp, duck under his arms, and leave him standing in the hallway. I leave work soon after the confrontation. I tell Colleen I'm not feeling well and send Luke a brief email letting him know I'm leaving for the day. I'm out of there in less than two minutes, grateful that I drove myself to work this morning. I know I can't go to Sandy's house or the bakery. I'm sure as hell not going to my aunt's house in the middle of a work day. There would be too many questions, and Luke might look for me there. For the first time, I make use of the key my mother gave me the first day I came over here. Unfortunately for me... My mother is working from home and is stunned to see me again so soon after our therapy session. For the first time in my life, I run to her, and she takes me in her arms. She walks me to the kitchen and holds me. I don't have any more tears, but she offers me comfort, and I take it. She doesn't ask me any questions. She just strokes my hair until I fall asleep. Hours later... I wake up with a pillow under my head and a warm blanket on top of me. My mom is sitting on the end of the couch with her laptop, and she's put my feet on her lap. Your phone has been going off like crazy. As soon as the words leave her mouth, I feel it vibrate. Sandy called me a few minutes ago. I didn't want her to worry, so I told her you were here. I take a deep breath and lay my head back on the pillow. If Sandy knows I'm here, that means Jake knows, and so does Luke. When my phone finishes vibrating, I pick it up to find 23 missed calls from Luke and Sandy and 11 text messages. Did you two have a fight? It's normal, Vivian. I don't want you to think your relationship will turn into what I had with your father. It's healthy to fight as long as no one is demeaned, she says. He would never do that, I say in his defense, I found out he kept something from his past from me. After everything I've shared with him, he hid this from me. She gets up and goes into the kitchen and comes back a few minutes later with two mugs of tea. Is it something that affects your relationship? Can this thing hurt you? I sit up so I can drink the tea, and my mother sits next to me, laying a hand on my lap as I think about her words. No, I admit. I just wish he had shared it with me. I've told him about the painful parts of my life, and he didn't do the same. That hurts. I don't know what the secret is, she says, as she strokes my hair, and I don't want to know. I will say that some things are too painful and difficult to talk about. We all open up in our own time. Don't focus on this one thing. Think about the sum of all things, Vivi. I know you're upset, but think about him and what he was going through, okay? Maybe he thought this would change the way you see him, and he didn't want to risk that. When I nod at her, she doesn't say anything else. She simply smiles at me and turns back to her laptop. She's right about one thing. I only thought of my feelings and didn't consider his reasons for not telling me. Just as I'm reaching for my phone to check his many messages, I hear a loud pounding on my mother's door. Neither one of us is startled. She looks at me, and then looks at the door. I nod, and she goes to open it. He barely says hello to her, as he storms through the door like a tornado, his long coat unbuttoned, and his hair windswept. He comes and stands in front of me, hands on his hips as he scowls down. I stand up, too, putting my own hands on my hips as I look into his eyes. I'm going to start dinner. You two can talk in your room, Vivian. My mother walks away from us to the kitchen. I turn back to Luke, but he grabs me by the elbow and practically drags me to my bedroom, slamming and locking the door behind us. I'm so fucking pissed at you, he says, pointing at me. You left, and I had no idea where you were. I drove around like an idiot looking for you. I must have called about a hundred times, and you didn't have the decency to let me know where you were. I've been worried out of my damn mind for hours. I was waiting for you to come home, but you come here and hide from me over some shit that happened years ago. 
He turns from me and starts to pace. He yanks his coat off and tosses it on the bed. I didn't hide. I told you I was leaving, and you have absolutely no business being mad at me. I say as I point to myself. You're the one keeping secrets. I asked you point blank about that bitch, and you gave me some bullshit about her not being who you thought she was. Come to find out, she was pregnant with your child, and you were ready to marry her. He finally stops his pacing and fixes his angry eyes on me again. He takes a menacing step toward me, but I hold my ground. Is this what you do, Luke? Ask every woman to marry you? Bullshit. He steps back and runs a hand through his hair. He takes several deep breaths, and when he looks at me again, he's less angry. I'm sorry that I didn't tell you everything, Vivi. That was shitty of me. But I've done nothing but show you how I feel about you. I told Tori this to her face, things with her ended years before we began, and any feelings I had for her died a long time ago. Don't you dare use this to push me away. That's what you're doing. But I'm not going to let you. What else are you keeping from me? I ask, my arms crossed. How do I know you still don't have feelings for her? Are you fucking kidding me, Vivian? He rubs his temples as he walks to me. He stands right in front of me and takes both of my hands. I was in a relationship with Tori. I can't go back and change that. I thought I loved her, and I thought she loved me too. I was a fool. You know what I'm not a fool about? You. I fucking love you so damn much, and I know you love me too, so what is this about? I try to pull my hands away, but he holds on. Talk to me, love, he says gently. He pulls me towards the bed, and when he sits down, he pulls me on his lap. I'm not your type, I say. What? The way I look, the way I am. I'm nothing like the women you were into before. What if I'm just a temporary distraction? He throws his head back, but not before I see his exasperated eye roll. Love, out of the two of us, you're supposed to be the smart one. You're my type. Everything about you, your looks, your fire, your heart, your mind, everything about you is my type. I want everything with you. You're my future. Don't use this as a way to push me away. I'm not going anywhere. I know, I say laying my head on his shoulder. I love you. I love you too, I whisper. I'm sorry I left. I was hurt you didn't confide in me. And I hate the idea of you and her. At one time you loved her enough to want to marry her. I was scared you realized I was a mistake too. He pulls me closer and kisses my forehead. Oh, love, you're the best mistake I ever made. Listen, she told me from the beginning she wasn't ready for motherhood. I brought up marriage because I wanted the baby. Yes, I did care for her, but I never even considered marriage until she told me she was pregnant. It's all I think about with you. Can we be done with this fight, please? Did she really do that? I ask, breathless. Yes. The day you asked me about her, I had just gotten you back, and the last thing I wanted to talk about was that. That was a horrible time in my life, and I knew what you'd say. I look up at him. His face is void of any expression. You can read my mind now. I don't have to read your mind to know you're one of those my-body-my-choice types. I twist out of his hold and turn to face him. I grab both of his hands and intertwine our fingers. I can't speak for anyone else, Lucas, but it would not be my choice, okay? Do you want to know what I would have done? I would have told you to get your head out of your ass so you can help me raise our baby. That's what I would have done. I'm sorry you went through that. For the record, I think you would have been a great father. He's silent, but I feel him relax underneath me. His hand gently strokes my hair. You think so? I know it. You adore your nieces and nephews, and the feeling is mutual. Victoria Palmer is not fit to shine your shoes, Lucas Clark. Honestly, it's a good thing I came along when I did, because who knows who else you'd be with? Probably Zoe, I joke. Definitely not Zoe, he says, kissing my hair. What I had with Tori wasn't love or anything close to it. 
I didn't know it then, but I know it now. You're my person, Vivi. And you're mine, Luke. Luke loves Vivi. Vivi loves Luke. There you two are, my mother says, when we finally walk out of the bedroom. She smiles and visibly relaxes when she sees our intertwined hands. I'm going to make a salad while the lasagna cooks, she says, pointing at the oven. I'm so glad I made this a couple of nights ago. It's extra meaty, Lucas. One of you set the table. It's snowing pretty heavily now. Maybe you two could spend the night. I don't want you driving in this mess. I open my mouth to make the argument that we have no clothes, but Luke surprises me when he says he packed us a bag before he came over. I'm left to set the table while he runs outside to retrieve the bag. When he gets back, we eat a delicious meal, and after the kitchen is cleaned, the three of us sit down and watch a movie. As soon as the bedroom door closes behind us, Luke has me pinned against the wall. He grinds into me, his hard cock rubbing against my thigh. I've been dying to get you alone for hours. His mouth is on mine at the same moment he glides his hand up my shirt, gripping one of my breasts. He deepens the kiss and grinds into me again. I need you, he whispers against my mouth. We have to be quiet, I tell him. He nods, and within seconds we're both naked. I drop to my knees and take him in my mouth and grab his balls as I bob my head back and forth. Oh, shit, he hisses as he helps guide my head. Yes, la. I continue to tease him with my mouth, taking him all the way in my throat. Stand up, he says, pulling away from me. I want to be inside of you. He picks me up, gently lays me on the bed, and pushes my legs apart. He kisses my clit and sucks on it for several seconds. I stick both hands in his hair, letting him work his magic, but he pulls away much too soon. He slides inside of me moments later, holding my gaze. But when my moans become too much, he covers my mouth with his hand. He fucks me slowly, filling me to the hilt and pulling back out. He finally removes his hand and replaces it with his mouth. Our kiss becomes deeper and wetter, and his cock goes deeper each time. The orgasm comes quickly, causing my brain to short-circuit. I feel my juices drip down my thighs as I shudder underneath him. He lets out one deep grunt as he thrusts one last time before he starts to spasm. We both lay there, spent. He stays inside of me until he softens and slides out. When he rolls over, he pulls me into his side, both our bodies glistening with sweat. Incredible, I say. You're the only one I ever want to do that with, he whispers. Don't start with that marriage talk again, I tease. Oh, it's happening, sunshine. Get used to the idea now. Chapter 50 Vivi I really don't need a party, I say to my mother and Luke, who are sitting at a table in the back of the bakery as I work the counter. We are all done planning. You have to give us a list of people you want to invite. My mother drones on and on, happier than I've ever seen her. She tried to order a cake from my aunt, who sucked her teeth and rolled her eyes. She had a slight smile on her face when she told my mother, Vivi will have cake. Hopefully it won't rain, but I'll get a tint just in case, and we can always move it inside. My mother continues to go on and on about how big and beautiful the backyard is, and since the landlord is someone she used to work with, they have no issues with her having the party there. Seeing my mother and my boyfriend plan my graduation party stirs all kinds of feelings inside of me, all of them good, but the niggling thought that nothing this good can ever last just won't die. I have to go into work for a few hours, my mother says, standing up. It's tax season. Vivienne, don't forget to bring your paperwork so I can file for you next weekend. She offers Luke her cheek, and he bends down and kisses her. As he's helping her with her coat, the door to the bakery opens. It's a cold, rainy day, and foot traffic has been very slow since the morning rush. I turn towards the door to smile at the customer, but my smile slips as soon as my eyes land on my father's face. Despite his small stature, he fills the room. He stands there, 
both hands on his hips, as his brown eyes scan the room. He looks at me first, but shakes his head in disgust before turning to my mother. I'm not selling my house, he says, as he slowly approaches. My mother's shoulders stiffen as she puts her purse strap over her shoulder. Fine, keep it. I don't care, but you will have to buy me out, Eichsen. If you have anything else to say, call my lawyer. I'm not talking to your lawyer. I'm talking to you, Jocelyn. And maybe you forgot how things work, but you don't tell me what to do. I can see my mother's bravado fade right in front of my eyes. She's suddenly shorter and is already retreating back inside herself, putting up her shell. Unwilling to let that happen, I speak up. You don't tell anyone what to do anymore, I say. His snake-like eyes turn back to me, and I refuse to wither under his intense gaze. You are taking up with this clock, boy. It's not a question, it's a statement. He says the name Clark with such contempt that Luke's head goes back. I don't respond, but I continue to hold his gaze, letting him know with my silence that I don't owe him an explanation. You going to speak? He spits out. No, I don't owe you an explanation. You, he says, turning back to my mother. You will come back home where you belong. He crosses the room and attempts to get in her face, but Luke blocks him. My mother steps back, hitting the wall, her face completely white now. I walk from behind the counter, unwilling to let my mother revert to the shell she was for so many years. You don't tell anyone what to do anymore, I repeat. What are you going to do? She left you. I left you. You're alone and you have no power. The end. He reaches for me, but Luke grabs him and pins him against the wall in less than a second. You want him because he has money. You are like your mother. You choose a man for what he can do for you. Tell her, Jocelyn, you married me for what I could do for you, and now you just walk away after you've taken everything. She will use you, boy. Luke continues to hold him in place, but my father's words have knocked the life back into my mother. Shut up! Just shut the hell up! I'm not coming back. Vivi is not coming back. You can make this divorce difficult or easy. That's your choice. You are a miserable person who has made everyone around you miserable. You treated your only child like nothing, and I'm guilty of that too, but I'm trying to make amends. Despite us, she's an amazing woman, and the truth is we don't deserve her, but I'm trying to earn a place in her life. You continue to spit poison. And for what? There's nothing you can do to either one of us. You are a small man with a small mind. You bitch, he says, spit coming out of his mouth. With a small vocabulary, my mother throws at him. Luke moves to let him go, but only to put his hand around his throat. Apologize to your wife and daughter, Mr. Chateau, Luke orders. I don't apologize to women. Wrong. You do today. I can see him add some pressure to my father's neck. I hear footsteps and laughter behind us, and turn to find Sandy, Jake, and my aunt walking to the room. Hey, Lukey, Jake yells. I hear you have a career as a party planner. Just wait until I tell our mother you are planning a party with someone else's mother. She's going to lose... Jake's words dry up as the three of them enter the room. Luke, what the hell are you doing? Jake hisses, coming to stand next to his brother, waiting on Mr. Chateau to apologize to his wife and daughter. I can do this all day, sir, he says, holding my father in place. You don't have such a big mouth now, do you, Eichsen? My aunt says. She walks to the door and locks it before she pulls down the blinds. You did this, he says, pointing to Sandy. Uh-uh. You don't want to do that. If you do, I'm going to have to step aside and let my brother deal with you. Believe it or not, I'm the nice Clark. He'll kill first and ask questions later. To prove his point, Jake takes a step closer to my father. Worried that this will get violent fast, I open my mouth to speak, but my mother talks first. Let him go, Luke. I don't want his apology. His words have no effect on me anymore. Just like him? They are empty. I feel the same. I don't want his apology or anything else from him, I say. Luke nods and lets him go. He stumbles, almost crumbling to the ground as he dramatically coughs. He looks at us, 
but when he realizes he's outnumbered, he fumbles with the lock and walks out. After he walks out, everyone is quiet as we look around. You okay, sweetie? Sandy asks, slowly approaching me. No. That's the only word I say before walking to the back room as quickly as possible. I can feel the color spread across my face as I think of my father's ugly words. Luke follows right behind me, closing the door behind him. This is what I come from, Luke. My own father spewing his hatred for you to see. He basically called me and my mother whores. This is my father, Luke. I scream out the last few words. I'm so embarrassed, I whisper. I sit down and put my face in both hands. My own father doesn't care about me. He hasn't seen me in months. He threw me out with nothing, and he doesn't even bother to ask how I am. No wonder my mother was a zombie my whole life. He sucks the happiness right out of you, and you know what? I'm going to do the same thing to you. He grabs a chair and sits next to me. As soon as his hand touches my hair, the tears fill my eyes again, blurring my vision. I bury my face in his neck and let the tears fall. He doesn't say a word. He holds me against his body and lets me cry. When the tears dry up, I pull away from his neck and wipe the moisture on his skin with one swipe of my hand. Your father's a jerk, love. No other way to put it. You have nothing to do with the type of person he is. He's a case study in psychology, and that's not on you. And the only thing you've done to me since we met is make me happy. I lay my head on his chest and can't help but smile. Luke, I have not made you happy since we met. Stop lying. But you have. You gave me purpose. I was happy planning ways to torture you. Believe it or not, I was always excited when I knew you were coming around. And you forever earned my respect with a stink bomb in the hotel room. If you're trying to get me to admit that, forget it. I don't know what you're talking about. You can never be like him. Do you think there was ever a day he made your mom happy? Do you have any good memories of him? I shake my head, no. Then you're nothing like him. You're fierce and strong, but sweet and loving. Everyone loves Vivi, especially Luke. My eyes fill with tears again, but this time it's with joy and relief. Vivi loves Luke even more, I say. He holds me until my mother walks into the room. She pulls me out of Luke's arms and into a tight hug. I will spend the rest of my life making things up to you for subjecting you to him. I know, Mom. I'm not upset with you anymore, I promise. She hugs me tighter before pulling back and kissing my cheeks repeatedly. Let's celebrate him being out of our lives. Let's go out to dinner tonight, the three of us, or anyone else who wants to join, she says, when she realizes Sandy, Jake, and Aunt Gabrielle have come into the room. Good idea. Let's make it a family thing, Jake says. I'll get us a table at Tiki's, and I can tell everyone the story about running into Sandy there while she was on a date with another man. What? Be quiet, Jacob. You didn't run into me. You knew I was going to be there, and you were there waiting for me, and you ruined my date. Damn right I did. What date? Who is this man, Didi? My aunt asks. See what you've started, Jacob? How about I tell Mama the story about that one time you let me fall off the bike? You let my baby fall? My aunt asks as she lovingly rubs Sandy's protruding belly. You raised an amazing son, my mother says to Lillian Clark as we're sitting in the private room of the restaurant. Lillian hugs my mom before hooking their arms together. We love him so much. You know, he's ten years younger than Jake so he came as a total surprise. But since he came into this world, he's been my baby. His big brothers were so protective of him, but my Lucas would never leave my side. He was always so sweet and helpful. When he was eight, he beat up a ten-year-old boy who was bullying girls in the neighborhood. And on and on Lillian Clark goes about how wonderful her baby is. Tell her about how he wasn't potty trained until he was four, Mom. Troy says, walking in, or how he slept with you and Dad until he was twelve because he would wet the bed whenever you made him sleep in his own bed. 
Luke pretends to punch Troy, who pulls him into a hug. Why are you two all dressed up? Jake asks suspiciously as he swings Tristan into his arms. Sure enough, Troy is wearing a button-down shirt with dark blue jeans. Tracy is wearing a fitted dress that reaches her knees with a pair of black wedge boots. Because we're sending all four of our kids home with their favorite aunt and uncle for the night, so my wife and I can have a night out for the first time in months. When were you going to tell us this? Jake asks. I just did. We'll pick them up around one tomorrow. Make sure you two feed them lunch. Troy's large hand lands on Jake's shoulder. Is Rosie sleeping through the night yet? Jake asks. On a good night. Troy pats Jake on the back and quickly walks away. Like all Clark gatherings, dinner is loud as the Clark boys go back and forth with each other while my mother, Lil, and Aunt Gabrielle talk about how great Luke is. This is our family, Luke whispers to me. Chapter 51 Vivi Your hair, he says, as I wrap my arms around his waist. We're sitting in the middle of Central Park on a beautiful sunny Saturday, the second weekend of July. What about it? Birds can probably nest in it, I say, as I nip on his earlobe. I push back my sunglasses with my index finger and rest my chin on his shoulder. I love it. He reaches behind him and sticks one hand in the curly mess. Sometimes you straighten it, and I like it when you do, but on our wedding day, I want it like this. This is you. You're not tame. You're wild, just like your hair. I pretend to think about his words before I reply. What wedding day, Luscious? What makes you think this wild and free woman is going to be contained by marriage? You once hated me, but now you love me. You balked at moving in with me, but you've officially moved into my mansion. It's happening, sunshine. He's right. After decorating the guest house... I officially moved in with Luke the weekend after my graduation. As planned, my mother hosted the party in her backyard, and it was perfect. The yard was filled with friends, family, and love. Luke told me he saw my father at graduation, but he left as soon as my name was called. That night, when he mentioned moving in with him again, I decided to take control of my life and agree to move in with my boyfriend. We were due to come to New York a month ago, but life got in the way. Despite having no relationship with my father, he still found a way to fuck with my plans. He had a stroke, and despite our severed relationship, I couldn't leave town knowing he might die. I never went in to see him in his hospital room, but I stayed in the waiting room and got updates from my aunt, mother, and Tosh. He was sent to an inpatient rehab facility after leaving the hospital, once he was discharged after a couple of weeks, he still needed help at home, as well as transportation to his doctors and outpatient care. My father doesn't have great relationships with anyone, so it took some maneuvering to arrange transportation. Since my mother is still married to him, the decision-making fell on her. His insurance covered a home health aid, but not transportation. On more than one occasion, Luke was his transportation. He's asked to see me but I have refused. Are you asking? Soon, love. Be patient. Neither one of us is going anywhere. He's right about that. Whoever thought that Lucas Clark would end up being the love of my life? That's exactly what he is. He's the one I cry to. The one who makes me laugh. He's the one who fixes all of my problems. And even though I'm way better at accounting and numbers than he ever will be, He's the one who helps me study for the upcoming CPA exam in the fall. Despite getting job offers from Mr. Clark and my mother's company, I declined both and accepted a job I got on my own. My mother and Luke fully supported my decision, but Mr. Clark is determined on getting me back. Life's pretty much perfect, isn't it? I ask. It has been, since the day you crashed into me. Chapter 52 Luke Less than 24 hours after sitting in Central Park with my girl, I'm holding her hand as we run through the halls of South Shore Hospital. When I realize Vivi won't be able to keep up with me, 
I come to an abrupt stop and tell her to get on my back. We burst through the waiting room door to find our entire family sitting there. My mother and Sandy's mother are pacing. Tasha's knee is bouncing, and Troy keeps running a hand through his hair while Tracy talks to my dad. Even J.D. and Alex are there, pacing. It's about time you two got here, Troy says. We were on a train thirty minutes after we got your text. We could not have gotten here any faster, I say, completely out of breath and grateful that we bought souvenirs for the kids yesterday instead of waiting for today. Vivi leaves my side and starts a conversation with Tosh and her aunt, asking for an update. It looks like we haven't missed anything. The words are barely out of my mouth when Jake bursts through the doors wearing blue hospital scrubs. Mrs. Etienne stops pacing long enough to go stand in front of Jake, eagerly waiting for him to speak. I have a son, he announces. The room is deadly silent for about two seconds before pandemonium hits. J.D. and Troy start to whistle. Jake picks up our mom and Sandy's mom at the same time and spins them around the room. I find Vivi and swing her in my arms, all while everyone talks at once. When Jake sets the women down, Troy, J.D., Chris, and I take him in a group hug. Let the best uncle competition begin, I announce. There will be no competition. My house is like an indoor amusement park. I win, Troy says. He's beautiful, Jake says. So small and perfect. Overcome by emotion, Jake does something I haven't seen him do since his wedding. He cries. An hour later, we crowd into the room, amazed at how much the baby looked like my brother. Why do all the babies in the family come out looking like Jake? I ask as I look down at my nephew. Because he's the most handsome. Sandy says, smiling tiredly at us. What's his name, son? I don't have a namesake yet, our father says. Jackson Joseph Clark. Jackson because we love that name, and Joseph after Dee's father. This time it's Mrs. Etienne who cries as she cradles her new grandson. Don't worry, creator, I say, throwing an arm around my father. I'll give you a namesake. I wink at Vivi as I say it, and she rolls her eyes at me. An hour later, we decide to give the new parents some time with their newborn, promising to be back this evening with dinner. He's so perfect, Vivi says as we step into the hallway. So beautiful. Did you see the happy parents, Luke? They're glowing. To my shock, her eyes fill with tears. I want that. I want that with you, Lucas Clark, she begins, but I cut her off. Don't you dare, Vivienne. You are not going to take this away from me. I haven't even practiced my speech yet. I don't need a speech. I already know how you feel about me. Do it before I do, she threatens. Marry me. She bites her bottom lip as she pretends to mull my question over, then nods as the tears start to fall. I pull her to me and kiss her lips. Let's go home, love. Epilogue. Luke. She's been hogging the baby since we got back from the church, Vivi complains to me, Tosh, and Chris as we watch Mrs. Etienne take the baby from Jake. Jake looks over at us, smirks, and walks away. She did the same thing when I had the twins, Tosh says. I have five bucks that says she starts crying again in under five minutes, Chris says. None of us are stupid enough to take that bet, Christopher, Tosh says. Sure enough, we see her wipe the tears from her eyes a few minutes later as she looks down adoringly at Jackson Joseph Clark, who was baptized only a few hours ago. After church, we had a reception at Jake and Sandy's new house. 
Most of the guests have left, leaving just the close family. I reach over and brush some hair off Vivi's face before leaning over and kissing her cheek. You look beautiful, love, I whisper in her ear. She smiles at me and lays her head on my chest. You want me to get you something to eat? You hardly ate anything. Maybe I'll have a salad a little later. My stomach is kind of upset. Hmm, I say, looking at her. She pulls away from my body and stands up. Don't start that again, she says. I already told you it's not that. I hold up both hands, unwilling to have this discussion in front of an audience. Hey, guys, Sandy says as she walks over to us, Jake following behind. How about we all watch a movie? We can't turn our backs on your mother, Dee. She's going to kidnap our baby, Jake says. We all look over and Mrs. Etienne is rocking the baby to sleep. She gets up and walks towards his nursery. Where is she going to take him? She refuses to drive, Sandy says. I still don't understand why Alex and I aren't the godparents, J.D. says as he and his wife walk into the room, both of them with a piece of cake. J.D.'s holding Addison, who is practically fighting with him to get her hands on his cake. This family needs new blood. We're already Addie's godparents. We were each other's best men. We need to branch out, Jake says. No new people, my mother yells from across the room. Everyone laughs and the conversation changes to plans for the upcoming holidays. When my dad approaches, he says, Clarks, how about some football tonight at the house? Creator, shouldn't you run these invitations by me first? I say, just to piss off my brothers. The house isn't yours yet, Lucas. Don't make me change my mind. I don't know why Luke gets the house, Jake grumbles. Because I'm the favorite, I gloat. Keep complaining and I'll ban you forever. In fact, you all need to start calling me first before you come over. No more showing up on a whim. He gets up and tries to put me in a headlock, but I manage to dodge his first attempt. He pretends to walk away, but makes a quick turn, catching me off guard. Don't make me have to hurt you, Jacob, Vivi warns. Hands off. Troy approaches with a plate of sausage and peppers. When he sees the antics between me and Jake, he puts his plate down next to Vivi and joins the fight. Jocelyn enters the living room next, holding a plate full of salmon. Vivienne, I made this for you. I noticed you haven't eaten much today, and Sandra said I could use her kitchen. As soon as Jocelyn gets close enough for Vivienne to smell the food, her complexion changes. She covers her mouth with one hand and sprints down the hall into one of the bathrooms. I run after her and enter the bathroom to find her vomiting violently into the toilet. This goes on for several minutes until there is nothing left in her. I grab a hand towel, dampen it with cold water, and lay it on her forehead as a compress. We're both quiet for several minutes. It's just allergies, she finally says. Or exhaustion and stress from the baptism. I had to take that catechism class to become the godmother. You don't have allergies, love. We both know you threw up when you smelled the food, and we both know why, I say gently. I get up and add more cold water to the compress before sitting next to her again. Don't start with that. I already told you I'm not pregnant. I think back to the conversation I had with Jake when he told me how stubborn the women in her family can be. You don't know my body better than I do. I can't argue with that, but what about the three positive pregnancy tests you took in the last week? My fiancé is fierce when she's cornered. She pushes my hand off her forehead and holds her own compress. False positive, she argues. All three of them. It's not impossible, Luke. Do you believe some dumb tests, or do you believe me? It's highly improbable, love. One false positive is rare. But three? You're pregnant. I'm going to repeat the words a wise woman once told me. Get your head out of your ass so you can help me raise this kid. I reach over and place a hand on her stomach. Instead of moving my hand away like she's done the last few times I tried this, she places her hand on top of mine. I love her already, I whisper. Her? Her or him, whatever you have in there. I'm already in love with, but I'm sure it's a girl. You're going to give us a little suffragette? So eager to come into the world and let her voice be heard. I pull her closer, lift her hand, and kiss it. Made of love. She takes the compress off her forehead and covers her entire face with it. She takes a deep breath and her shoulders sag. I pull the washcloth off so I can look at her beautiful face. It's just not the right time. 
We're not getting married until next year, and I don't want to walk down the aisle with a huge belly. We're supposed to go to Switzerland for our honeymoon. You promised you'd teach me to ski. I can't ski with a baby in me, she says, frantic. I just started this job. I plan on going to graduate school in a year and a half. You just started school last month. How are we supposed to study with a baby? We have plans, Luke. She takes another deep breath and lays her head on my shoulder. Despite the quiet in the bathroom, I can feel the fear and uncertainty oozing from her. Hey, I say. Luke loves Vivi. She instantly calms down. Her breathing returns to normal and her shoulders sag in relief. Vivi loves Luke. That's what I thought. Love, we can still do all of that, but we might have to change the timeline a bit. We move our wedding up. We get married next month. You know my mother loves a challenge when it comes to party planning. We can still go to Switzerland. There's plenty to do there besides ski. Or we go somewhere else. I promise to take you skiing another time. Graduate school is still happening for the both of us. We have this huge, crazy, intrusive family. They will help us. And we can also hire help. We'll adjust, Vivi. I know I've convinced her when she doesn't deny being pregnant. She takes a deep breath as she ponders my words. She moves closer, puts her arm around my torso, and lays her head on my shoulder. You're right. We can do anything, she says. I feel myself relaxing at her words. I'm right. Can I get that in writing? Shut up. You know you're my anchor. I don't know how this could have happened. I never miss a pill. Remember a few months ago when you went on antibiotics for that sinus infection? Well, antibiotics lower the effects of the birth control pill, I tell her. Are you kidding me? And you tell me this now? I didn't know. I researched it about a week ago. That's got to be when it happened. I know we wanted to wait a few years, but love, I'm happy. We're going to kick ass at this parenting thing. I lay my hand on her stomach again. I hope she looks just like you, with crazy wild hair and dark brown eyes. We stay in the bathroom for several more minutes before she finally stands up. She gargles mouthwash and leaves the bathroom. The room is uncharacteristically quiet when we get back as everyone pretends not to look at us. I help Vivi sit down, kiss the top of her head, and go find her a glass of ginger ale. When I return, everyone is still pretending not to look at Vivi while they all whisper. Eagle love. She takes a few sips of her drink before setting it on the coffee table. They're all looking at me like I'm a zoo exhibit, Vivi whispers. I sit down and place my hand on her knee. Is there something you two want to tell us? Mrs. Etienne says. Does anybody want my medical opinion? J.D. asks. While J.D. is busy looking at us, Addison reaches into his plate and lifts the rest of his cake, smashing most of it into her face while she eats. I'm not your patient, Dr. Dupree, Vivi responds. We look around, and all of a sudden everyone has gotten closer to us. Despite the noise of the kids playing in the playroom upstairs, you can hear a pin drop. Everyone holds their breath as they wait for us to offer some sort of explanation. Jojo comes closer. She's biting her bottom lip as she anxiously looks from me to Vivi. Just like my mother did when Jake and Sandy announced their pregnancy. She walks over and takes Jojo's hand in hers. Haven't you people ever seen a pregnant woman before? I ask. Yeah, what he said. We're not sure how this happened, but I'm pregnant, Vivi says. You know how it happened, Mrs. Etienne says. The room goes deathly quiet again until Jojo surprises us all when she moves away from my mother and hugs Vivi so tight. Both moms start to cry. When Jojo puts her hand on Vivi's stomach, more tears fall. I'm so happy, she says, reaching for me and pulling me into a hug. I'm going to be such a good grandmother to this baby. The rest of the family goes wild with the news. Next is a blur filled with hours of congratulations and jokes about my manhood. I guess we can always go to Vegas and get it done, Vivi says to Mrs. Etienne, who keeps insisting we get married now instead of next year. Jojo gasps at Vivi's suggestion and turns her head towards my mother. Vivi, you are your mother's only child. You not getting married by fake Elvis, Mrs. Etienne says. You get married in church. She gets up as if her word is final. 
I don't want to get married in a church. The church and an antiquated institution. Vivienne is interrupted by her aunt. Church, Vivienne, her aunt insists. You and Lucas already live in sin. You will break your mother's heart if you get married by Elvis. And Jesus will be upset too. You're absolutely right, Jake says to his mother-in-law. He smirks at me before turning back to her. I've been mentoring them about the living in sin thing. It's just so unbecoming. Sandy smirks at us, but she elbows Jake, who is doing his best to hide his laugh. You stop making trouble, Mrs. Etienne says as she points at Jake. Someone in the room hides their laugh with a cough, but Vivienne is not going down without a fight. Mom won't care. Right, Mom? she asks. Yes, I care. No Elvis, Jojo says. And the church won't be so bad. Why does everyone keep bringing up Elvis? I ask, looking around the room. I think we can all agree that Elvis will not play a part in this wedding, Lil says, taking charge. We can do this. We can compromise. How about you two get married at the house, but by a priest? I've always wanted to host a wedding here. We can have a winter wonderland. We will all have to work hard to make this happen for my baby and Vivi. Sandy, call your wedding planner. Tosh, you're in charge of the bridal shower. Tracy, call Kleinfeld and get us an appointment ASAP. Vivi, you will have to buy off the rack, but we can get it done. How about the first Saturday of December? You two will be back from the honeymoon in time for Christmas. Tracy and Sandy disperse at my mother's orders, and the rest of the family start to talk at once. Yes, but in a church. You can have reception at the house, Mrs. Etienne says. As everyone talks over us, I hold Vivi in my arms. Our little suffragette just crashed our world the way you crashed into mine.